We are, we are recording, so now, now the recording is starting. Thank you for reminding that and for asking the question, Majid. So, um, welcome to Shantanu as well, which is the last arrived in the session. There have been a, last, a, a lot actually of uh, requests for joining the training session. There have been actually at least four, four or five more people asking for joining. The session was full because I think over uh, seven people joining, uh, especially online, it will it, it would be a mess. Then, if we are more than more than seven for asking questions, for taking care that everybody is actually understanding and following the points. So I just wanted to keep a, a quite small group. And having a small group, the interest is having this small group as interactive as possible. So again, never hesitate to interrupt and to ask for for something. Unmute yourself or just ask directly in the in the public chat. All right, so I'm going to move uh, the way it's actually working. I'm going to share slides. We are recording the video, so you're going to get the video as well. I'm going to send the slide also after after the training, maybe maybe at the end of the week, because uh, I'm, we're going to be a, a bit busy for the next uh, for the next days. Um, and the presentation for today, so that's uh, uh, the, the training session is actually entitled, and that's how we usually present so far to people when we are presenting so far in new communities or to, to new partners. It's actually an open source framework for collaboration, prototyping, because it allows to quickly develop and prototype a simulation, and especially interactive simulation. We're going to see that. It's really the purpose of SOFA is really this uh, idea of getting things interactive. I'm going to change, I mean, change the slides and go forward in the slides. If you've got any issues visualizing them, just uh, just let me know. That's for today overview, for today's schedule. So in the morning, we're going to see um, a broad introduction about what is SOFA, how it works, especially you know the, the code architecture, how it is organized. I think this is import important when you are aiming at developing your own simulation and your own code to understand actually how SOFA is built and organized. Then we're going to look at three main principles of SOFA. Again, those main principles, it's some, I would say, way of design, way of how SOFA is actually designed and SOFA works, which are, I think, important to understand before going uh, in, in the development of your simulations. And that's three main principles that are specific to SOFA. So that's why I'm actually stressing out those points and, and trying to explain them as, as deep as possible so that you will really see how the information is going through into SOFA, and it helps again in the design of the simulation and in the development later on. Uh, we're going to see you know, how people are actually uh, uh, using SOFA in the community, so what kind of applications are actually made with SOFA. And then we're going to start, still in the morning, start a user tutorial, so start uh, uh, using some, some, some scenarios, some scenes, step by step and see why are we adding this kind of component and what, how is this component in the simulation communicating with other uh, other components. There will be a break for, for lunch because we, even if we love simulation, we do, uh, we do like uh, having some, some lunch breaks. And in the afternoon, we're going to move towards using, uh, we're going to end this user tutorial and we are going to go for understanding the relationship be between the simulation, especially the simulation scenes that we're going to see in the, in the user tutorial, and make the relationship between that and the theory. You know, what, what kind of mathematical uh, matrix system is that building? How do we solve this uh, matrix system? What are the different methods for solving this system? And last, for the day, it will be to have a look on how to uh, how does actually look like a plugin if you'd like to develop your own code, where to develop the plugin and, and all those technical details. So it would be a bit more developer oriented. For the main part of what we're going to see today, the binary version of SOFA, which are available directly in, in the www SOFA framework. So I'm going to move my coffee otherwise I'm going to spread that over, over the desktop, uh, .org slash download. There you can actually find uh, the binary binary version of SOFA. So you download it, it works. And we're going to see, uh, so uh, we're going to, we're going to see as well uh, the, the, the source, uh, the source version. All right, let's get started. If you have any question again, interrupt anytime.
I'm going to repeat that again and again, but uh, it's uh, I think good uh, good for 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 keeping things interactive. A few words about who I am, just for so that you know what I know and what I actually do not know, because everyone has you know knowledge and lack of knowledge. It's uh, it's uh, it's by definition. So I'm actually a mechanical engineer. Uh, I made my studies between France and Germany, and uh, I got my PhD at INRIA, working with SOFA, not on growing watermelon, but uh, it was on um, it was on simulating the electrical uh, electrical activity of the heart. I can actually share uh, already uh, just a short uh, short video. So that's that will be the way I'm going to display you, you know, some sh share with you some examples. So that was the kind of simulation as I was actually doing during my PhD. It was simulating the electrical activity of the heart, and I worked also on the electrical, electrical and mechanical coupling of the heart. So that was the kind of, of things that I, I was actually, uh, I was actually doing during the, my PhD. As you can notice, it was electrical simulation made with sofa. So just to, it's already a first example of. You know, so far it's used a lot for mechanics, and that's as that has always been the case. But as you can notice, you can do also other kind of physics with so far than than mechanics. So before, uh, so while I'm going to present uh, the, the next slides, could you each of you put a few of, a few of keywords um, about you know the, the 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 I would say. The aspects of SOFA you are interested in, and especially the application field. I know that Jacob, Christian, and Hadi are aiming at soft robotics, so modeling the deformable, the deformable, and the deformations related to a robot that would be made actually of, of silicon, for instance, or any other deformable material. But uh, for some others actually do not know the applications. Is that more medical simulation? Is that uh, video games? Is that uh, animation? So Majid is also soft robotics. Shantanu is soft robotics. <laughs> okay, and Jacob is for medical simulation, surgery, soft tissues, modeling. Uh... Catherine navigation in vascular system. Oh, great. Okay. Okay, I think uh, we've got everyone apart, if I'm correct. Yeah, apart, apart Jake. So, Jake, um, if you have already any idea of the kind of, uh, the, the kind of application you are actually aiming at and interested in, do not hesitate to share that with us. Uh, and yeah, and that's otherwise everyone, uh, everyone replied. So, a lot of soft robotics from what I see. But with different kind of application, uh, I see. So, uh, Hadi, that you, you said soft robotics, but especially looking at catheter navigation in vascular systems, that's actually something which is really growing currently. Uh, this uh, this kind of uh, um, this kind of uh, endovascular application. Uh, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna so, sh show you also some 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 recent work uh, that has been done with that. Um, electrical impedance tomography with the lungs. Okay, exoskeleton. Uh, so again, for soft robotics, deformation of the eye. You're going to see. Uh, <laughs> you might have already seen some videos about that. I'm going to show. I'm going to show some others again today. So yeah, uh, as as you are actually all saying, uh, um, at least uh, at least I would say 60%, uh, 70% percent, uh, percent of you are saying soft robotics is also one of the topics which is definitely growing around the table. Um, so it why I'm asking the, that for the roundtable, it helps me a lot for, uh, you know, pointing out some, some details. For instance, I, I would be able to point you some, some information for catheter simulation or for electrical information, that kind of things I can definitely point you out in the, in the community. Today and even after, after the training, do not hesitate to let me know, oh, I saw that in a video, would that be available and so on. That's, uh, that's all the purpose of, uh, of getting the community and, and getting in touch as well. All right, um, and maybe I, I'm going to ask you one last question, and then it will be my my part of the work. Uh, um, so it would be, what is actually your 
theoretical background. Are you a computer scientist? Are you a mechanical engineer, an electrical engineer? Um, uh, yeah, so that's the kind of thing so that, you know, I can actually know how much coding you know, how much, uh, you know, how much development have you have you been able to, to, to do in the past? How much also of the, I would say, theory of mechanical systems and so on, you know? So I see biomechanical engineer, mechanical engineer, mechanical engineer, okay. Control engineer currently working on PDs, okay, very good. Software engineers for, for, for Changni. Okay, I got one missing, which is, which is, which is, which is, I tried to, to sort that out. Yeah, perfect. Software, okay, great. So that's quite good because um, by, I mean, you, you seem whole to have basically a, a, a strong background, I would say, uh, so when I see mechatronics, mechanical engineer, um, uh, when you have this kind of background, understanding how the, I would say, the, the math standpoint, how a matrix system is built, how a matrix system is actually solved, these kind of things are usually a bit faster. It's sometimes a bit more complicated for uh, pure computer scientists. The code is easier, but the, the theory is a bit more complicated. So I'm going to try to, to share that. So Cheng Ni and, and Jake, do not hesitate to point me out anytime uh, if, if there is some, some point unclear, again, about partial differential equation or uh, resolution, uh, re resolution algorithms, whatever. All right, so let's get started really with the, with the, with the training now. So, introduction first about what is SOFA and the community of SOFA. I'm gonna quick. Uh, I'm gonna be quick about that because I guess most of you know that. But it started back in 2006. Uh, 2006. It's uh, it's uh, already, already 14 years ago. It was actually a set of researchers uh, that decided to gather and to join their forces to build a common framework for physics simulation. Some of them were actually interested in uh, physics animation, uh, like for computer graphics. Some others were interested in medical simulation, and they still all needed to have some kind of common tools, tools for simulation, like having some solvers, some models, some way of loading a mesh, animating uh, an object, computing collision, but actually, what they all shared, they all needed to have a common tool that were able to make interactive simulation. It means it's not only having the simulation of one object and to see how this object is evolving among time, but to have objects, possibly several objects, and we've got someone, no, it's okay. So someone connected, okay. Um, so to have several objects that could actually interact together possibly collide or having um, uh, having uh, having some connection in between. So interactions and to keep always the simulation as fast as possible to keep also close to real time or real time applications. That was really the philosophy uh, that was uh, with which uh, actually was, uh, was built so far. The idea is that they, they built a physics simulation framework which means it's actually what we call a physics engine. And this physics engine needs what? Needs mathematical models to mimic the physics which is around us, like how does an eye deform? How does a lung deform? What kind of model do exist for that? And to have also all the algorithms to solve this physics at each time step. It means to have, again, uh, time integration solvers to have linear solvers solving a linear system problem at each time step. So that is what is a, a physics engine. And what for? What kind of application fields were actually targeted? Mainly, as I said at the beginning, SOFA is mainly aiming at soft and rigid, rigid body dynamics. As you might have noticed, you know, from, from the, the video I shared just before uh, about the, the electrical simulation, it's not only mechanical simulation. 
But again, SOFA is mainly aiming at soft and rigid body dynamics for medical simulation, for computer graphics, for robotics, for biology. There have been, there have been people working with SOFA for modeling cells, biological cells, and how they do interact. But still, it's soft and rigid body dynamics, which is, be, the, the, which is behind, or the, the physics behind. In SOFA, you can find as well a bit of heat transfer. Heat transfer for, you know, it's actually a diffusion effect, which is implemented in SOFA. And you have a bit of fluid models, but it's very basic models, like you have SPH implementation, which is uh, uh, available in SOFA, and you have a bit of early ion fluids as well, which are in SOFA. But all those fluid mechanics, fluid dynamics, it's really not the strong point of SOFA. SOFA is really more aiming at soft and rigid body dynamics. And as I said, the, actually it was four research teams that joined their forces to, be, to build SOFA 14 years ago, and they decided to follow this concept. They decided to follow the idea of having a flexible framework Flexible because they wanted to be able to, in a quite short amount of time, be able to prototype and design a simulation. They wanted to be able to have also multiple kind of representation. They wanted to be able to have, you know, to have really the possibility to say, I want to have a very detailed physical model. I want to have a collision mesh, which is maybe coarser or maybe finer a visual model, which is again different so to, to be able to tune each detail of the simulation. And, uh, and, and, and on top of that, they wanted to be able to make mechanical simulation, but not only. So they wanted to be to keep the possibility to have uh, multiple kind of physics in the simulation. All right. Uh, so I hear some. I, I was hearing some some noises. Was there some question? I don't see any. So if you have any any question, uh, do not hesitate to to interrupt. But uh, uh, yeah. So flexibility was one of the main concept of SOFA. The second main co concept uh, for 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 the the design of SOFA was to have something very modular. That's that's actually how this idea of plugins came in, it was to have a base of code, which is SOFA. And around SOFA, we wanted to let people to have the freedom to develop optional features. That's what we say, we call, that's what we call the plugins. And this way, we have a core of code and optional modular features. That's this idea of getting a framework, which is modular, modularity to very in a very short amount of time, say, so, okay, I want to activate this plugin to have this feature, I want to activate this plugin to have this feature, or to de deactivate it. And we wanted to have actually a framework that was interactive, and to be interactive, it needs actually to be efficient, to have efficient computation. So we need we need to have either multi-threaded compute, computation or GPU-based computation to keep interactivity, for instance, to keep the user interaction to take into account the user interaction during the, su the simulation. So that's really the, the key words of SOFA. Flexibility, modularity, and interactivity. That's really the three main, and for me, mod for me the interactivity is maybe the most, uh, the most important one. All right, what about the software architecture? I already talked a bit about that just before. So, SOFA, it's actually a core of code, a base of code on which all the community is relying. Communities like it can be companies are actually relying on, on this core. Uh, research centers are relying on this core, independent developers. And this idea is that this, co this co uh, core of code is containing what? It's containing a lot of C++ classes, it's actually the language, C++ classes, which implement the math mathematical models, which implement the algorithms, the solvers, to run the physics of SOFA. All those codes, which are included in SOFA, they are open source, because SOFA is actually an open source project, and they are available publicly online. You can actually find all the sources of SOFA directly 
on what is called GitHub. I think you might already have web visited the, 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 the website of, of, uh, of GitHub for, for SOFA. The code is directly available with a license. All the open source code, they do have a license. And they explain actually how it's possible to use this code. So far, the license is called the LGPL license. It means you can download SOFA, you can use SOFA for free, you can modify SOFA, the source code of SOFA, for free, and you can even make products and your own research from SOFA for free. You can basically use SOFA as much as you want. That's really, and that's really the philosophy of SOFA, and the philosophy of SOFA with this LGPL license is also that when someone is improving one of the code of the core of SOFA, it provides back this improvement so that all the community can benefit from, from, from this improvement and so that the core of SOFA, SOFA improves every day. So I'm gonna try to share my screen uh, just to, to show, um, uh, it's here, sorry. I'm gonna share my screen entire, so I'm gonna share what I'm gonna share this one. Okay, I'm gonna share this here, perfect. I'm gonna share this screen. You should be able to see now my screen and I'm gonna go directly on, on GitHub. Just, I guess you know GitHub. So that's where all the source code of SOFA is actually located. And what I wanted to show you is that, you know, when someone is actually improving the source code and then providing a contribution, proposing a contribution, that's what we call here a pull request. And you can see in this widget here on the page for all the pull requests, it's actually all the contributions that people are currently proposing to improve SOFA. So we have 40 open pull requests that people discuss to know if the, 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 the change and the contribution is good or need to be improved to, to get finally integrated into SOFA. Perfect. So that's for the stable core and the SOFA team, the SOFA consortium staff, so is, which is me and two other engineers. We are three engineers to, and we propose a regular releases, so regular versions of SOFA. The last release was back in June, the V2006, and the next release will be in a few weeks. At the end of December, there will be an open release, the V12 release. So that's for the core of SOFA. And around SOFA, that's what I mentioned before, there is possibility for independent developers, research centers, and companies to implement their own code in what is called plugins. It's actually separate repositories outside from SOFA, you are actually the one to choose the license. You can use an open source license. You can choose a private license. You actually, for the code that you are developing, you choose the license to set on your code. And this code will be based on SOFA. And this way, you can actually add new features to SOFA in your own repositories. That's actually what, actually, that's actually what are doing research centers, companies working with SOFA. They, contribute things into the core of SOFA, and they also keep some algorithms and model when it's new things and that when it's then when it, when it, they want that they want that to they want actually to keep those code in separate repositories, public or private, they do that in plugins. Okay, so we have a core a structure of code with a core, open source, and plugins all around where people are actually free to define the license. It works for all the platforms. It, it's actually requiring a bit of work to, to get, especially for macOS, uh, which is sometimes a bit complicated, especially for visualization uh, recently, or yeah, so basically it's Linux, macOS, Windows, cross-platform. What is important to know is actually those two links here. To start with, uh, for, for, I would say, pointers on how to get help and to, to get information for the documentation, you can find first a user online documentation. So I'm going to sh again share, share the same share the same screen here. Um, I need to find again the window, da, 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 GitHub. Uh, 
Okay, this one, yeah, this one. Sorry. So if you wanna, if you wanna uh, find here all the documentation of Sofa, you can just go on Sofa Framework slash Community slash Doc. Here you can find all the online documentation about the main principles of Sofa, all the components of Sofa. So there is unfortunately, unfortunately yet in the doc not all the components uh, documentation, but we are actively working on that. And once you've done, I would say the user part and you're more interested in the developer part you can actually have it have a look to the doxygen api or you can just go on sofa framework sofaframework.org slash api and it will directly redire redirect you to the api documentation on sofa and for instance if i type i i, I type here the name of one of the component of sofa like the uniform mass it will give you a graph of dependency of this component to explain what are the properties, what are what are actually the what we call the, the data, the internal the, 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 the parameter of this C class, and all the functions that are implemented in it. So that's for the, the two links for a doc for a user, a doc for which is more for developers, for the for the for the API. All right. And as I said, people are actually improving every day so far. And this work using the Git versioning system, people are actually proposing contributions through the actually actually the peer review process of GitHub. Who never worked? Uh, uh, I can actually make uh, another uh, short uh, short poll. Uh, click here. Can I make a new one? There. Okay. Uh, I won't uh, I won't spend time on that, but. Um, who, who, who got a, who, who, is, who never heard about uh, Git, GitHub and Git, and who never actually worked with that kind of uh, that kind of tool before? Okay, so every I guess if uh, I, I take that like everybody already worked with uh, Git and GitHub before, great. Do not hesitate. I mean, never hesitate to say when you know you don't do not know something because it's uh, never first. It's never a shame, and it helped me also, also to 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 explain all those uh, details of you know how this thing is working or how, how does the how does this work? Yeah, Majid, I, I see that you are actually you change your your status with a uh, with some something. So do not hesitate to unmute yourself if you'd like to to, to take the mic. Okay, otherwise I'll, I'll continue. So just before going further, before uh, going to see a bit uh, about the community of Sofa and who is Sofa, where and to do what, I'd like to show you some here, so just two short examples of, uh, of application of, uh, of Sofa. First, on the left-hand side, you have people who are working with integrating Sofa into what? Into the Unreal Engine. It's actually a, a, a company which is doing that, uh, a consulting company. It's a company that helps research centers and companies to work with Sofa and to integrate Sofa into their products or into their projects. They are making technical support. They are also making integration. And in this case, you see it's a Sofa simulation, which is running and the, all the rendering is made into the Unreal, Unreal Engine. And the second example is actually another company which is uh, which is using Sofa, but this time to build products, especially products for training people. Training who? Training medical students. Training those students to here make a, a, a surgery, which is a, a, a surgery which is not really uh, not done widely, but that needs which is uh, that is needed to be done when there is what is called brain aneurysm. Here it's the brain. And you have a blood vessel which is deforming, deforming up to the point where it builds actually a bag of blood, which is called an aneurysm. And this aneurysm needs to be closed, so clipped and removed. And this is made on the right hand side, you can see the sofa visualization. And on the left hand side part, it's a, a unity visualization, which is done here. And there are using Sofa for building such simulators to train medical students dur during their uh, medical curriculum. All right. So 
So far, it started back in 2006, 2006, as I said before, and it ex extended quite widely since then through European projects, through international projects. So you now SOFA is in, in Canada, in, in the US, I mean, every, everywhere where you can see actually uh, on, the, on the map. In, in Brazil, it's actually now also in Chile, which is not colored, but uh, for that's for the west part of the world. You can see on the eastern part of the world, China, Korea, Australia, Indonesia, well, quite a lot of countries. So it has been spread up still. The community is very, I would say, academic oriented, even if more and more we see co companies either created around SOFA or coming close to SOFA and using SOFA for their internal use or for building pro products from, from SOFA. To give you an idea, uh, every day there is at, at, least about, uh, at least 100 developers using and developing products or making research with SOFA. Users, there is about uh, uh, a thousand of users uh, all around the world in, 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 in research centers, in, in companies, uh, uh, a, bit, uh, a bit everywhere. But yeah, active developers, that's, uh, that's about the, 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 a, good, uh, a good amount here, uh, about uh, a bit more than uh, an hundred of developers. And to give you also an idea of download, there is about 300, 400 people downloading, new people making a new download every month uh, of SOFA. Just to give you a, a few a few digits about uh, about SOFA, since and since uh, yeah for for the last I think eight years there have been seven companies that have been uh, that have been company uh, that have been cr created. Sorry, the first one was back in uh, 2010, and uh, and the latest one it was in 2017 18, and they are all created around SOFA for different purposes in robotics, uh, in a lot in medical in the medical field, for medical training, for building prosthesis uh, for providing also technical support, as I said, for a consulting company. So yeah, a lot of different topics uh, addressed uh, through through those companies. And actually, there is a still at least two projects of, of new startups uh, in uh, which should should appear in 2021 or 2022. So a quite, I would say, dynamic ecosystem. And what we are doing as, as the SOFA consortium, so that's, as I said, the three engineers, and uh, I belong to, to, those, uh, to those three engineers, what we are actually doing is that we are uh, uh, making sure that people, you know, do not, develop, uh, do not develop three times the same plugin. So we are coordinating the developments. We are also maintaining the platform, providing release, animating the community, making training as today, and also putting people in contact and making sure that the ecosystem is continuing, continuously basically growing and making, making sure that companies have a good business, making sure that research centers have a good research and helping them as much as we can as a third party organization. So that, that's for us and SOFA, and that's for the people that are actually supporting us. So INRIA, which is the research center where we are actually working, but also Korean Korean partners like Kyungpook, Asan Medical Center, the Fraunhofer from Germany, Florida from the US, uh, uh, University Flo uh, Verona, which is also helping us uh, a lot, and Infinitech 3D, which is a, a company. Well, let's start now really about SOFA, not only its community, but the software itself. Let me know if there is any question so far. As I said before, never hesitate to, to interrupt. Majid, I, I saw that you were getting in and out. Have you any issue with the connection or can you all see the slides properly and there is no, I would say, blur or whatever. Is the connection good for you all? Uh, I lost uh, about one or two minutes of your lecture. Okay. That's my internet connection. I'm okay. sending some email to my university, and if uh, it's okay for them, I prefer to left home and go to the university because today I don't know why, but my internet has some problems. Okay. Okay. Maybe in the noon uh, for breaks or something like this. Uh, you will switch. I, Yes. I okay. Go to university. It's so close. Okay. 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 
No, no, no worry. Anyway, uh, Majid, because as we said before, uh, we're going to re record everything. So I'm going to also okay. send, send you the video so that you, can, you do not miss any any sec okay. uh, of what, uh, what is Thank happening. Thank you today. so much. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, so I see that is good for everybody. I'm also sometimes asking questions so that I can also take a bit of coffee and and recovering. Uh, do not hesitate to take the mic again anytime. So, getting so far. As you notice, there is two ways. Either you download the binaries. For the binaries, you can actually see that, see that on the link that I, uh, I just sent you uh, uh, previously. Uh, I'm going to do that here. OK, you can go on Sofa Framework and download. Here, what do you find? First, you find actually what is called the binary, the executable version of Sofa. So you download it. The advantage is that you download, it works. You can run it on your, on your machine. OK, it's fine. The problem is that you actually, with this, with this version here, with the binary version, you do not have access to the sources, because the sources has, are actually pre-compiled for you so that it works immediately on your machine, but you don't have access to the sources. The second option that you have to use so far is actually to download the sources but in that case, what, what you're going to have to do is actually you're going to have to download and build on your machine the source, the sources of Sofa. So you have all the guidelines on how to build Sofa. Uh, they're going to be made up to date for the next release as well, as well, so that it actually follows really the, the steps, uh, the steps to the steps to follow to build Sofa properly on your machine. So as I said. Last release, the last stable version that we call the release of Sofa was in June, V2006. In one month for December, we're going to have the, the second and last release of uh, 20, uh, 2020 um, uh, that, will, uh, that, will be, uh, that will be released. All right. So that's, that's the two ways, downloading the binaries or downloading the sources. And for that, as I said, you have the online documentation for how to build Sofa step by step. If you have any issue for this kind of co compilation, compilation issues, for instance, or if you have any issues by, uh, any issue while using, you know, testing so far uh, with the scene and so on, what you can do is also to go here in community, in the community widget and go on the forum. Here you can actually ask freely any question that you'd like. And we try to, to reply as soon as possible. I, I mean, personally, as soon as I have a few minutes, I go on the forum and uh, I, I go for replying all the questions. So do not hesitate to go there and, and ask, uh, ask later on uh, your, your, all, all your questions. Well, right. For versioning the sources, we already talked about GitHub. So I, I'm going to skip the slides. But here, that's the process on how to make a contribution. To make a contribution, you need to have your own, what is called fork, your own version of Sofa. And from this version of Sofa, you can actually create a branch. So uh, some kind of derivative version of Sofa. You make your changes in this branch. And then what you're going to propose as a contribution, what is called a pull request, the contribution will be actually this branch. You will say, oh, I made some changes in this branch. Would, would you like to integrate the changes I did in Sofa? That will create a pull request. All right. So we mentioned before, Sofa is a core of code made of C++ class. I'd like to explain a bit how the, the source code of Sofa is, act, is actually organized, because when you go on the GitHub page of Sofa, what you will find is that that page here that we saw also before. But you see there is a lot of repositories, a lot of files, and so on. And it's not always easy to know what part of Sofa contains what. So in this slide, it's actually a summary, a very short summary of what does Sofa contain. First, you have one repository, which is called Sofa Kernel. Sofa Kernel, it contains what? It contains what we call the base modules. It's actually the base C++ classes, which implement, for instance, which implements, which implements the what is called API of Sofa. What is the API? It's actually for if we take an example like a solver. If we want to create a linear solver, what is in Sofa kernel? You will have a base linear solver. It's actually a C++ class 
which only describes what are the functions that have to be implemented. It does not implement anything. It's just describing what are the functions that are supposed to be implemented if you want to implement a linear solver. Or if you have a base force field, it will the base force field class will describe what? It will describe the functions that a force field have to implement. And that's it. So that's what we call the abstract classes, the base classes. They do not implement anything, but they explain how things are supposed to be implemented. And then all the solvers, all the models, all the codes actually implementing really algorithms, they are located in modules. This, this repository called modules, it will contain a lot of code, actually, most of the code of SOFA. I can actually, I can, I'm going to share again my screen here. I'm going to show you here in GitHub. You can go here in the modules here, SOFA modules. What do you find here? A lot of repositories containing all the implementations available in SOFA. You can, find, for instance, see all the different kind of, kind of loaders existing in SOFA, if you go in SOFA modules, SOFA general loader, you will find all the general loaders available in SOFA. If you go here, I don't know, I'm going to, for instance, simple, in SOFA simple, oh, blah, sorry, SOFA, here, SOFA general simple FEM, you will find all the Base, uh, all, all, the, all the algorithms and models implementing using what is called the finite element method, which, is the, which means actually FEM, finite element method. It's all the implementation based on the FEM available here in SOFA. Okay? So that's for the, I would say, the, the way we are actually sorting um, C++ codes in SOFA. The abstract base class here in SOFA kernel and the implementation in the modules repository. What else, what else is actually important? First, uh, uh, a repository in the core of SOFA, which is called examples. And this one is actually very, very useful to start with because it will, uh, it will show you. So I'm going to go here back. SOFA examples, it will provide you a lot of simulation scenario especially examples components, it will provide you for most of the components of SOFA, an example of scene, an example of simulation using this component. For instance, if I'm, interest, I'm in, interested in looking at, looking at how does, uh, 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 for instance, a loader works, if I want to load my VTK, my VTK mesh, I can go here in the SOFA examples component loader and I'm going to see here an example of scene. It's an, ex uh, an example here with an XML format of scene, but we're going to soon move those scenes from XML to Python. But anyway, it's an example of simulation using this mesh VTK loader. So this third repository is very important because it contains a lot of example simulations. And last but not least, there is a last important repository, which is called the application plugins. It contains, obviously, some optional features. That's what we call the plugins directly when you download SOFA. When you download SOFA, you have the core of code, and there is already some optional features that comes with it. By default, they are de deactivated, but you can actually activate them if you'd like, for instance, using a leap motion tracker or some haptic devices or some CUDA, some CUDA version of the codes, some multi-threading stuff. So you have already plugins that comes with SOFA. Those, I'm going to, one last time here. Opla, it's not this window that I want to share. It's this one here. OK, you can actually go in SOFA, applications here. And you can see the plugins repository. 
as you can see, there is plenty of plugins available, like one that will allow you to, to use, as I said before, Leap Motion. One that allows to interface so far with what, a Seagal. What is, what is Seagal? It's actually a library which allows for meshing. So you can couple so far with a meshing library. You can also couple so far with so Python. Now we are actually working also with Python 3. It's, it will be released. The official release of Sofa Python 3 will be made in the next release. So end of December, there will be Sofa Python 3 officially released in Sofa. I'm going to talk more about that later on. And I was also saying as an example, Sofa CUDA to, to activate some part of the code using GPU computing. All right. Okay, that's what, again, how is actually organized the SOFA architecture. I hope, you know, it already helps a lot for, it, it, it helps you a bit for understanding what part of SOFA is where and to, 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 to be able to short, in a short amount of time, uh, localize the thing that you are actually looking for. So, as we said, if you are using the sources of SOFA, what you're going to have to go through is the compilation step so downloading the sources, configuring SOFA, and building. But again, all this is explained, and I, I, I didn't show you actually the the, uh, the documentation docu documentation page which is associated to that. But it's it, it's actually located here. Community documentation, and if you if you go on getting started and built, you have all the compilation information for both Linux. MacOS and Windows. Here, Linux, MacOS, and Windows. Any questions so far? All right. I see Chantal is typing. I don't know if it's for for a question or. I have a question. Uh, yeah. Go uh, ahead. You have a. Uh... You have mentioned that uh, there is a modular and plugins. A modular and plugin for SOFA, technically, software technically, the same thing is just uh, um, use a different array. Uh, or there are two different interfaces for SOFA kernel. Uh, some can, uh, there are two different interfaces for modular and plugin. <clears throat> Thank you for, for the question. It's a, it's a good point. So the difference, if I, if I got it properly, the difference between modules and plugins. It's actually, it's actually the- Yes, yes exactly. The, the difference of name, it's actually just, uh, uh, it was actually before a real difference because all the modules were in SOFA. And when I say in SOFA, it's when you download SOFA, you have, you have everything like, like just one block one monolith, you know, really one block that you cannot separate. And you had plugins that you can activate or deactivate. That was the difference before, okay? And up, up to now, it's actually still true. Uh, when you take SOFA, the core of SOFA is one piece and you cannot change, I mean, you cannot activate or deactivate whatever inside, it's one block of code. And the plugins, the plugins can be activated or deactivated. That is the difference between modules and plugins. Okay. Okay. We are so, so that you know that's also the interest of this of these uh, training sessions. It's actually to provide you a bit more of internal information about the, the the project so far. There is a big project going on currently in the core of Sofa. It's it's actually this block of code. We want to make it also modular. So we want at the end, it's actually a, a project that started a few months ago and that will uh, that should be able that should end in 2021, so just next year. And the project is to make almost all the modules of SOFA to become them, to, 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 to make them as plugins. So that you can actu actually have a very, very small core of SOFA. And all the rest as plugin. What are the, what is actually the interest? It will allow to have a faster compilation time. 
because you won't compile thousands of codes. And it will allow you to have a sofa that you need. You know, not using all the algorithms that do exist in sofa, but only the algorithms you are looking for. So there is a, pro um, there is a, a development uh, project going, going on, which aims at making the modules of sofa to make them as plugin as well. It's what we call the pluginization of sofa. So, or modularization, depending on how we call that. But you can actually, so modules, it's actually today, modules are considered as plugins, just they are built in sofa. And up to now, they, they, were, they were not, it, there was no possibility to activate or deactivate them. There will be, in the future, there will be this option to activate and deactivate even the modules. So basically, in 2021, there will be no modules anymore. There will be the core of SOFA and plugins, and that's it. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, another question. Let me. Yeah, please go ahead. The, 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 core, the kernel and the modular currently is the SOFA framework and plugin. Everybody who wants to make a whole application, he has to have a plugin to realize it. And uh, do you know? Uh, how many line of code is the kernel plus the modular together? Yeah, uh, it's it's a good uh, it's a good uh, it's a good question as well. Uh, so it's, it's I, I've never got get the, got this question before, uh, but yeah, we are measuring that. It's actually most most of the projects are sometimes proud of the number of code we're of, of line of codes. We are not really. There is, I think, a bit more than two million lines of code. Uh, if you, so, which is actually not a compliment for SOFA. It's too much. It's too big, actually, for a, a project. So we are really now working on some kind of um, a weight watcher for SOFA. Uh, we are trying to analyze everything which is in SOFA. That's, a, 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 again, in this pluginization work. We are working at making SOFA more modular, so lighter lighter to include less uh, pl uh, less codes so less line of codes and to keep really only what is actually really useful to the community so i guess in the next i think in the next years the trend would be to decrease a bit this number of lines as we are we are never getting under 1 million but i'd like i'd like at least to get uh, uh, 1 million and yeah 1 million and some something line of codes but not uh, not 2 millions anymore but yeah, so that's uh, to answer your question, more a, a bit more than two, 2 million lines of codes when you get everything of so far. Yeah, thank you. I just want to have a feeling about the complexity. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> two, so, million, 2 million lines of code that you yeah, use. Is yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's actually, that explains as well also never hesitate again to ask questions and so on because no, I, I would say almost that nobody knows all the parts of SOFA, okay? It's clear, but so, me a line of code is not possible. So that's really the reason why there is never a bad question, never hesitate to ask when you do not understand something, because there is actually people working on so many topics and so many things that it's actually impossible to be an expert on all those domains, all, all those topics. So it's completely normal to, to, to say, oh, I don't get this point, or I don't know how this code is working, or whatever. So I saw that Shantan uh, also asked a question. So about meshing libraries, I wanted to ask if you if you can change the mesh um, from within the within Sofa. So you can actually uh, you can actually using this kind of coupling uh, and integration of libraries, like we we mentioned before with the Seagal library, uh, you can actually mesh and create a mesh dynamically at the beginning of the simulation. There is even the possibility uh, to actually make some what is called changes in the mesh. It's what is called topological changes in SOFA. The API is available for that, but there is no actually no good examples and no good, I would say, ready to use codes to do that. We are currently working on that with uh, with uh, the company which is called uh, Infinitech uh, 3D. I, I'm, I'm writing the name because it's uh, I, I talked about them already uh, already uh, three or four times. 
this company is actually working on making a, a, a nice prototype uh, of um, of cutting cutting simulation based on sofa there have been already a lot of simulation done but it was on plugins and it, it has never been maintained what we would like it is to propose is to propose a topological change API available, clean and available in SOFA in the next month. So that's something which is gonna gonna start soon. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask him to uh, I'm gonna ask this guy to share actually a video so that I, I can I can sh I can show you during the day uh, an example of that. Okay, sorry. It's done. So I'm going to show you a video just later on. But yeah, so to answer to answer your your question, sometimes yes, it's possible to do that. It's actually there is there is the the, the need of uh, of coding a bit for that. Definitely, it's not something working out of the box, but it's uh, but it's completely feasible. I can already show you some um, some examples of uh, of what has been done by, uh, back in the past here. I'm going to show you this here. Chan here. Is that going to work? Yes. So that's an example. Here it was a PhD. Uh, so that's an example of some, something that has not been maintained in SOFA, and that's a shame. But uh, we, we were, actually, it was before the SOFA consortium do exist. It was uh, five years ago. And a PhD student was working on high order elements. So it's quadratic tetrahedron, quadratic tetrahedra that were actually cut and could dynamic, dynamic, dynamically be cut. So you, Dynamically, we are adding edges, we are adding points, you can even add elements or remove elements, remove points, and so on and so forth. So that 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 is possible. Another another example, and that was uh, I think even cooler, even nicer than what we just saw before. It was using sofa for making augmented reality, integrating cutting information. I, what you can see, it's uh, you have an automatic tracking, which is deforming a mesh in SOFA dynamically, and you have an automatic detection of cut in the algorithm that was updating the mesh on the SOFA side, so that here, as soon as a cut was detected, the simulation is actually updated, and you've get, you've, you're getting a, a dynamic simulation of first augmented reality plus augmented reality, taking into account the cut of uh, of the three mesh. It was also another PhD, actually it was a postdoc who, here who worked on, on augmented reality and cutting uh, with SOFA. Uh, actually, I cannot see this video, the second video. Uh, ah. I don't know why, um, because uh, the system told me uh, the system, uh, this video is not access, uh, accessible. Ah, okay. Um, uh, which one, the first one or the second one? The second one about okay. augmented reality. Okay, let me then uh, I'll do I'll do that uh, another way around. I'm gonna I'm gonna actually share my screen, and uh, it, the, the the quality will be uh, will be a bit uh, a bit uh, a bit uh, worse obviously, but at least you will be able to to see the video. Um, where is it? Where is my my? I, I'm I'm trying to to share the good one. So. I'm going to share this one and okay this one okay can you see yeah you should be able to see my screen now uh, so this was the video I was mentioning can you see can you see that can you see the screen yes okay cool um, the idea is that we are using here a textured object as you can see it's a, it's a, a piece of silicone we are texturing that to actually monitor some points through some vision algorithms that is detecting how those points and how the how the patterns are actually moving and we are associating to those blue points we are associating associating a 3d deformation model in sofa and this 3d model of sofa is actually even updated the mesh is actually updated in real time as soon as a cut is detected. So the cut is detected, as you can see here, on the left hand side part. On the left hand side part, we have some markers that will detect that a cut has occurred. On the right hand side, right -hand side part, it's the version where when we are actually not updating the mesh, as you can see, you get distorted elements and so on. So it's a, 
it's a, a, a weird uh, a weird uh, simulation and let's do the same this time with an updated mesh you'll see the algorithm is updated updating the mesh cutting elements dynamically as soon as it detects the cut so again it's another example of uh, of uh, mesh cutting uh, and updates in sofa it was this was actually done for medical purposes i can sh show you the next uh, the next video it was for medical purposes for having an augmented reality view during the operating uh, during an, uh, an a surgical operation what you, what we wanted to be able is to show internal structures using augmented reality but we wanted also this augmented reality to take into account the fact that our object is cut and to have in the augmented view a cut that is taken into account okay that was for the example so i hope you could see most of it uh, okay okay shantanu i got uh, i got it for for the mic so do not hesitate to type i'm 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 seeing always your your questions okay so yes uh, for the uh, i think i answered the different parts i'm going to move on again if you have other questions just post them or or take the mic anytime when uh, when i'm taking a, a drop of coffee you can uh, can interrupt and, and ask uh, ask for anything when you download sofa the binary version or if you download the sources and you compile the sources what you will end up with is this graphical user interface what that we call run sofa run sofa is actually this graphical user interface with as you can uh, as you as you might have already played with you have you have a uh, different parts here you have some options here that will allow you to you know activate some visual information activate or deactivate here you have a widget here which is called graph that will allow you to actually see and that's what one of the principles we're going to see right now about sofa the simulation graph it's actually a description of the scene and of the simulation and then you have here all this all the the parameters for animating the simulation stopping the the animation restarting you can actually load file and load here a, a new simulation file you have you have all the usual i would say usual uh, uh, options for running the simulation stopping the simulation restarting the simulation also saving saving the viewpoint saving uh, saving some screenshots uh, that can be useful also for 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 sofa if you, you can actually also make videos directly from 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 what you are doing with sofa so if you have any questions about the user interface let, please let me know i would be uh, I would, be, I would be glad to, to, to show you how it works uh, directly with Sofa. All right. Before looking at some applications of other applications of what people are doing with Sofa and moving then to the user tutorial, that will be the last uh, that will be the last step for this morning. Um, there is one one thing which is super important is to understand the main principles of Sofa. There is, as I said before, three main principles, and I'm going to go across those three step by step. The first very important principle is actually the fact that we are using a graph to describe all the simulations in SOFA. Why are we using a graph? This graph is actually very useful to describe how much comp how much objects there is in the scene what are the properties of those objects what kind of representations do, do these objects have a collision model a physical model a visual model and so on so it's very convenient for describing things and how does this scene graph look like and this is really what is important here it's it's always starting with something which is called a root node. The root node is the entry point of the simulation. And then all the, all the information is traveling through this scene graph. So we have a root node. And then below this root node, what do we have? We have what is called child nodes, so sub nodes. Each sub node corresponds to one object 
If here we have one subnode snake, it means we have one object in the scene, which is called a snake. If we have here another subnode, we will have two objects in the scene. That's really the way we like to design simulations in SOFA. Root node, which is the entry point, and then for each subnode, it means one object per subnode. And if we look into this subnode here, snake, there is inside this subnode components. What are those components? They are actually C++ classes. Each, each, uh, each, component, uh, each component that you see here, each line, sparse grid ramification, earlier implicit solver, conjugate gradient, which stands for, CG stands for conjugate gradient linear solver, mechanical object. Each of those guys corresponds to a C++ class. So we have inside each subnode, inside for each object, we have components. And those components, they will describe the physics of this object. What kind of solver? is going to be used for this object, what kind of physical properties are defining my object, like here, what is the mass, what is the, the deformation model that we're going to use, and so on and so forth. And finally, each of those components, they have options, they have parameters. In SOFA, we like to call them data. It's actually the options, the parameters of each of those objects. For instance, if we take the, this one here, the uniform mass, the uniform mass, obviously one of the data of, those, of this guy will be the total mass, defining the total mass of our object. Okay? So that's really the way we like to do things, describing things, describing the simulation as a graph. Each subnode under the root node, each subnode, like here the snake, describe one object, and inside this subnode you have the description, the properties of this object, with each component and parameters that you that the user is free to define. What is the mass of my object? How much iterations do I do I want my solver to do? And so on and so forth. And how I am supposed to actually <coughs> to actually write this in graph. We are using, so, uh, for SOFA, we are loading in Run SOFA, in the graphical user interface, we are actually loading files, loading what is called scripts, scripting files. It can be XML files, but that's a, a, build, a, a bit old fashioned now, and more and more people are actually using Python, Python scripts. Okay? Is there any question on, on this uh, scene graph here? I'm going to take an example here, but is there any question so far? Uh, you mean the data? Uh, data is always uh, um, a geometry. Is that true? Or, or there are other kind of data? No, the, the, yeah, the, the, it, there can be what is called top, topology data, like uh, how many points, how many edges, how the edges are connected to the points. So that's, I would say, topology, geometry, if, you, if you'd like, information, but not only data. It can be the total mass of your object, which is a physical property. It can be the stiffness of your object, another physical property. It can be the accuracy that you want, that you expect from your solver. It's another one. So you see, there is a lot of different, uh, a lot of different um, uh, data possible. I'm going to show you an example. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, oh, I'm going to share my, my uh, sofa view with you. Where is my sofa? It's not this guy. This one. Okay, cool. Can can you see the the sofa window properly? Okay. Yes, I see. I'm yes. just grabbing a, a, a bit of coffee. Sorry, since I'm I'm talking uh, I'm talking a lot. It's uh, I'm getting thirsty. So you can recognize the 
so runs uh, what is called the run so far graphical user interface. As I said before, so I don't know if I think you can't see my mouse, but uh, you have the on the here the animate button on the top uh, on the top right that allows to start and stop the simulation. Step which allows to make a step by step one time step per one time step simulation like pretty slow simulation here. You can in file and you have an option so you, you, you can't see it. I, I should rather I'm going to share, share share my whole screen it will be easier entire screen entire screen hello so is that good okay I'm, I'm sorry you, you you'll see uh, on the on the right hand side uh, the 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 view of the of the visual conferencing system but uh, I can I can show you here in big sofa so on the bottom, on the top, uh, top, top, uh, top left, uh, animate step. We saw that, but you can also make file here, and you can open a new file or Control O, and you can also reload the simulation. It will reset the simulation back back to the very beginning of uh, of the simulation. Set time is set back to zero, and all the properties are as are actually reset as the beginning of the simulation. And to answer your question, I mean, to answer the point of the data, I'm sorry, uh, the, the screen might be very sh uh, a bit small for you because I, I can maybe, uh, I think you can zoom in in the interface. Uh, in, in the in the Visio conference system, conference system, you should be able to zoom in a bit. I don't know if you can make it or not. But, but basically here, so what, everything that you see when you double click on one of the component here i double click on the mechanical object but let's take the for instance the conjugate gradient cg linear solver all those stuff here all the field that you see here it's actually data field the number of iteration the maximum number of iteration the tolerance that you are actually giving to the to the to the solver and so on and so forth Okay. Does that answer answer your point about uh, what is the data? Oh, yes, thank you. Cool. If it's not clear, just let me know. I, I would be happy to to, to re-explain. Uh, okay. Not only, okay. About the, your question about not always an animation loop. I will I will come to that very very shortly, uh, Shantanu. But it's a it's a good point. So Chantal was actually asking why is there sometimes an animation loop in the simulation file in the script, and sometimes there is there is no. I can already give you a a, 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 a piece of information is that if you do not give an animation loop, which is one of the important co co component of the simulation, we will see that right after. It there will be one created by default. That's why when there is known. In the, in the simulation file script, XML or Python, there will be one created by default by SOFA. And Jake, you, you asked, can the sense, can the scene graph be edited dynamically with Python and at runtime? Indeed, uh, not with Python 2. So in the previous versions of, so, of SOFA Python, it was not be, not possible before. But now, uh, actually, actually, it was even, yeah, it was even possible before. But now it's even, more easy to do with the SOFA Python 3. But yes, to answer your question, can the scene graph be updated dynamically with SOFA Python at runtime? Yes, you can create a new node. You can create a new so a new sub node, like a new object, make it appear in the scene or change the properties in the scene as much as you want using SOFA Python, indeed. All right, I'll carry on if you have other questions, but Still, to conclude about this scene graph, if we have uh, an example, you're welcome, Jake. If you have a, uh, if we if we take an example with two objects, like here we have a liver, and here a heart, and let's say that here we are interested by, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna use the, the the writing tool here. We are interested for the right hand side part for the liver. We are interested to see how the the liver is actually deforming. Okay. So let's say that what we are interested in is the deformation model, the deformation of, uh, of this object. So we, what we are going to have, maybe, we're going to have, uh, at, what, what is of interest for us is that at each node of the mesh, at each vertex of the mesh, 
we are interested in the XYZ information. So how points are actually moving in space. So what do we have here in the node? In the node lever, so we have, as you can, as, as you, as you can recognize, we have a root node. And below this root node, we have one sub node called lever. And we have, for instance, a mechanical object, which is uh, the mechanical object is really a storage component. It contains the degrees of freedom. So it will contain the X, Y, Z, in this case, information of our component, uh, of our object. So it will contain a vector for all the, all, all the points of our object. It will contain the degrees of freedom. In this case, if we have X, Y, and Z, it means we have three unknown per vertex. So it means, we're, in, in so far, we're going to use some, something which is called uh, the, a template, which is called Vec3D. It means we have a vector of three information per node, X, Y, and Z. So that's for the DOF here. D DOF means degrees of freedom. So a mechanical object containing uh, the, the position of uh, all, all, uh, our, uh, all our points. And we're going to have as well, just as it was the case before, we're going to have, for instance, a mass, a deformation model, maybe some external forces. So that's what I mean by force field and mass. There will be all the physics that will be defined for this object. And what we need always, not only we need the physics, but we need also to make sure that we are able to solve this physics. So we need to have solvers, integration schemes, and linear solvers. What happens if we have another object like the heart? All that we need is another subnode, a separate subnode. So we have two subnodes below the root node. And this guy, it can, it can actually have completely different degrees of freedom. Maybe here on the, on the right hand side for the lever, we were interested in the, in the position with the deformation X, Y, Z. Maybe here we're inter interested in just some kind of U, U and Z that maybe it's some kind of, that's what I was actually using for my PhD before. Uh, it's actually what some ionic concentration. Uh, I don't know if you, no, we're, gonna, we're not going to see that. Okay, I'm going to write that big here. Ionic concentration. Oh, it's a, got some, some, some typos, but it does not matter. So maybe we have just here two unknowns per node, two degrees of freedom. So here, what we are, what we are going to have here in our mechanical object, what we're going to have is actually different kind of degrees of freedom. If we have just two of them, like U and Z, as I was saying, we're going to use what is called VEC2D. If we have just one unknown per node, we're going to use VEC1D. OK? That's how it works. And if you have three, four, or five, you're going to have as many subnodes as you have of objects in the scene. OK? So that's for the scene graph and how it works. Now we're going to get to the point of Shantanu. So that's, that's how actually, a, 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 how does a, 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 simulation, a simulation graph, the scene graph, does look like when we are using, uh, when we are using the XML format. It was just, a, just an example, but we're going to see actually a lot of examples later on in the user tutorial. Before, Shantanu, you asked, but yeah, you, you mentioned the name of animation loop. And as you can notice, I set the animation loop right below the root node. In the example before, you had actually one animation loop which was located here, right below the root node. What is this guy, the animation loop? The animation loop, you have to consider that it's, it is the referee, so it's the chief of the simulation. It will order, it will odd make ordering of each simulation step. What does it mean? It means it will, depending on the kind of animation loop you're going to use, because there is several animation loop available in SOFA, there will be different steps 
in one simulation steps. For instance, there is, there is always one which is created. If, if, we, if you put no default, uh, if you put no animation loop in your simulation, as I said bef before, no animation loop égale, okay, I'm just writing some stuff here. All right, you should be able to see that now in the slide. If you set no animation loop in your simulation script, XML or Python, there will be one created by default, which is called the default animation loop. And this guy here, the default animation loop, it defines two steps in the simulation. It says, first, is there some collision? And if so, please compute the collision detection. And then, is there some physical models? And then, please, if there is some physics, please solve the physics. So there is some kind of two. I'm sorry, there is some kind of two steps here: collision and physics. And at each simulation step, there will be first collision, and then the physics. First collision, and then the physics. And how does this animation loop actually is organizing each simulation step? It's actually using the simulation graph that we just saw before. Thanks to this design of a graph, the animation loop is actually sending orders inside the different nodes. For instance, it will say it will ask and it will order the solvers. Oh, okay, guys, it's, nice. it's the time for you to solve the physics. Please solve the physics. Okay? And when this guy gives an order, then the solver receive, receives the, the order of solving the physics. It will ask itself the physical components to build the physical system, and it will solve it. Okay? That's the purpose of the animation loop. It's, a, it's some kind of ordering the simulation. What you need as well to know about the animation loop is that, in fact, it computes, it does not compute anything. It is only throwing orders. It is giving orders, and it's up to the solver, for instance, to know if there is or not some physics be below and some physics to compute. It's only, the animation loop is only providing orders saying, okay, guys, it's time for doing that. Do it. And it will, the solver will compute it or not. But if there is no physics, it computes nothing. If there is physics, the solver will compute the physics. And then when it, when it is done, it provides the information back to the animation loop. Okay, I'm done. Next time step. And this at each time step. Perfect. Cool. And you'll see there is actually several kind of animation loops. If you have some questions about them, I, I would be happy to, to answer. There is actually two main animation loop. I'm going to write here the name of the two. And I'm, I'm making some, some short notes here. Default animation loop and the free motion animation loop. I'm, uh, I'm going to explain, if you'd like, later on the, the purpose of the two. Again, by default, if you, for, if you forget one time to set yourself an animation loop, by default, the animation loop, default animation loop, will be created. All right. Any question about the animation loop so far? So it was the number two here. We had before. The scene graph, that was the number one. The anima animation loop and visitor, that was number two. And there is one last main principle I wanted to highlight today. It's actually what we call the mapping. I guess you might have already heard a bit about the mapping in SOFA, because there is a lot of them available in SOFA. And I'd like to explain actually what it is and what, most importantly, what for? Why using mappings in SOFA? In SOFA, I mentioned that earlier, especially when I explain you know, the concepts and the philosophy 
that were at the very beginning of SOFA, it was to let the user as free as possible to build the simulation he or she wants. If you want to have a high level of accuracy for the physics, you need to use maybe a very fine mesh for the physics. And maybe you don't care about the visualization. You, you, maybe you don't want any visualization mesh. Maybe you, you want to have a core visualization mesh. Or maybe you want to have a very fine and detailed visualization mesh. Maybe you want to have a collision mesh. Maybe you don't. We want it really to, to let the user completely free and let it completely open to define all the, I would say, to tune the simulation as he or she wanted. And therefore, actually in SOFA, you can load a different mesh for the same object. I'm going to share, for instance, here my SOFA window. I've got here a run SOFA window. I'm sorry, I'm always slow to open, open that here. But it's hard to find uh, among all the windows. In my SOFA window here, you can actually see the different representation using those options here. I'm going to deactivate everything. And I'm going to ask for, first, if I click on force field, it will display what? It will display the physical models, where actually the physics is computed. And here, as you can notice, it is, it is the scene, which is uh, the default scene of SOFA. The physics of the snake how the snake deforms, it is computed on what, what kind of geometry? It is computed on some hexahedral geometry. OK, that's for the physics. But how is the collision computed between the snake and the caduceus? I will deactivate here the physics, so the force fields. And I will activate what is called collision models. And you see, for the snake, still the same object as before. The physics was computed on some kind of hexahedra, some kind of sparse grid. And here you can see that the collision model of this snake, which is in yellow here, it is actually made of what? Made up of triangles. So we have a completely different mesh, a completely different geometry. On one side, we have hexahedra. On the other side, we have tetra the tri tri triangles for the collision. And why are we doing that? It allows us to, have ex to make the physics, the mechanics or whatever, whatever, whatever kind of physics, to compute the physics on some elements, on some kind of topology that we'd like with the refinement that we'd like, and, and to have a different mesh for the collision model. And here, in that case, a triangular model, a triangular mesh. And on, on your opinion, and you can, you can unmute yourself and let me know what you think. On your opinion, what's the purpose of doing that, to be able to load different mesh for the physics, different, a different mesh for the collision, What's the purpose of doing that? Do you have an idea? Would it just be to see which one best fits what we're looking for? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for instance, uh, so uh, who, who just uh, spoke? Uh, Christian, right? Oh, yeah, this is Christian, yes. OK. Uh, and Christian, uh, uh, I'm trying to, to find that shortly again. Yeah, for, for instance, uh, in your case, Let's take the case of the eye, you know? So we take a, a, a 3D model of the eye. I guess maybe you want to have a mechanical model, you know, the physics, mm -hmm. which is computed and which takes into account from the whole volume, volume of your objects, right? Yes. Do you want, where does the collision happen? On the surface. So do you really would like to compute the collision on all the, you know, volumetric mesh? Sorry, say that again. So, so does it make really sense to compute the collision on you know all the internal in, in inside the volume of, of all the triangles inside the volume of your object, for instance? Oh no, no, probably not. Yeah, probably not. So that's that's one reason. 
Let's take another example. Still, I'll keep the example of the eye. Let's say that you want to have an interactive simulation, you know, that runs fast enough so that a user can interact with the eye, maybe insert, you know, make some kind of percutaneous uh, 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 surgery. In that case, you need to have a, sim a simulation that runs pretty fast. Mm -hmm. you, you want to keep, I would say, a high level of accuracy on the physics, but maybe you, you do not care so much about a super, super fine collision model. Maybe. It's an assumption, but maybe. In that case, what, what you're going to use is a very fine 3D model of, for the physics and a coarser surface mesh for the collision. Mm -hmm. Basically, all the idea, and I see Adi indeed uh, who said different level of complexity, that's I think very related uh, to uh, the example of having different, of, different kind of resolution, having a fine mesh uh, or coarse meshes. The idea is that the user, you, when you are developing your simulation, you are free to define how accurate the model has to be and on which part of the computation. If you don't care about the collision and you want to keep a pretty coarse model for the collision, you can. If you want to have a very fine model for the collision, you can. And this is independent from the, from the physics. If you want to have a fine model for the physics or a coarse one, you can as well. It's completely free and up to the user. But there is one thing which is, need, which is needed. It's a mapping that will actually make the connection between those different meshes. And that's all the purpose of mappings. The purpose of mapping is to keep a, correspond a correspondence, what I like to say as well is a coherency, to keep those different here, those different, what, what I call representation, the physical model, the collision model, the visual model, to keep all those different kind of geometries coherent one with another. What does it what does it mean to remain coherent? It means that if I if I have my my physical model, for instance, my uh, I'm going to share again my sofa my sofa window. Uh, if if I see here my snake, I'm going to take the physics here, the physical model. If my grid is moving like here, I made two time steps my grid is moving. I don't want my collision model to remain up at the beginning. I want my collision model to follow, right? In the same way that I want that my visual model, which is this nice texture or nice, I don't know if it's so nice, but the textured snake mesh here, I want this mesh to follow. So I need the mapping to keep the two meshes. And if I take again the, uh, sorry, the physics, which is computed on hexahedra, and the collision, which is computed on triangles, I want to make sure that when the physics is moving, the collision mesh is following. And how does it work? If I look here in the graph node, you can notice that here in the snake node, you have the physics, which is defined here. What kind of mass, what kind of deformation model. And I have a sub node, which corresponds to the collision model. And you see that there is something here, which is called the mapping, a barycentric mapping, which is coupling the collision mesh, actually made, made of triangles, as you, as you can see here. We have a triangle collision model. Coupling this collision model with the mechanics, in that case, in the physical model that we have just above. OK? The mapping is making this connection between the different representation. So this will be very, very useful uh, if, you, if you want to have you know, different meshes for, for, your, for your visualization, because again, visualization are usually just surface mesh, while the, while the, uh, while the, while, while the physics, for instance, is more computed on volumetric meshes. And you can use, for the physics, you can use hexahedra, and you can still use triangles for the visualization model which is a surface model made of triangles, OK? And this will always remain coupled, remain connected, and coherent using this mapping mechanism.
is that clear so far? Yeah, got it. Thank you. Cool. Uh, okay, I see a question of Shant I mean, a point of Shantanu. Sometimes the coarse mesh leads to simulation to crash in case of collision. So, um, crashes, or I would say crashes usually are, are actually due to instabilities, numerical instabilities. They are usually not related only, I mean, they are not related to the mapping. It's more related to the size, element size that you are using, the time, the time step that you are using, is the time step sufficiently small? Is are, are your numerical settings properly set so that the physical system, actually the matrix system, can be solved and can be solved so that it converges to a proper solution? So it's more usually crashes or instabilities that are related more to numerical settings rather than just mapping. But the mesh, especially the mesh size, can indeed be, uh, uh, can be related to that. We could, we, we, you do not hesitate to ask further questions later on, especially in the, in the user tutorial and so on about, uh, about that kind of things. It is what, what I call the, it's related to numerical analysis. It's all the field of numerical analysis and it's quite important actually to understand and capture those aspects and we're going to get back to that okay but yourself Shantanu do not hesitate to ask uh, again later and for further questions okay I'm going to carry on because time is always flying too fast uh, I mean flying by too fast so I, I, I'm going to move on but we're going to before before lunch anyway we're going to make uh, make uh, make some times uh, time take some time for questions and so on again so we saw the th basically, what I call the three main principles of SOFA. I'm going to move that here. So, main principles. First, there was the scene graph. Second, there was the uh, animation loop, which is actually some kind of what I uh, what I like to, to 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 call the referee of the simulation. It's not computing anything, but it is in charge of each step of simulation, each simulation step. What happens? Uh, what what has to what happens? Yeah, what what has to, to be computed and so on. And the last thing that we saw together, it was actually the mapping to connect different representation, for instance, the physics and the collision. Okay, and how to connect things and how, how to remain uh, how, how to keep those different representation co coherent with another. So that was three points. That I wanted to address because they are some kind of a bit specific to SOFA. But obviously, as all the other physics engine, SOFA has other properties, and I wanted to list them shortly here. For instance, we are working on some topology so we can load 3D, 2D, 1D meshes in SOFA. So you can use, you can load. 3D meshes like made of 3D elements like tetrahedron, hexahedron, can be made of triangles, it can be made of quads, it can be made of edges, points, and so on. That's what we call in SOFA the topology. It's actually a description of the geometry of your object. And, and not only, it's also a description on, on how your elements, for instance, your tetrahedron or your, or your triangles, how they are connected to another. What are, what are the neighboring the neighboring points of one vertex? For instance, here in one element, you will always have three. Uh, I mean, four points in in one tetrahedra or eight points in one hexahedra. How they are connected and so on and so forth. This is what we call the connectivity or the topology. The topology defines for one geometry. It defines sorry. It defines the connectivity. In SOFA, you have several kind of loaders. You can load different kind of meshes, OBJ files for surface meshes, VTK files, uh, STL files, a lot of different kind of meshes. SOFA is also connected to libraries that are uh, li like um, uh, the one which is called ASIMP, which is a library allowing for loading many, 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 many different kind of meshes uh, in SOFA. Okay? So, why? 
all those all those simulation softwares so not only sofa but all the simulation softwares are using topologies it's because then we are actually going to use those elements here we're going to use them to compute the physics especially in, in for physical physics engine what is usually done it's we cut we are actually making two two kind of what is called discretization the simulation will be cut in small time pieces which are called the time steps so we discretize in time and we discretize in space and that's why we are using those meshes here instead of having just one global volume we are cutting this volume into small sub volumes these elements and that will allow us i will explain that later on using the finite element method in sofa there is other method for that but using the finite element method we are dividing the space into small subspaces and making all the computations within these small subspaces so you can know different meshes in sofa for instance meshes that will be used for as we said before sur surface meshes like this one here that will be used for visualization or here it's volumetric you can see that it's a tetrahedra inside here so that will be used for the physics or again another surface mesh that will be used for the collision or for the haptics or whatever okay and for that we use mappings to connect all those guys the mapping will always make the the, the connection between the different representation just a small reminder about the mapping okay what is also in sofa in sofa as you might have already noticed for instance in the example with the with the with the snake that we saw before uh, by default in sofa when you run a simulation you have collision which is computed as you can notice here the snakes is colliding for for visualizing here the collision you can actually actually um, uh, activate the, the the point which is called interactions and as you can notice here at the bottom you can notice the collision which are drawn between the collision mesh of the snake this yellow triangle mesh and the, tr the triangular mesh here of the caduceus all right this is possible why because in sofa by default we have collision that occur and the collision it the collision is actually following what we call a collision pipeline it means a bit like the animation loop the, actually the animation loop when it's uh, you remember i said the default animation loop it has two steps at each time step first collision uh, first computing of the compute computation of the collision and second compute, computation of the physics taking into account the, the collision but to compute the collision it actually call the animation loop is relying on what we call a collision pipeline and it always work in three steps first we have the broad phase what does the broad phase do the broad phase is actually making sure i mean it computes some boxes what you can see in white around each object and it computes intersections between these bounding boxes if two boxes do not intersect it means the two objects contained in those boxes will not be in collision so it's actually a broad phase it is actually a quick way an efficient way to check if there is or not collision the second phase is actually triggered only if there was an intersection detected we go to the next step if no we stop and that's the end but if there was an intersection detected we will go into the second step which is called the narrow phase it's actually a computation a closer look to check if there is really interaction collision between the meshes for instance using discrete models like is there collision between my sphere and my triangles or just as we had before using this the the simulation scene uh with the snake and the caduceus is there a collision between my triangle here and my triangle here this is done in the narrow phase it means there was already a broad phase a collision between the bounding boxes and now we are checking closer if there is collision or not 
if there is collision, the output of this is actually pairs of collision models. I'm going to write that. It can be, can be useful here. Pair of collision models. And this will be used for what? To apply a collision response, which is the third step of the collision pipeline. It means it's a reaction. It will apply forces on the models depending on what occurred and how the collision has been detected. So that is something else that comes by default in the core of SOFA. You have already all the collision pipeline, which is implemented. As I said, always three steps, broad, narrow phase, and the collision response. There is different algorithms that do exist in SOFA for that. What, what is always used by default is actually this guy here. For the narrow phase, when we are checking if there is really a collision between the, after, after checking the broad phase, in the narrow phase, what we're going to check is we're going to check triangles per, per triangles, taking the different collision models, pairs of collision models, and checking if they are really colliding or not. But you have other methods like distance maps or uh, la layer depth images that do exist. And the same for the response. You have basically two collision responses possible. Either you are actually, actually using the collision information here, and you are checking at, I would say, some kind of what we, call, we could call that D, some kind of distance of interpenetration. And you will apply a force that will be proportional to D. It's what we call the penalty methods. It's quite simple, so it's not always the most stable method, but it's easy and efficient to compute. On the other hand, you have another kind of methods, another class of methods, which are called the Lagrange multiplier, multiplier constraints. It's actually for this case that we need to use. I'm trying to type as fast as possible the free motion animation loop. The free motion animation loop is actually used for computing this kind of cases. It's solving the collision and the constraints following what is called a Lagrange multiplier cons uh, approach uh, that will allow to take into account of the physics of the two objects and solving the collision and the constraints of the two objects simultaneously so it will take really into account of the physics. It's a bit, it's more advanced, it's more complicated, but it will be more accurate than the, than the penalty methods. Again, all that is available in SOFA. So in the core of SOFA, you can load meshes, you can use different kind of solvers. I did not mention that, but you have iterative linear solvers, direct solvers. Uh, you have different kind of physics already implemented in SOFA. You have deformation, deformable model for exadron, for elasticity. Uh, uh, you, have, um, you have also some hyper-elasticity models that are implemented in SOFA based on the finite element method. You have a bit of SPH, but only a bit. Uh, you have, uh, you have uh, uh, also some people that worked on position-based dynamics, but it's some, in some, some other plugins. So, and, and the collision pipeline and all the collision computation and constraints resolution that comes with SOFA. So all that is built in the core of SOFA. But uh, I did not saw your, your question, Hadi. I'm going to get back to that. But, but as, as you know, that's for the core of SOFA, the C++ core of SOFA. But around this core, research groups, industrials, independent developers, they are all developing plugins and adding and adding new features, new physical models. For instance, we have people working at ETH that, uh, that are starting to look at creating magnetic fields in SOFA so that they, are gonna, they, are gonna, they should start early 20, in 2021 to implement new physical models in their plugin for having um, the mechanical effect of electro, uh, electromagnetic fields. So that's the kind of things uh, that are also possible. So you have plenty of plugins to give you an idea of how many plugins there are. And it can be very big plugins, like 200,000 line of codes or whatever. 
There is more than 100,000 plugins that I know, and I can assure, assure you there is a lot of them that I don't know. So you have a lot, a lot of plugins that do exist. If you'd like to, if something already exists in some research teams or in, so, in some companies, if you'd like to collaborate around the, uh, a topic, never hesitate to get back to me or to anyone of, of, the SOFA, of the SOFA staff because it might already exist somewhere and people might be open also to share and to collaborate on this topic. All right. So that was for what are the main principles, what exists in SOFA. And I just wanted to conclude this part in mentioning some plugins that comes directly with SOFA. They are not activated by default, as you know, but that can, they can be activated. So it's optional features that comes with SOFA. So to answer your point, Adi, it's actually, when I say haptics, it's actually related to collision, uh, to have a collision model de dedicated to the haptics, but it's it's basically the same than a collision model that will be dedicated to an haptic, uh, an haptic device, but it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the, exactly the same as a collision model, a uh, uh, collision, yeah, collision representation. It's a bit, I should have written that it's a bit confusing for, for nothing. All right. All right. <clears throat> Let's move to some of the plugins existing in SOFA. This one, you might have actually uh, some, there might be some, some questions that will rise about that, uh, and especially, yeah, so about this Python plugin in SOFA. As you might have noticed, I'm going to try to open in a short amount of time yeah, here the window and, sh 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 and share it immediately with you. Uh, as you might have already noticed, um, there is, a, so th there is a lot of plugins in SOFA, but there is now in the sources of so far, in application plugins, you have two plugins for Python. You have a Sofa Python, which is actually, it should be named Sofa Python 2, because it's actually related to the Sofa Python 2.7 version of, so, uh, of Python, and Sofa Python 3. And starting from the next release, we are going to work mostly, and actually we're going to promote only Sofa Python 3, which is the newest version of SOFA, SOFA Python. Still yet, it's a bit unstable for the moment. That's why we, we are announcing that only for the next release, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, coming, it's the one which is coming by default in SOFA in the future. So what is the, the purpose of using SOFA with simulation? The first big advantage is that it allows to script a simulation and to, to describe the graph as it was before the case with XML. But this kind of scripting language allows to have a lot of, I would say, interactivity and dynamics in the simulation. Because as you asked before, uh, it was Jake, I think, right? Yeah, Jake, you asked, is that possible to change for instance, first the mesh, but it could be also, could that be possible to change properties, to change, to add a new object or to remove an object during the simulation? That's one big advantage of Python. It's actually that it's not static as XML. XML, you define the simulation and you run it. It's what I like to call a direct simulation. Their direct simulation is one way. The advantage of Python is that you, you can some kind of plan, define things that will occur during the simulation, like when there is key events, keyboards, events, mouse events, events or interactions from the users. And you can make dynamic modifications. That's one very big advantage of Sofa, of Sofa Python. The one that you might, you might also like is that you, you, you have nothing to implement in, in C++. That's full Python, so can, it's actually quite easy to, to write. So it's quite convenient. With the, we are working to, on something with the Sofa Python 3 to even make not only the description of the scene possible using the uh, Python script, but we would like also to make possible that people can create new components like you create you could you will be able to create your own 
physical model, solver, anything you want, in Python and not anymore in C++. So the Sofa, this will be only possible in Sofa Python 3, but this will be extremely powerful again when it will be released in, uh, in January. So that are for the big advantages of, so of Sofa Python. And again, for pro prototyping, prototyping, sorry, uh, trying to describe what is in the simulation and creating a new simulation, it goes super quickly compared to C++. So that's why we, we like uh, going towards uh, Sofa Python. Um, yeah, I wanted to show you this uh, this short example. It's a, it's a video that I'm gonna gonna share with you here. It's an example of uh, a simulation that uh, uh, that has been done uh, really some time ago. It started being a bit old as well. This one, but I'm gonna show you more more and more recent videos along the day. It was a, a video that was uh, aiming dedicated to a surgeon. We wanted to allow the surgeon to load medical images with Sofa. So this is possible with a, with a plugin which is called image. The image plugin in Sofa can allow you to load any kind of images, including medical images. But we wanted also to let the surgeon free to create here, add needles. It's actually needles that, that, are, that are used to destroy a tumor, just destroy a, a tumor by the cold. It's actually freezing the tumor. And we wanted to let the, the, the surgeon free to add as many needles he wanted, start the, the, the freezing mechanism whenever he wanted, and so on and so forth. So for that, a lot of things behind are actually scripted using Python. So even for prototypes, even for products, a lot of our companies are actually relying now on Sofa Python, especially Sofa Python 3. You can also accelerate your codes using what is called GPU computing. But for that, you need really to know how does those, uh, what is called NVIDIA toolkits, the CUDA toolkit, that will, allow to, uh, that will allow you to drop a part of the simulation and to make, dedicate a part of the simulation on the GPU unit, so on the graphical unit of your computer. It has to be simple computations, but it's super powerful when it's simple, but a lot of computation. It allows to make parallel parallel computation. And the Sofa CUDA plugin in Sofa allows to parallelize a part of it. But the big, I mean, the more your simulation will be made 100% of the GPU, the fastest it will be. What costs always a lot of time is the communication between the GPU and the CPU of your machine. So this I mean, you need to be some a bit some kind of expert. I, I think you need to have some knowledge at least uh, for for making GPU computing. But there is a plugin dedicated to that in Sofa. And last but not least, that I mean, it's not a, as I said, there is hundreds of plugins in Sofa, so I I, I don't want to list them all. But it's some, just to give a, a bit of ideas of what do exist. Uh, there is people developing also interactive, or I would say uh, haptic interface plugins plugins that allows to couple simulation with haptic interfaces, like, as I said before, Geomagics that are some haptic devices, leap motions, or we're going to have the presentation by the, by the, by the company developing those, um, developing those haptics later on, on, tu on tomorrow, on Tuesday. It will be on Tuesday, just at the beginning of the afternoon for us uh, in Paris. It's, it's, it's called Follow Haptics. It's a Swedish company that is making actually Afford, affordable, so not too expensive, which is quite rare in the field, haptics, especially for medical simulation. So if you are interested, do not hesitate to check out their, their website. I think it's called uh, follow haptics, uh, haptics, uh, com, or I think it should be something like that. So yeah, we have companies developing also things like that to couple Sofa with many additional new devices when uh, when new devices are, are happening. All right. So as I said, there is many, many other plugins in Sofa. We are, we are starting to build what is called a marketplace to make a, a list of the existing plugins in Sofa. So this marketplace is, is available online. You can, you can, uh, can directly check that out here in Sofa application marketplace application 
marketplace. You can have here, it's just a sum of the plugins. It's really a short, short list that we need. We are working on it to, to add more and more plugins. If you are developing your own plugins, never hesitate, whether it's open and pri or private, to let me know so that we can upload and make some advertisement of your work here directly online. So a lot of plugins do exist, integrating Sofa into Unity, into Unreal, uh, using to uh, allowing to manipulate medical images, non-linear non constitutive laws, model order redu reductions, dynamic topologies, as we said before, and soft robotics, which is one of the big fields growing in the community. So this first part, so I, I think, I hope you're going to help you. You're going to also develop your own plugins. You are really the one to choose the, the license to set up on your, on your code. So you're free to, to do anything you'd like with Sofa. What I'm always asking is just keep us informed so that we can make as much as advertisement, connections, and so on for you to connect you with other people in the community. To sum up this first part, really do not hesitate to, to get started with your own simulation and models. We're going to start also this afternoon. Never hesitate to get on the forum uh, here to, get, uh, to ask your questions when you're using Sofa. When you start, when it starts to be more developer questions, do not hesitate to go on GitHub, GitHub and Gitter to report bugs or to ask developer questions. Uh, so for, I'm going to show that shortly because there is a dedicated area directly on the on the website website of uh, on the GitHub website here. When you are on GitHub, you can post directly when you're facing developer problems, what is called issues. And here, it's actually issues listed by developers that we are working uh, that we are working on. And uh, okay, and yeah, and uh, sorry. What, what I wanted also to to to, to show is that when you want to discuss with the with the developers about some development problems or or any any other topics, you can go here on what is called Gitter. It's related to GitHub, and you have a link. Here, gitter.im slash sofa framework slash sofa can directly here chat with all the developers of sofa. But it's really for develop, developer questions. User questions, it's on the forum. Bug reports, it's on GitHub. And chatting with the developers, it's on GitHub. Everything is actually explained on the Get Involved page of the community here. Community here. So do not hesitate to just check uh, check this page again, and you're going to find all the information. All right. So the big event, and it's once a year of the of the community. That's really the place to meet everyone. It will be the, it's, it's the Sofa Week, and it's actually tomorrow. It's once a year, so it's not every day that that I can say it's going to be tomorrow. But tomorrow, it's really a big day for the community to meet, to discover what people are doing, to chat, to start projects, to start sharing codes. It's really a, a good day for, for, for discovering what people are actually doing. Otherwise, we have every week some development meetings. That, that's actually where, where and when we are discussing the pull requests. You remember, it's the contributions that people propose back to Sofa. That's every week we are checking those, uh, those pull requests together with the developers. And the technical committee is actually twice each year and we are discussing all the big technical changes, and it's especially for the release, to know what comes into the release, what people actually developed on their own in plugins or in Sofa, so that if they want to bring back things into, into Sofa, it's a good time to discuss that. So never hesitate to join the, week, the weekly dev meetings, the, the biannual technical meeting with committee, and obviously the Sofa week. OK, that's all for this first part. What we're going to see just right af afterwards, it's first some examples of applications of Sofa to relax a bit, and then we're going to start the user tutorial all together. Okay. Is there any questions so far about the, the this this first part of uh, of a tutorial? I'm going to upload the new slides here. Okay. Oh, I'm, I'm just going to take a bite of, uh, of, of my pastry here. Mm. 
Mm. Shall we have um, then? Uh, let, let's take a quite short break. Then, in that case, Shantanu, is, there, is that possible to take um, not more than five minutes so that we can get a uh, continue and so on? Okay. Sure. Okay. Cool. So for me, five minutes. It's um, eleven. Uh, um, eleven uh, seventeen. I'm gonna wait that you all you all get back. Okay. Okay. Cool. If you want to ask questions in the meantime, for for all the others, please go ahead and ask all the questions you want in the meantime. So I know I noticed your point, um, Christian. Um, as you as you if you are asking the question, I guess it's because you 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 know that it's um, the Infinitech three D company which is um, developing this uh, integration of Sofa into Unity three D. They are providing very low prices for um, for uh, evaluation license. So so for research licenses uh, for for research centers. I know there have been other implementations for Sofa Unity, actually one other implementation that has been done by a research group uh, uh, um, uh, here in France. I guess it could be made available. So it, it's not open source. It's not an open source one, but uh, it's a way of, it's actually a way of having a you know, client server where Sofa is uh, actually the, the the, the server and it is sending to Unity, which is the client, the simulation, uh, the visualization mesh information so that it's actually displayed. So it's not a full integration of Sofa into Unity. I don't know how much it's up to date. I could, I could, I could connect you. Why I like actually to connect uh, to connect people uh, to Infinitech Infinite 3D is because first the work they are they are doing is. Uh, really up to date, maintained, and it's super good partners to start, uh, I mean, to, to work with in the community. If you really cannot pay and cannot, cannot afford for anything, still, I think the Infinitech 3, they could, uh, they could be open to, to discussion, but the amount, I think, if I remember properly, the amount for um, research license is some, some, sometimes like uh, five, five, 500, 500K per, per year or something like that. So, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, do you confirm what I just said, uh, Christian, about the price and 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 so on? Okay, I will. <clears throat> Thank you, Jacob, for um, for the question. It's um, it's actually indeed a, a well known platform as well, Ross, for um, for robotics and soft robotics. Um, there is actually two ways of getting connected, uh, get, getting a connection with uh, Ross for uh, for Sofa. I'm going to give you the the two, um, and th there was yeah, there was a discussion about that on on the forum, by the way. Um, so, first, there is a plugin dedicated to that for, for Sofa. It means it's really a plugin <clears throat> to compile with Sofa that will I mean, get the connection with the library uh, ROS. It's called Sofa ROS Connector. It has been made by um, a German developer. 
So this is one first solution. And there is another solution, which is, I think, at, at least a bit, I don't know if it's more modern, but at least more and more people are going for that. It's to use uh, ROS through, through a Python environment and use SOFA, namely using the SOFA Python 3 plugin, uh, because that's what SOFA Python, another thing that SOFA Python 3 will allow. SOFA Python 3 will allow to use uh, SOFA from a pure Python environment. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> So it means it will allow you to start, stop, restart, stop a SOFA simulation from a full, fully native Python environment and therefore connect SOFA and ROS as much as you want. It's the two ways. So either the SOFA ROS connector or, or the, I would say, SOFA Python 3 plugin and the in, in the environment use SOFA and ROS. In the Python environment, use SOFA plus ROS. So two solutions are up to you. And I think if you want to, again, I'm going to look for the discussion about that on the forum so that I can, if you have any issue, you could then post your, your, your problems there. Uh, ROS. OK. <coughs> Yeah, it was here. There you are. Here it's the link to, to the question, I mean, to where people were, because there was a guy having some issues with the first solution, actually the SOFA ROS connector plugin. And they, they chatted here with, a, with, a, with a, some, some developers of the, pro, of the project. Uh, <clears throat> it's a good question, Changni. Not to my knowledge, um, what I know in SOFA is that there was, there, 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 uh, I should find that again, there is an example scene in SOFA that where you have actually the skeleton of someone uh, walking or running, I don't rem remember, so with, the, you know, with, with all the knee, uh, shoulder, joints, and so on. So I could, uh, I could try to point that, uh, to, to find that out for you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, when when you see me uh, the head down, it's just I'm I'm writing your your questions so that I can, I can remember later on. <clears throat> okay. Are you back, uh, Shantanu? And let me know if I'm if I'm misspelling any any first name. Please uh, correct me uh, because I'm <laughs> I'm I'm sometimes just uh, st uh, I mean. Spelling the name as I would feel to, to spell them uh, and to, to pronounce them, but do not hesitate to correct uh, any time. <clears throat> right. Okay. So what I propose is that we carry on. So as I said, the first part, as you as you understood, it was general presentation of SOFA, the community but mainly understanding the three main principles, again, scene graph, animation loop, and the mapping, just to know that this is a bit specific to SOFA, and it has to be understood. And once it was done, we looked at what? We looked at all the features that were in SOFA, possible to load a mesh, load any kind of topology, 3D, 2D, whatever, um, and also to activate and deactivate many possible plugins that are at your disposal in SOFA. Again, Many people are developing their plugins in their own plugins and own repositories, which are not always visible. So if you're looking for something, never hesitate, as you already did, to ask for that. And I would be super happy to, to connect. What we're going to see right now is actually some examples of projects that what people can actually achieve with SOFA, because it will show you the kind of variety of things that can be achieved, also the difference of what kind of models are existing, what people do really with SOFA. And then we're going to move to the user tutorial 
for the user tutorial, we're going to have we're going to start using SOFA, running different scenarios, different kind of scenes, one by one, and understanding what it means, what is the role of each of those uh, objects in the scene. Okay? So, let's start with the example of projects uh, using SOFA. So, the, well, I'm going to start with examples with SOFA in the medical field. Because a, a lot of things are actually done in the medical fields in SOFA, but not only. You'll see that there is other topics that are addressed. So first one was electro. Uh, so I, I showed you before. You know this electro mechanical video uh, made with SOFA. But for this was used, for instance, to build what? To build a training simulator. So it's a, a virtual simulator to train. Electrocardiolo I mean, uh, electrophysiologists to analyze, to take a, a virtual patient to analyze, understand what was going on, and to treat what is called cardiac arrhythmia. So cardiac ar ar arrhythmia, it's when there is abnormality in the electrical activity of the heart. And the purpose was actually to run a simulation, training people for that. So there, there, there is basically two things in this simulation, training people to navigate with a catheter. That's what you can see here. People were navigating with this catheter into a moving environment. This was done actually on one thread, and to another thread, there was a computation, partially done on a GPU, by the way, but a computation of the electrical activity of the heart. So this allowed us to build a full training simulator where people could actually understand and train to manipulate a catheter, navigate in blood vessels, analyzing electrical signals, seeing what were, uh, trying to understand what kind of pathology it is, and to, to, to build this way a training simulator. So that's one way, you know, using simulation in the medical field to build simulators where people can virtually train and train and rehearse and rehearse before going to on a patient, basically manipulating and treating directly a patient. Here, you can pre-operatively train either with, a, uh, with, a, with a, some kind of Atlas data, but we could also here integrate patient-specific data, but this for training, okay? Another example, it's, and that would be interesting for, uh, for Christian for, for, the, for the eye, it's actually a project that started uh, back in 2012 and which is still active. They made a product from, from that. It's an eye surgery made to train people in the third world countries. The simulator is used to train ophthalmologists in, uh, in Africa. It's also used uh, uh, in, in uh, I think, in Nepal. It has been used. It has been used in many, many different countries to learn on simulators for ophthalmologists the gesture of one surgery train and train and train to get validated by the uh, by the training simulator to then treat cataract which is you know opacification so the people become blind it's an op opacification of the lens of the eye and the purpose of the surgery is actually to remove this lens so so that people can actually see and replace it so that people can see again that's a, a, a simulator which is now existing. It's called the Help Me See project. It's a, a project that has been funded by the Melinda Gates, uh, so the wife of uh, Bill Gates uh, Foundation, uh, that funded this association to create this simulator to treat cataract. Another example, this time for a company. The first one, it was a, clini uh, it was a, clin a clinical training system made by research teams. And this one is, is a training system ma made by uh, company, which is called Insimo. Then, if we move a bit forward, there is not only training which is done for. So I, I can I can use also the slide so we saw here the train the training simulator for electrophysiology. We saw here the training simulator for cataract surgery. It's actually a surgery which is quite cheap, so it's very well dedicated to third world countries. It allows to treat with a small amount of money, treat cataract and, and uh, so treat blindness. This, this was the simulation I just showed you. 
There was also some people working uh, in Canada, this time still a company uh, on training simulators for kidney stones. It's another example. But simulation can also be used not only for training, for a gesture, but also before, just before an operation, we can use patient data, load those patient data into the simulation, into the simulator, and use the simulator as a planning tool. This time, trying to plan what would be the best approach, what would, what would be the best tool. In that case, tomorrow you're going to have a presentation by uh, someone, uh, uh, I'm going to write uh, his name here, Kami here. Krokon here. It's a, a former PhD student who worked on the stent deployment. So that's a, a, a metal structure deploying into, in, inside a blood vessel. And by doing that, it allowed it allows the blood vessel to reopen when it's closed due to uh, due to um, uh, uh, stenosis, so fatty tissues inside the inside inside the blood vessels. So by doing that, by running a simulation using patient specific data, we can choose what would be the best device to choose, what should be the geometry of this device, where should where where should be enter where, where should we enter the body to access at best for this specific patient uh, for the surgery. So it's really to, to use the simulation as a planning tool. Still using a simulation for planning before the operation. It's actually another work, this time not for research, from research, but for, from another company, which is called Anatoscope. Uh, so here, there we are, and to take the bed again. So Anatoscope. Anatoscope, it's a, a company which is making prosthesis, prosthesis for many different topics, uh, especially they started a lot on, on orthopedics and dental. Uh, I'm gonna show I'm gonna show you some 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 nice video that they made uh, about about that about their their products and, and applications. But they are basically using simulation. They have an, uh, some kind of atlas of simulation, and oh, this one was very short, but it's actually using a, an atlas of simulation where they use this atlas, they are going to fit the atlas with patient data. And from this knowledge of this physics knowledge from that they have from the simulation, they are going to design implants, like dental implants, or how to design the best, uh, uh, for instance, the best prosthesis for the knee, or, oh, no, I missed it. Uh, can I, you know, I can't run that. I'm going to run, run another video here. Or that kind of things that can be achieved again, running simulation this time to really design patient specific. So here it was fun for dental, as we said before. They are fitting patient data. And then from those patient data, they are going to decide what how should be the implant, where it should be located, modify all the different parameters, and, and so on and so forth. So this, this example is again for, for dental, but they are applying that for radiology for different purposes again. Okay, and last but not least, so we saw that simulation can be used for training, for planning, and choosing what would be the best, uh, 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 the best strategy before an operation, so pre-operatively. And people are even working, and we saw that a bit before, you know, with the augmented reality view that we had. People are even working on making augmented reality to guide the surgeons during the surgery. So we are taking patient data, acquiring patient data, like here, before the operation. We are getting the 3D models, all the internal structures, and so on. We are building uh, uh, the whole simulation. And then, yeah. I cannot see the radio. Radio is not accessible. Ah, damn. Uh, sorry. Thank you for for letting me know. I'm going to share share again my screen. Ah, that's okay. That's you, you can see. You can see it. But now I can see. Okay. 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 Cool. Uh, uh, well, uh, I, I stopped the sharing. Maybe it's is that. Can, can uh, let me know if you can see it right now. Can you see the video? No. I cannot see the video. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna share share the screen. It's just that uh, this video is limited. Yeah, 
I guess I the, the I don't know why or whether I'm the, the no, only no, one no. I can't see. No, it should, it should it should be on my side. I, I mean, um, actually, not on my side, but it's rather, I guess, um, the due to the fact that the author of the video did not properly share the properly share the uh, properly share the video. Uh, hop, uh, here we are. Okay, good. And there we are. So now you should see the you should see my screen. It's actually the the YouTube link. I can send you the YouTube link, link as well, so that you can run the simulation yourself. I mean the video yourself on your on your side. But the the idea is that they are recovering before the operation patient data, and then once the the surgery starts, they will make what is called a registration step. They are fitting the preoperative and intraoperative data. And then they are providing this augmented reality view. So the surgeon sees some kind of through the organ using the physics of SOFA. So again, you, it was really to show you that you have the possibility to use simulation at very different levels of you know, a surgery. You can use that before to train, to train students. You can use that just before to better plan an operation. And you can even use that during the surgery. That's for medical application, but there is a lot of people that are actually using for different purposes. The one, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, I, I got uh, some sound of another video that was coming in, in my in my helmet, in my in my headset. Okay, um, and people are actually doing different kind of things uh, with sofa. I mentioned that I mentioned before people are using it at, at the uh, cell level for biology. How do cells, especially cancer cells, to interact? And there is also other guys working on soft robotics. That's uh, the first video that was made back uh, back in 2016, I think, uh, for controlling a fully deformable robot using SOFA. You were you were actually giving an objective target to reach uh, in the simulation, and it was controlling uh, using an, an inverse model controlling the ro the motors of this real silicon robot. So that's what, that's uh, uh, the whole work which is made, and I guess uh, most of you know that, which is made around around the soft, um, soft, robotics, uh, soft robotics plugin. OK, so about that, there is a, a lot of different videos. I'm, I'm maybe not going to share, share them all, but uh, I, can, I can show you maybe one, one or two others. But then we're, we're going to go and move to the yeah, here for grasping, you have a grasper which is completely deformable. Grasping a rigid object, it could actually grasp a deformable object as well. I mean, yeah, that's a lot of, a lot of different works that are this time not anymore related to medicine, but that can be applied to any kind of industrial applications and so on. And here, in the same way, it's actually it, it was a, a robot controlled using. There is a mechanical model here, but that has been reduced using model over reduction, and the, the the whole robot learned on how to actually walk and progress uh, and uh, go forward in space. All right, and I'll conclude with this one because it has nothing to 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 see with neither medicine nor robotics. It's people more. On the computer scientist, uh, I'm cutting the sound. Uh, I, 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 I forgot that there was some sound here. Uh, it's it's a video showing that we can actually use simulation for many pu different purposes, like here, adding deformation where there is known in an image, in a video, whatever whatever the base. But you can actually add anything you'd like and change that uh, in, in your in your stream. So people for the for the for the UK guys from the London guys, you may recognize the bridge. Again, deformation of uh, uh, adding deformation in a video, like uh, just uh, if uh, if it was completely a marshmallow bridge, or the same for that's more a French version of it, but uh, uh, an Eiffel Tower uh, saying hello to to everyone. So again, to see that with simulation, you can achieve very different purposes, and simulation can be at the crossing of robotics, soft robotics, computer graphics, biology, mechanics electrophysiology, whatever. So a lot of different topics that, that are that can be addressed uh, using simulation. Okay.
So I think there, there won't be many questions on that. Maybe if you are interested in getting more, knowing more about one or one part or, or another, just let uh, let me know. We're going to have a look now to the third, and it will be the last part for this morning. It's the user tutorial where we'll, we're going to follow step by step the construction of a simulation scene. And why we do that step by step is really to understand the role of each component in the simulation graph. OK? If there is any question, please uh, feel free to, to, to interrupt and to ask about what we just saw. If you, if you, if you want to get the contacts or more info about some, some stuff, let me know as well. I'd be happy to, to connect. So <clears throat> So we're going to start now to use Sofa. So please, if you didn't do it, please uh, download, uh, download the binary version of Sofa. I guess you all did uh, you uh, all have one. Um, so if you yeah, if you have one, so it, does, does anyone? do not have a working version of Sofa on, the, on, on your computer. OK, fine for everyone then. Um, you can already open that. And what you can open as well is uh, the, the, the simulation files that I sent you per mail, which are called the Sofa training scene. Uh, I think it's the version 6 because there have been several evolutions of those of those uh, of those training and step by step uh, step by step uh, tutorial scenes. You can you can open them and we're going to take them together one by one. Does anyone do not know what I mean by those uh, training simulation scenes here? So and by the way, there there, there will be one rule that I would that I would uh, last, uh, that uh, I would ask you to 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 follow if possible, it's actually not to start the simulation before I do, so that I can ask you some questions about what you think will happen, why, and so on, so that we can have some, something first interactive, and also so that you can really understand the point of the, of the, of the simulation graph and all those uh, simulation scenes, OK? So let me always start first the simulation, and then I'll let you do, uh, do the same on, on your computer locally. If it's fine for everybody, I'm gonna, I'm going to, I'm gonna, going, going, we are gonna, we are gonna start this uh, user tutorial. So I don't see anybody mentioning anything. So let's go forward. So we saw the overview of Sofa. We saw the different kind of application, and now we are here. We are, we are gonna have a look to the user tutorial before looking at what it means really on a, on a mathematical standpoint. That will be for this afternoon. All right. So I'm going to be quick uh, on the reminder. Yeah, I forgot to say something a bit this morning. It's that on GitHub, if you up to a point you 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 like you like so far up to the point that really you would like to advise that to other people. What we always like is that well, if you can cite so far in your papers, that's uh, marvelous. If you can talk about so far in the in presentations for conferences and so on, it's marvelous as well. And you have, you have here on GitHub, you have something which is called stars. It allows to promote uh, on GitHub directly the, the, the open source project. So we are, I think we were to 399 stars on GitHub. So if you'd like later on in the day or in the week, make the, the 400 uh, uh, star for, for the project, it would be very nice. Uh, what else? So we saw about you know using so far, you have two ways, either downloading the binaries or using the sources that you need to Compile. We will all end up with this graphical user interface, and we will start to launch and open all the simulations directly from the from the interface. Okay, we're, we're going to use uh, this graphical user interface to go forward in time. The user tutorial will work th this way. We'll start with with an almost empty scene, and we're going to use XML because it's a bit simpler. But we could use Python as well. And then we are going to add some physics. We have, we're going to add solvers, rendering, mappings to connect things. You're, you're going to see it's going to 
you know, remind you what we already said about the mapping. We're going to add a collision to our object and so on, and um, up to the point that we will, we're, we're going to translate exactly the same XML scene. We're going to translate that into Python so that you can see how to write in XML and how to write in Python. OK? So yeah, I think this link should uh, allow you to, download, to, to, to redirect you directly if you did not redirect you directly to the, to the scene files to, that we're going to use for, for, the, for the tutorial. So yeah, since it's a PDF here, the simulation, the, 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 the scenario will not work. I mean, the, the video here will not work. What we, what we, what we want to achieve, I'm going to share, uh, I'm going to share my simulation with you, my sofa, my sofa window with you. Sorry, just just a sec. I'm restarting so far here. Okay, open and I'm going to share share my screen straight away. Okay, share so far. There we are. So the simulation we want to end up with will be a simulation where we actually have two objects. One will be rigid, the other one will be deformable. The two will, will actually collide and interact and will have different properties and so on, okay? That's what we want for the tutorial. The purpose is actually not that the scene, the scene will not be actually very complicated. You see that you have one object, the lever, one object, the sphere, that was falling, falling onto the lever. But the main idea of the tutorial is really to understand how things are connected which components talk to which component, and why, and how it has actually to be uh, to be organized in your simulation scenario, so that you can have clean and proper simulation scenes for you in the future for your own purposes. So let's move on, and we can we're, we're going to look we're going to take a look at the scene number zero, so the zero base scene, and I'm going to stop uh, stop sharing the screen for the moment, but. It, yeah, yeah. I see. I, I see Shantanu that uh, is reconnecting. Perfect. So this will this will be the first scene scene that we're gonna that we're gonna open and, and launch. So again, just wait for wait for me at each step uh, to before before starting. Let's have a look first to the to the scene. If you open the scene, uh, the one which is called uh, zero base. Sorry, um, it's very hard to write, but it's basically that zero base dot scn for scene, simulation scene, you're going to see that, exactly that here. It's an XML script. And when, what does contain this XML script? Almost nothing, actually. Just here, this guy is the root node, as you can notice. So it's actually the entry point, the beginning of the simulation, the entry point. In the root node, we can define the time step is actually the amount of time computed at each time step. You know, we are going forward of 0 0.01 at each time step. And we can even specify the gravity, but here we set 0, so you can actually forget about the gravity here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just, yeah, for, let's forget about that here. And what are we setting here? We are setting a default animation loop. Okay, so that at each time step, we'll have some specific steps computed, namely collision and physics. And what else? Only one other stuff is here. This guy. This guy is just one subnode. It has nothing in it for the moment, but it doesn't matter. One subnode called my simulation. That's the name we just gave we just gave in the in the in the scene file. Okay. So if we if we open that in sofa, we're gonna have that here. You can see that in the left hand side panel, in the graph panel, we have the root node. If we double click on the root node, you can notice that we have indeed here. Uh, oh, okay, you can't see it. Sorry. Uh, I'll let you double click on the other root node, but if if you if you if you 
if if you take if you take a look at the at the root node, you can notice that the the root node the root node sorry as 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 several data, especially one which is called dt for time step, uh, and it's zero dot zero one as we specified in the in the in the scene file. I'm gonna I'm gonna share actually I'm gonna share my screen in a different way. Let me know if if you which one you prefer. But uh, I think this one will be easier, like that here. Okay. So on the left and uh, on the right hand side part, you can see uh, actually the file that we are loading, and the, on the left hand side part, you can see sofa. And here, I double clicked on the root node, and you can see here that dt is equal to zero dot zero one, as we specified here. Let's change that here. Let's zero dot zero two. And I'm gonna so close that, and I'm gonna reload the file. I double click on the, on the root node, and you can notice that here the time step is now 0 0.02. Okay, so everything obviously you change that here when you will reload the XML file here, it will change. But as you remember, XML is something static, so you load the XML file just once. So you need to reload it if you want to uh, uh, update some information here. All right. On your opinion, so I, 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 can, I can also the same way. I can also change the name. I can uh, I can say I can uh, uh, I can also write that here for for instance. Bye bye Trump here. That will that will be the name of of my node. Here it was my simulation. I will close and reload, and you can see that the name of my subnode by by Trump is updated according to the to the to the file. Okay. It's a completely empty scene. So as as you can guess, nothing will happen. There is nothing in the scene. There is really just nothing. But what, what happens actually at each time step? At each time step there is this default animation loop which is actually asking for, you remember, it's asking for two, two things, two things, sorry. It will, it will ask for, oh guys, is there, is there some collision, especially collision pipeline to compute a collision between objects? Here, here we have nothing, so nothing happened. In the physics, it will say, oh guys, is there some solvers to compute the physics? As you can notice here, there is none, so nothing will happen. So. Next time step. So if we press, now you can actually click on animate and you will see what? You will see that the time is actually going forward. Time is, flowing, is passing by, but nothing happens. Nothing is visible because there is absolutely nothing in the simulation. But time goes forward because the animation loop is just looking for people to compute things. There is nobody. It doesn't care. It goes forward in time. Okay. OK, let's go for the scene number two here. This time, we're going to add, so it's the same scene that before. T time step is equal to 0 0.01. There is no gravity, so we can forget about it here. And we are, this time, adding one thing in the subnode. In the subnodes, part, we, we first, we just renamed it, but it's a detail. But we are adding something here, mechanical object. As I said in the in the first part of the presentation this morning, you really have to remi remind one thing about the mechanical object. The mechanical object is actually a container. It's a it's a, a container of degree of freedom. Degrees of freedom. I should have put an S, but a degrees of freedom. Okay, what kind of degrees of freedom? Do you have an idea? Do, do, do you already, do, some of you did, uh, did, uh, did some of you already check a bit where here the kind of degrees of freedom, so the kind of, so we can call that the unknown, what we are looking for. What are the degrees of freedom here of this simulation scene here? Do you have, a, do you have, do you have an idea? Are we working with a one unknown per node, two unknowns, three unknowns, what, 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 X, Y, Z, whatever, what, what, what's your opinion on that? Shantanu is already typing. Who else? Jacob. 
Okay, two unknowns. Okay, and the, why, why is that your case? Uh, why, is, why is your case uh, saying uh, ah? Okay, okay, okay. Okay, exactly. So I'm waiting for for. Okay, so while the last uh, la last replies come comes in, I'm gonna I'm gonna. Okay, the information about what kind of degrees of freedom are contained in the mechanical object is actually given where? It's actually given by this guy here. What we call the template. The template is a property of the mechanical objects explaining on what kind of degrees of freedom we are going to work on. So when we say, in this case, rigid 3D, it means, as Jacob Chantanou said, uh, exactly, and, uh, yeah, uh, said, it's indeed, there will be a position, so X, Y, Z in space, so three degrees of freedom. But not only, there will also be what is called a quaternion, it's actually an orientation to tell you in which direction is actually pointing your, your frame in so far we usually call them, it's a, it can be called, oh, I should have used the text, but it's a frame or a rigid, a rigid frame. And it will be defined by X, Y, Z here. Uh, I'm going to clear that it becomes to be a mess here. It's going to be X, Y, Z plus a quaternion. And a quaternion, it's actually a four real information giving you the orientation of your particle. So always take always a, a really huge care of wh what is written here in the template. If you want to work, if you want uh, your, your 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 object to be only you know if you are interested just in the position x y z and not the quaternion, then instead of rigid three D, you can use the one which is called indeed as a, a, a VEC 3D. It's very dirty, sorry for the writing, but uh, VEC 3D. But here, we're going to use a rigid cases. So position plus orientation. Always care about this template. Another information is, we call that mechanical object. It's, I, I don't really like the name. We, call, we should call that actually just DOF con container. Because it's not necessarily a mechanical object. It could be a chemical object or a thermal object, or depending on what we are looking for. It's just a container of degrees of freedom. That's really what has to be reminded. Okay. Now this scene. I'm going to share again my screen with the, with the, the entire screen. On your opinion, what will happen? Don't do, please do not run the, the simulation. What will happen? if we run this simulation here. So I will open that here. Do not, again, animate, but on your opinion, what will happen here? We have a particle here, which is indeed the rigid frame XYZ plus an orientation. What do you think will happen? It's going to fall. For, for, for which reason is, is that going to fall? Do you have an idea? Because I'm going to open here the, the graph in my particle. I have the definition of, yeah, first there is no gravity, but what, what, what will affect actually gravity? What is the uh, force due to gravity? It's actually gravity acceleration times. Exactly. Perfect. There is no mass. Globally, even more generally, there is no physics here. We just have one container, the mechanical object container, it's completely passive. The mechanical ob object in contains DOF, okay? Those degrees of freedom could change in time, but for, for them to change, there needs to be, there, there, there must be a physics, uh, some physical components defining yeah, how it will move or how it will evolve in time. We need to have solvers, we need to have a lot of things here. We just have one node with, uh, with one single particle defined, but that's it, just we have an initial position defined, but that's it. So if I'm going to share again this screen here, if I click on animate, you can indeed notice the time is going forward again, because even if we did not put one, you can here see the default animation loop. 
can notice that we did not write one, but, but as you remember, it's equivalent to write default animation loop because by default it will be created. I can let I can let that here and reload. You'll see there will be no difference. Reload. You see again the two are, the two are here. The animation loop was already here by default created. Animate. It's not moving because no physics, no solvers, nothing. Have you noticed that it's it, it seems to be shifted here, right? Shifted in the y axis, in the positive y axis. Why? Because you can notice that there is some options. You remember that's what we call the data. I'm going to write that here. Data. Translation is a data. Rotation is a data. Position is another data field. The name, even the name, is actually considered uh, considered as a data. It's a, a string data. And the, so the position contains, you know, the, the degrees of freedom. X, Y, Z plus the four digits for the orientation for the quaternion. And since we are applying a translation, this guy is actually applied at the beginning of the, of the simulation. You see that we apply the translation in Y. So it has been shifted of one in the Y direction. If I remove that and put that back to zero, and then I will reload the scene. As you can notice now, my particle is located in zero zero zero. I get the I get the frame here, the reference frame. I get it by clicking on the A key on the keyboard. Uh, on I know that on macOS it can be also the R key, I think, on the keyboard. So for, to activate and deactivate. For information, all the view options they are here in the viewer widget. You can have a, a, have a look to the all the the view options. It can, it's a, can be very useful. OK, so it, it's here. No, tr no translation, so it's located here, uh, located here. You can also change the position here and make it start in 1, 0, 0. So 1 in x, it will, move, it will be moved here. If I reload the simulation, as you can see, position is shifted in x, positive x. All right. Um, OK, so I think we saw everything here. Yeah, I think we're all set. OK. So as you said, Hadi, no physics. So let's add a bit of physics then. What I'm, what I'm adding here, I'm adding a mass. And I'm adding another stuff, which is actually an, what, what can be considered as a, a, a constant force, external force. We have, we have our system. and it has a mass, and we have even an external force applied to our rigid particle. OK? So this can be globally written, like we have m times the, 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 the system that we are looking at is actually times the acceleration is equal to the force. This is the force, an explicit constant force f, which is as you can notice, only in the x direction, x, y, z. And it has a mass. So uniform mass is here, and constant force field is here. OK? So we now have a full mass times the acceleration is equal to the force. If we open the scene number, uh, it's the scene number two in SOFA. And again, do not run that, please. The one which is called mass and force. What will happen on your opinion? When we will click on animate. And I just replied to your question, uh, uh, Hadi, uh, to your previous question. Uh, uh, indeed, writing in the position field 0, 1, 0, or adding a translation, since the translation is applied only at the beginning, it's the same. OK? It's exactly the same. OK. So indeed, there is a force in the x direction. So if there is a motion, it should be indeed in the x or uh, towards the positive x-axis. 
Yeah, there is no visual mapping, but uh, visualization is not necessar necessarily, as you can notice, um, yeah, if I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share my screen here, uh, entire screen again, as you can notice from uh, my left-hand side screen, uh, I have a particle. But I can already, we have some basic visualization tool. So, I mean, there is, there is no need to add a visual model or whatever. We have, I'm going to hide the, 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 the axis here. We have our rigid frame here in the, in that's those, uh, it's uh, this small frame is actually our rigid particle. And if it moves, this particle will move. This, this, this small particle will move. Uh, uh, it's, it's really, this is, the mechanical model. So there is no, uh, yeah, should we see anything? Yeah. So if I'm correct, you, I've got just one reply. Shantanu say it's going to move. Who else thinks it's going to move? A small, a small piece of clue here. There, there is actually a trick here. I mean, there is something which is missing and that will prevent to compute any new position at, at each time step. What do you think it is? Yeah, great. Very good. Is that okay for everyone? Christian, Jacob, uh, Majid, uh, Jake? So indeed, uh, we have physics, which is defined. Indeed, we have the mass that will allow to say, oh, OK, we, we, have, we can build a mass matrix. The unknown, the unknown that we are looking at, the position, actually here, the rigid position, the rigid frame, are actually contained by the mechanical object. The is equal to forces. We, we do have some external forces, so it will, it should move. But there is actually nobody to solve this whole system and even to assemble this, the whole system, OK? Ah, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, very good point, Majid. It's a very good question. Indeed, the six components that, we, that you can't see anymore, but those who, and as you can notice, there is not seven, like here, one, two, three, and one, two, three, four here. So seven, which is orient, uh, position plus orientation. Here, we have, indeed, forces and torques. Very good point. But in, indeed, to, to get this particle to move, you remember wh who is here that what's uh, who is um, uh, on the top of the simulation just after the, the root node here? You remember there is someone who, that can be called A L. Can you can you recall who it is? Yeah, typing, typing. Yeah, perfect. The animation loop indeed. The animation loop, I mentioned that quickly before. The animation loop, first it checks if, the, if, if there is some co co collision to compute, especially is there in the scene a collision pipeline that will compute the collision. And for the physics, I said the animation loop is going to look for solvers because we need solvers to compute at each time step something. Even if the mass is here, the mass itself, it knows how to compute the mass, but it's, that's it. The force field knows how to compute a force, internal or external force, but that's it. There is no one to get all this information up, build the system, and solve it. Okay? So that's all the, the idea of getting solvers. Indeed, if I share again the, the entire screen here, and I, I look at the simulation, I'm going to hide the, the, the the frame, as you can notice, if I click on animate, nothing moves since there is no solvers. OK? So just for clarification, you know, there is no visual model, but we can still see these uh, small particles just because we activated this option here, show object. It's uh, just a, it's an exception for the mechanical object that we have, oops, sorry, that we have so that we can actually still display a basic information without any visual model. Okay, that was for for your remark, uh, remark, uh, Hadi. So, 
So we need solvers. We need solvers. We will add solvers. There is different kind of solvers and different kind of algorithms available in SOFA. And I'm gonna here here we're gonna use uh, we're gonna use the two kind of solvers that do exist. First, you have something which is called the integration scheme. Integration scheme. Who never heard about an uh, integration scheme? You can put that in in the chat so that uh, so that I know. No shame again. Really, uh, do not hesitate to let. Yeah, I don't know that uh, so that we can get in detail. Okay, so. An integration scheme, there is several methods. So all the field of, I would say, this kind of uh, the, the theory which is behind is again what, what we what we call numerical analysis. It's when you have a system, a matrix matrix system that can be written like A x equal B, and that you are looking at a solution x at each time step. That's what we do. You need to have a, a, a way of saying, okay, I have my solution at the current time step. How I am going to interpolate from what I know and from what, what I where I am right now, how we're going to go in the in, in the actually how we are going to go in the future, how we go forward in time. The method that the method which is explaining how to go forward in time is called an integration scheme. It will explain, okay, you, the value at the next time step will depend on the value at the current time step in this way. And it will explain how it depends on the values on the pre previous time step. So it's you can see that at, as a solver that explains how to go from one time step to the next one. And depending on the method that you're going to use, it will affect highly the stability of your simulation. Okay. We're going to get back in the theoretical part of those solvers this afternoon. And you'll see that, again, it's, it's something which is quite important. So that's the field of numerical analysis is, ver is a very wide and important field to know when, when uh, at least to get a bit curious about when you're making simulation. OK? And what is the second guy, the CG linear solver? The CG linear solver. If you, I'm gonna, I'm going to make that cleaner. If you remove the CG, what remains is linear solver. It's actually the solver that will allow. I just wrote that into the chat. A x equals b is a linear matrix system. We have a matrix A, a vector x of unknown, and that's what we want to discover for the next time step. Is equal to a vector b. What will allow us to find a solution for that? It will be linear solvers. It's a methods. It's, uh, again, there is a different methods for that. That will allow us at each time step to find a solution for x. Find solution x. That's the two kind of, solver, of solvers that we need. Okay. If you really don't know anything about that, do not hesitate first to check a bit uh, the documentation about solvers on the SOFA website. But even more generally, do not hesitate to get a bit a bit more of you know the theory the theory which is behind and what kind of different models do exist, what's the advantage of one compared to the other, and so on. Okay, I'm gonna get a bit in detail again this afternoon. But even later on, do not hesitate to ask on the forum or to even make your own research about that. So now that we have some solvers i'm going to share again the screen and we're going to be able to start the scene number three so here we are scene number three there we are so the three called solvers open solvers we still have the particle which is located in zero 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 and what will happen finally if we click on animate the particle is indeed moving do you have that as well for you can you run the simulation and see the particle moving along the x-axis? Because you you were right. Since the force, oh, I made I made uh, I made someone someone else's presenter or no, no, no I don't know. Yeah, I said I said ah, okay, no, you ah, okay. You, I get I gave you all the right to to draw things. Let me know if you if you need to draw something. I, I can I can give you the the access to that. Sorry. Um, uh, okay. So now the particle is moving along the x-axis. Why? 
because we have the m x equal b actually x is the acceleration mass times the acceleration of our rigid frame uh, is equal to the forces forces we just have one external force in the x direction here and it will make our particle to move along the x axis here it moves this way we can actually test that straight away you can test that this yourself you can try to just change that and say and replacing that by zero one zero 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 and you'll see that instead of moving the x it will move along the y direction you can test it yourself Never forget to, you know, click on uh, file, reload, and run again the scene, and you're going to see that happening. So you can, I'm, I'm going to let you a few seconds to, to test it. Okay. So I'm going to write some stuff here. You remember? So we have the animation loop, which is created at the top here, just below the root node. And this guy is actually looking for a solver, actually uh, here, uh, an integration scheme. And the integration scheme will talk to the, it, it will talk to the, uh, the linear solver, and it will also talk to the physics. Okay. I think it's a, a bit too fat. So animation loop, which is here, talks to this guy. And this guy is connected to the rest of the simulation so that it builds the, the full system AX equal B or MX equal B, uh, equals the force, whatever. And it gives this system to this, hola, to this guy here, to the CG linear solver to find a solution X at each time step. And this is done at each time step, the animation loop is restarting or solve again, solve again, solve again, so that when we are making step, 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 or running the animation, the animation at each time step, we're going to find a new updated value of our degrees of freedom. So what is contained here in the mechanical object will be updated. Our position, you will see, you can run the simulation and open double click on the on the mechanical object I'm, I'm going to do that with you and you'll see that the position are actually evolving among time so if i open again the scene number three here i am i i, I step 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 uh, i'm going to click step here you see that the, the 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 frame rigid frame is moving along the x direction and if i open the node particle I double click on mechanical object and you can notice that my position in x has changed because of the force applied in the x-axis along the x-axis due to the constant force you remember you said we could add also torques let's add a bit of torque in the x direction as well it's gonna it's gonna do exactly the same sorry Hopla, here it's gonna do i'm gonna reload the scene and just you, you, I'm, I'm going to look here along the x-axis and look what is doing the, the particles, the, part, the particle. Can you notice that it, st it starts rotating? Rotating positively along the x-axis. Okay. Okay, any questions so far? Ah, uh, what means, yeah, this 200 by iteration? Does, any, does any, anyone have the answer or a guess? Uh, I, I don't, I don't uh, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, uh, this iteration 200 means you will um, net it wrong 200 times and stop, or that means, for example, 200 millisecond uh, every step. Okay. Yeah, the 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 amount of time at each time at each time step it's this guy. Okay, so when you click, uh, so when you click on uh, on, uh, I'm going to share. So sorry, I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm switching always a bit between uh, between uh, sharing uh, sharing the slides or or, or my, my screen. But um, here, 
you see, I don't know if you can see, it's really at the bottom here of run so far, bottom left, time is equal to 1.84, okay? If I click on step, you see the amount of time when I click once on step is the same as before plus the amount of time. So the amount of time we are going forward is this here, is defined always in the root node. What is 200? 200 is act corresponds actually to, it's a property of this guy. The linear solver, the conjugate gradient linear solver is actually an iterative solver. So it means at each time step, at each time step, it, it's actually looking for the, sol the solution of our system M like that, okay? But it's looking to, us, to the solution of this system iteratively. It's actually what is called an iterative linear solver because it's, it's actually not doing computing the solution in one step, but it will do something like that. Uh, let's, yeah, I should have uh, uh, something like that. M, uh, tac, the acceleration, but it will take a guess Okay, minus f. Instead of instead instead of solving the system that we mentioned before, because we don't here that we don't we don't know yet. Okay, that's what we are looking for. So to find that, what is doing a, an iterative process like this one? It's testing one value. It's testing a value of acceleration. Actually, actually, we are working with velocities in SOFA, but it's equivalent. It's testing a, ve a value of x here, making the multiplication of this value m times x minus f, all that we know, it will give us some, some, something which is called a, a residual. And from that, it will improve and recompute something which will be called x k plus one. And again, and again, and again, and again, and again, at each time step, and here, what we are saying, we are, we, are, we are saying you are allowed to do maximum 200 iterations of this process to find a solution. Okay? So it's really a, pro a property of this algorithm. So the algorithm is called the conjugate gradient descent for finding a solution to a linear problem like this one. Okay, thank you. Okay? Great. Another question is yeah? why I didn't uh, see this coordinate, uh, this, uh, this silver coordinate in my um, program. I just uh, see uh, the object of mine, but not the coordinate. Okay. Well, uh, what do you mean by the coordinates? The, the position or? Uh, ah, no, the, the frame. You mean the reference frame here? Yeah. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, have you tried by pressing the, the A key on the keyboard? 18. The, the A key, you know, press, pressing, pressing the A key. Yeah, exactly. J J Jake, uh, it works for Jake. Uh, maybe, ah, okay. Yeah, it works. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Perfect. Um, there, is a, a, there is some shortcuts again, and all the shortcuts they are detailed in the, as I said before, you know, the viewer widget. You know, the, you have the graph widget, the view widget, the stats widget, and the viewer widget. The viewer widget will give you a lot of shortcuts uh, that are available with the uh, sofa. Okay? Oh, shortcuts for sofa. Like, you can, you can have shortcuts for taking screenshots and for also recording videos from your simulation and so on. All right, uh, may I'll see. Okay, I'm just just gonna see what is the next one. Okay, maybe we, we, we can maybe stop there for having a, a lunch break. Um, again, uh, maybe it's a, a good time also for before going to, 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 to lunch, uh, giving all the questions, all the, yeah, sending all the questions you'd like. 
I'll stay actually here, connected. So uh, I, I brought a sandwich for, for today. So do not hesitate to continue asking the questions. When when would be at the earliest? When, when would that be possible for you to restart? We can restart in 40 minutes. We can restart in, uh, in an hour, if you prefer to take a bit more time. So I would suggest either two hours, e either with restart at uh, so 1 a.m. CT or 1.30 CT. Oh, fuck, I'm sorry. I did that right up to the end, p.m. CT. OK, 1.15, OK, 1.15, 1.15, let's say that, OK. 115 would be fine, uh, Chang Ni as well, or? Okay. Okay, so I, I see that uh, Jake and Chang Ni uh, need, need a bit more time, so let's Let's. Uh, I'll be there. We can restart at one fifteen with questions answered, and, so and if uh, if uh, Jake and Cheng, you are not, you're not connected, we 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 could wait and and see other stuff while when you're not here. And anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna repeat things. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Great. I'm gonna stay connected. I'm gonna deactivate just the camera because uh, otherwise you're you're gonna have the. the 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 pleasure to see me eat it's not going to be uh, marvelous so just i'm going to shut down the camera turn off the camera sorry but uh otherwise i'm i'm still here so do not hesitate to write things in the in the in the chat play again with uh, with sofa do not test please do not test the 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 next uh, slides so that we can uh, we can see that together again and this afternoon we're going to see the end of the tutorial the math which is behind and hopefully, I, I hope we're going to have also time for 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 looking at the a bit at the dev implementation. You know how how does a plugin look like and how to to prepare and implement things. Okay. Uh, let me know if you have if there is things to, you would like to absolutely address or or anything. No, do not hesitate. Okay. So see you around, and I'm going to take already the I'm going to take the few questions here. No worries, it's recorded, so you're going to anyway benefit from from what uh, what's going to be said so ha have a good lunch uh Hadi, can we have a running sofa from ah uh yeah it's a it's a good point so a uh, uh, stable one no uh there is still especially on windows and some some instabilities uh, for sofa Python three for linux it works pretty okay but for for windows it's still a bit unstable that's what we are currently working on and making sure that the packaging for the next release is more more stable. Re we really hope to have everything uh, uh, up and running for end of December, so that people can, in January, can start with a fresh, clean sofa up to date release plus sofa Python three, so that you do not have to compile anything, and you can just use that and make your own scripts and and so on from 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 that. So yes, you can already from today. Just it's going to be it's, it might be a, a bit complicated to compile sometimes or but for compilation issues on, on Sofa Python three there is also developers available for that so there is even a, a chat dedicated to to, to Sofa Python three. <laughs> okay okay yeah there is more and more people uh, doing that uh, yeah the, the only sometimes problem that you can face with the WSL is that you can have some visualization issues you know with Qt or stuff like that but otherwise. It's fine. Well, actually, one of the research lead here, research director, started to to move to WSL, so I guess there will be more and more support for that. Mm. I take Cheng Ni question here. Why there is always a message? Scene radius must be positive. Uh, I don't know what is, what. what uh, 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 do I have that or it's it's on your side? I, I guess Cheng Ni. Yes, that is in the controller. In the controller. Yeah, in um, the console, your scene radius must be positive. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, what what version of Sofa do you do you 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 downloaded the the release version of Sofa or? Uh, that is. Uh, let's check. Uh, that is the twenty zero six. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Okay. And did you compile it yourself or? Um... Yeah, but compile by myself. Okay, okay. 
Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna check that. It's it's not a big issue. I just to ask if you know. Okay, no, no, uh, no, I don't. I I, I think uh, it's due to the fact. Um, it's it's for visualization. Usually, Sofa likes to know in the for the view what should be the size of the visual environment that we are going to have in the simulation. So there is also something that we call sometimes B box in the nodes here. Oh, sorry, in the in, in the nodes here, or 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 in this one, you can actually specify something which is called B box is equal to, and it's a six reels and it, it, it corresponds to the x y z mean of the box for visualization and, and the x y z max and that's actually give you some kind of uh that's a, some kind of 3d bounding box yeah for, for the visualization exactly like it's a my dirty box but here you would have your object inside the in, inside this box okay and you can specify yourself this b box huh? And it, I guess it happens in this case because we have only one single particle, so it cannot really find something volumetric to compute uh, the B-box properly. Okay. So I believe it's, it's related to that. Another question by this, uh, you, you mean that DT, uh, same as 0 0.01 is the time. Yeah. Uh, that means which kind of time um, is it? Is it, that means, every second you move one person or, or what is the meaning exactly? yeah so that i'm going to answer this question later later on uh because it's a it's a it's a very important question Let, could you ask me again this question i would say i would say yeah when 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 we're gonna when we when we, when we are gonna, going to start um looking at uh, at volume, uh, a volumetric mesh. Okay, we're gonna here. We are just with one particle moving. I'm go, I'm gonna explain everything which is related. To, your question is actually related to the units. What are the units? What is the, the unit? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm gonna answer that right after. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And Majid, will you speak about how to import more complicated geometries? Yes, it's actually just the next uh, the next slide. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do that. Okay, if there is no other questions, I mean, you can still feel, feel, feel the, the, the question, the public chat, and otherwise, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mute myself, turn off the camera, but I'm still here, so do not hesitate to post and enjoy your lunch. See you guys.
So, sorry for the short delay. I'm just uh, preparing some some uh, some email lesson for for tomorrow. I should be there in uh, at 20, 20, 25, So in in two two three minutes. Okay. Yeah. No worries. Cool. Thanks. Sorry, guys.
sorry. So I was uh, trying to to let uh, everybody knows on Twitter, LinkedIn, and so on about tomorrow. So I had to put, <laughs> to put uh, everybody in copy, uh, starting from uh, from uh, from Stanford to Korea to so all the all the different partners. So it took a bit of time. It's done. All right. Uh, I heard that there was um, there was some questions. Yeah. Magic's comment, it would be nice to know about topology container. So, okay, okay, perfect. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, show, we're gonna see topological containers right now, actually, when we, we were with a single particle. And now, now all the idea is actually to, oops, sorry, you can't see my face here. Yeah. Okay. Um, is, is now, to, we're gonna extend from one particles to several particles, and even afterwards to a mesh, not only to particles. So by doing that, we're, we're going to directly have to manipulate those containers, those topology containers, and see how they how they are working together. So yeah, definitely this uh, this would be addressed right now. So is everybody here? Um, is a, uh, yeah? C can you just put me a small yes if you're ready to ready to go? I remember I think it was Jake, Jake and Cheng uh, that were maybe at thirty, not so sure to be here. Perfect. So one, two, three. Four, five, two are missing. I think Hadi and 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 and. Uh, thank you, <laughs> Christian. The <laughs> Moscow eye. You are. You see everything before I do. Perfect. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, let's give them uh, just the one minute. Uh, left for for joining to to 130 i'm gonna grab the again the cup of coffee that i remade and and bring it back here okay <clears throat> perfect um so we can restart even if uh, could you please how we can get the recorded lecture i i'm gonna send that directly to you uh, Majid. you know after after the presentation how it works usually is uh i'm asking first some feedback to know what you think about it and and what what you would have expected or what was good or not good or whatever i'm going to send also some um, uh, the slides all the slides of the presentations uh, the different parts of the presentation um, i'm go and in the meantime i'm going to i'm going to also join to that and this is the first time we're, we're, we're going to i'm going to do that because it's actually the first time we're doing doing this kind of Fully online, especially through this system here, uh, Big Blue Meeting, uh, the, the 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 course, the online course. So I'm going to send as well uh, as a, a link. I think where to download uh, the all the video, uh, the recorded lecture. Okay, great. You're welcome. Um, so let's go ahead and get back to the presentation. All right, I'm going to share again the, the good presentation. We were at the third part, so here. And there we were. Uh, we were actually just on this slide here, the previous one. Uh, while, while waiting for the other, we're going to have a look to this, uh, to this specific case. Um, you remember, we had this system the mass matrix times the acceleration is equal to the force the force is coming from the constant force field the mass comes from the uniform mass and this is this will be solved by this guy here by the linear solver uh, the fact is when you have what is called so here we are in the case where on the right hand side of of uh, our equation again if if we simplify that by writing that this way uh, we have uh, the constant force field, which is adding forces in the B vector here. Constant force we, means that F from X is actually just a constant, right? It does not actually depend on X. 
it is what we call a fully explicit force. It will only play a role here. And therefore, I mean, there is, di there is different, you know, integration scheme. Uh, as, I, as I said earlier, here in this case, we are using the Eulea implicit solver. And the fact, the fact that we have a, a constant force here, it means that the B vector will always remain constant. And A, the mass matrix, remains always constant. So actually, the, what we have here is a quite simple case where A is a, is, the, is a mass matrix where we have actually only value using this kind of mass here, the diagonal, uh, the uniform mass. We have only a very simple matrix for the mass, which is just a diagonal matrix with with zero outside. X is equal to B, and B is constant as well. So here, the solution can be even more straightforward. You can we can actually use what is called an explicit scheme, and with no linear solver. And we're going to see that in the just in the next part because you'll see that when we build the system, we have a way to directly find a solution in an explicit manner. So that's that's what we uh, what I wanted to, to show by those two slides here. Obviously, we can, sorry, obviously we can use implicit schemes, but in such simple scenario where, where we have just a mass and just a constant force, it, it becomes that simple that all that we need is an explicit scheme where x can actually return like the force, a force vector, over a mass, ve a mass vector, because the mass here is just a, a diagonal matrix, so it can be written as a vector. So here, in that case, just an explicit solver can be, can be used. But again, usually, we always need an integration scheme and a linear solver, OK? Uh, OK, how can define forces, location, and so on? Now, so time dependent. As you know, XML is some, something static. So you cannot define when the force will occur and so on, or really not this way. Or, but that's really more using Python. This will be achievable. OK? All, everything that comes with, I want to do something depending on the time, or then it will be easier to script that using Python than XML. About how to define forces, their values, their locations, and so on, this can be done in any way with SOFA, and I will show you. We're, we're going to play with those uh, with those scenes together to show a bit how it works, how we can actually change the force, change the location, change the intensity of the force, and so on and so forth. OK? Well, um, so are, uh, are Hadi and Cheng uh, back, uh, back on the game? Hadi, Cheng, are you back? Hadi, yeah, perfect. Thanks. Thanks for letting me know. And what about Cheng? Hmm. OK, sorry, Hadi. OK, OK, Cheng is not here yet. Uh, uh, I'm going to write that in the Cheng. Let us know whenever you get back. All right. OK, so we said we had a, we had a, a, a here the, the, the previous simulation where we were uh, was actually the case. I mean, was, was the case where what, do, what did we succeed to do? We succeeded to have one particle moving along the x axis. So it's uh, nothing fancy here, but it was our particle here located in 0, 0, 0, and it was moving along the x-axis, right? Usually, that's not exactly what we are interested in. What we are interested in is modeling a, a full object, a full deformable object. When you're looking at a, a rigid object, one single rigid particle is maybe enough, right? Because if it's rigid, it means there is no deformation. All you need for a rigid motion is one the one particle, maybe the center of mass, and getting the motion of the center of mass. This would be sufficient. But now we will go slowly, step by step, toward a volumetric, so a full mesh, a 3D information for a deformable object. But let's do that step by step. 
we will first in the first uh, in the first step we will remain with a rigid object but instead of simulating one particle we will simulate just like there was a lot of particles okay and what we will do is <clears throat> we will apply the same force as before but instead of applying that on one particle we will apply that on several particles okay so let's have let's have a look what do we need to get to apply that on several particles i'm going to share again my screen and there is actually two ways of doing that one that will be super boring i'm, I'm going to i'm still using the scene number three solvers let's say that i'm going to reload here the scene so i have one particle as you can see but i'm going to add a second particle here in the field in the data field position I'm going to add, for instance, another particle that will be located in, I, I will shift this one in Z. So it will be 0, 0, 001 and the same orientation. Okay. I'm going to reload, so I saved the file. I'm going to reload in SOFA. As you can see, we have now two particles instead of one. So those two particles, I'm going to animate, but as you can notice, so I have one mechanical object containing my degrees of freedom, the degrees of freedom of my two particles, and the total mass of the particles is equal to one, and the total force applied to the particles is equal to, is equal to one uh, uh, for the force in X and one for the torque in X as well. What do you think will be the total the mass at each particle now that we have two particles? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly, because what, what is the what, what is doing this component here, the uniform mass? It's saying I have a total mass. And what does the uniform mass compute? We're gonna we're gonna see that again for in the next uh, in, in the next part of the slides. But this guy here, uniform mass, is computing a mass matrix that looks like that here. M is the mass zero 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 zero. M on the diagonal, M on the diagonal, and so on and so forth. For the number of particles there is, and the total mass corresponds to the sum of the all the mass, but the, the value on the diagonal of this mat mass matrix is always the same using the uniform mass. That's what computes the uniform mass. A uniform value on the diagonal and only a diagonal matrix. So if I have two particles, I will have one times here, the mass one times here, and the total is equal to one. So we have indeed M here in that case, which is equal to 0 0.5. All right. So indeed, that's what we that what we have, and we can even check that directly in SOFA if you'd like. If we if we have a look here, I will open here the uniform mass, and what you can notice if you click on the let me find the right here yeah here on the vertex mass, so on the mass saved at each vertex 0 0.5. Okay, so indeed each mass here is 0 0.5 0 0.5, but in the same way. We have a force of 0 0.5 because it's a total force. So the same force is spread over the two particles. So in fact, we're going to have exactly the same acceleration as before. Do you agree? Because we have half the mass, but we have also half the force. So basically, m times x, the acceleration is equal to the force. If f and m on each side are actually divided by two, we have the same acceleration that will result from that. So now if I animate that, we have the two particles moving. So that's a way of adding more and more particles, more and more points. I can here add new inputs in my degrees of freedom, in the container for the degrees of freedom, namely the me mechanical object, I can add and add new lines in this field position, and it will create new particles. But as you can guess, it will become very quickly super cumbersome because it means 
you need to add a, a particle, a particle, a particle. And on top of that, here we just have one single particle. There is no connection. It's not an edge. It's not a triangle. It's just one additional degree of freedom. So what do we use usually to have a full geometry loaded in SOFA? We use what is called mesh loaders. Those mesh, lo mesh loaders will allow us to load a number of particles, a, a, a number of, of vertices, but also a number of edges that connects those vertices, maybe a number of triangles or of quads that are made of edges and points, maybe tetra or, or hexahedra that will be made respectively of triangles, edges and points or on quads, edges and points. So we need for that loaders. And as I said earlier, we have different kind of format that can be used. Here in that case, it's MSA, MSH that comes from the, it's a software called GMSH, for, which is a mesher, a tool for creating meshes. It's also, you, you, can, be, you can use actually that as well um, through Python. Uh, it's connected, uh, it can be used through a Python environment as well, uh, GMesh. And this way, you can, we can load surface meshes, volumetric meshes, anything that you'd like, okay? So, I, I did not forget your, it was already your point, right, Shantanu? You asked that before, I think, before the, before the, the presentation, before the break. I'm gonna get back to the question of units uh, and so on. It's a very good and important point. But I'd like to first achieve, I mean, arrive at a, uh, a case where we have a, a deformable model and so on. So we have a mesh loader here in the scene that we're going to add. This mesh loader is a component that will that will add the at the initialization of the of the simulation. So really at the init phase, it will load all the information, all the topology, all the geometrical information contained in the mesh located in mesh slash lever.msh. Okay, this guy saves, it's a, a bit like the mechanical object, but for the topology, it's a container of topology. But this guy is completely passive and is just loading once at the beginning the topology information. And more importantly, it's making this topological information available to anyone in the simulation, in the graph below, okay? So the loader loads the topology and makes it available. What else? So you know, you notice that I changed the name of the, of the node, but it's just a detail. And otherwise, we still have the same solvers as before, the same mass, uniform mass and constant force field, right? The same, and we have still the mechanical object, but instead of providing here a, a data field where a data field where we say where we are actually saying position is equal to the, the, uh, one, one zero 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 one and like that here instead of writing that you, you can notice that nothing is written here why because the mechanical, uh, the mechanical object will use this, the information of this guy. As you can notice, it's called a topology container. In fact, a point topology container. And this guy is what we call linked to the loader. What does it mean? It means that, again, this guy, at the, in the, the mesh loader, at the initialization, it will load topological information. For your information, this, I, know, I know that this mesh contains points, edges, vertices, uh, so edges, triangles, and tetraedra. Okay? But this guy is just a point container. It does not contain anything else than points. And we are saying, I want you to use as a source this guy, we are making a link using the at here, at dot dot, so it's one node above, at dot dot slash mesh loader course. Mesh loader course is actually this name here. So it means this is a way to connect the two components in the graph. 
and we are saying to the container, topology container, recover all the topology information that has been loaded by this guy and make it available to the, mesh, to the mechanical object. That's what happens here. That's why we do not need to specify anything here to the mechanical object, because this guy will get all the points loaded by the mesh loader through the point set topology container. OK? By doing that, and that's the scene number four, if we open the scene number four, but do not run it for the moment. What do we have here? We're going to see that. We're going to see in the scene number four, we have our mesh loader up. I always like to put that really up in the in the hierarchy of the simulation, just below the root node. I, I do always like to make the, the loaders here so that they are loaded at the beginning and everybody and it's visible from everybody in the graph. And uh, and this guy, we can double click here on the loader and you can find in the vector widgets, you can find all the information, all the topology information that, is, that has been loaded. You can notice that there have been positions, so points loaded, edges, triangles, and even tetraedra. But again, the mesh loader is doing nothing. It's, it's a passive component. It's just loading at the initialization. What else? I said that before, we added this point set topology container and we, we said, I want you to be linked using this at here, at one node above, dot dot slash mean one node above, slash mesh loader, which is the name of the mesh G mesh loader. And by the, I, I, I heard there was a question that I'm going to get, uh, get back to the, to the, to the chat so to, to see the question, but here we have all the topology information, all the topologies contained here and made available for the simulation, especially for the mechanical object. And if the physics here needs it, it's also available because the container makes it available in the node here, in the sub node lever. If we double click on the point set topology container, as you notice, since we made a link between the topology container and the loader, we are able, the simulation at the beginning, at the initialization, was able to recover the 181 points contained in the mesh loader. And here, you see? That's how it works. So that's, that is for points for the moment. OK? I'm going to have a look to, to your questions. Sorry, guys. Um, The point set topology container indeed contains the points, the nodes of the mesh. Exactly. So the number of points and their position, indeed. So here, as you, uh, so if you open the simulation as uh, the scene number four, as I did, you can notice that uh, like here, yeah, you can notice that you have now the hundred eighty-one points loaded. And you remember, we still have the same total mass and the same total force. So do you think the acceleration will be the, will be the, the same or not for all the, the, the points here compared to before? What's your opinion? That's the, basically the question. Is that going to be faster, same acceleration or slower now, now that we are lo loading a lot of points here. Basically, the this guy here, the mechanical object, now contains not only one particle but 181 particle. But we keep the same total force and the same and the same total force. Sorry, and the same total mass. So, in fact, they are not rigidly linked, Jacob, here. We are loading rigid particles, but nothing ma is making them linked, right? It's just we are loading points, and they will all behave like single rigid particles. There is nothing in the system matrix that, are, that is actually linking them right now.
Yeah, no problem, no problem. Never, never apologize. It's uh, perfect. Uh, so we have still the same total mass. So it means that for each particle, we will just have going to have the total mass m here divided by n, and the total force divided by n, which means that x, the acceleration, actually, actually x dot dot here, is actually the same as before. All right. That, that is going to be exactly the same acceleration. We can actually check that here. If we start at, at, to animate the simulation and we look, open the mechanical object, and we look at the, for instance, velocity field or position field, we will be able to notice. Uh, yeah, I, I forgot to. Uh, yeah. Uh, especially if we look at the velocity field here, we can notice that the velocity is equal to the time here. So it means, why? Because m, uh, so I'm sorry, I'm not sharing my, sorry, uh, let me know when I'm not sharing my, my screen. Sometimes I, I forget to, to, to share again the screen, uh, entire screen, sorry about that. So here we have a velocity, as you can notice, here it's the velocity, the, the velocity of all the points here. And you can see that for all points, we have a velocity of 1.7 in the x direction. Why? Because we have, mass is equal to 1, force is equal to 1, so x, the acceleration, is equal to 1, which means that the, the velocity will be proportional, exa actually exactly equals to the time. And that's what we notice here, just like it was the case before. Velocity is equal to 1.7 times is 1.7. Okay, so we have the same acceleration as before, but this time you see that all the particles are moving together still along the x-axis. Why? Because we, we keep the same constant force in the x-axis. All right. Let me know if anything is unclear, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go to the next, uh, to the next step. Now we are able to load a mesh. Here we just loaded points, but we could actually load points, edges, triangles, basically all the topology with, that we need for the for the simulation, it's a, if it's a volumetric object, we will need to use tetra or hexa themselves, including triangles or quads and so on and so forth. And again, this is topology container. The, what is written here actually, topology container container that we that we will always use to save the topology. But as you noticed, still it was just rigid particles for the moment. So the last step is to say, okay. Let's get over. Let's get over this case of rigid body. In case here, it was actually rigid bodies because it was 181 rigid frames. Now let's load a mesh that will be used for a deformable, a deformable object, a deformable model. How does it look like? Exactly as before. We use a loader the same loader as before. This guy is actually containing, as we said before, it's containing points, it's containing edges, it's containing, I can tell you that it's containing, and we saw actually that together, it was containing also triangles and tetraedra. So this guy contains everything but does nothing with it. Again, it's completely passive. But as you can notice here, I try to, to underline properly, this now, tetrahedron set topology container, a topology co a container that contains the topology associated to tetra, is linked. We have a link here. Is linked to the loader. Since it's linked to the loader, this guy will save and make available to anyone in the subnode lever the topology information. Okay. For your information, the set geometry algorithm is just a class that includes algorithms to compute the volume of it, uh, the volume of a, a tetra, the surface of a triangle. It's some kind of some kind of a small toolkit to compute geometrical stuff. This might disappear from the scene quite soon because it's actually it's it will be directly linked and uh, in the by, by the container. Okay, but just so that you know why we are actually writing that here. It's because to, to compute that kind of geometrical information, volumes, surfaces, and so on. So we have here now the 
topology is now contained by this guy here. This guy, the topology container, will let the mechanical object know about the number of points and especially about the kind of uh, yeah the number of points, how many vertices there is in the mesh. And here you remember what is template? Can you just can you can you remind me what is the template? It explains it explains what for the mechanical object. Oh, Shantanu is uh, is uh, on fire. Is uh, in the second uh, uh, in a few seconds ready to reply. Yeah, Jake, perfect. Jacob, okay, very good. Yeah, yeah, it's J Jacob. You're, uh, that's right. Indeed, it contains the degrees of freedom. What we are willing to simulate? Are we willing to simulate? 3D rigid bodies, as we had before, the rigid 3D. Do we want to model, so it was XYZ plus a, uh, an orientation? Do we want to model uh, 3D information? So at each point of the mesh, we want to have a XYZ information for a deformable body. So it will be VEC 3D. That's what we have here. Maybe we, it's a, we are looking for just modeling a temperature. In that case, it will be VEC 3D. 1D, because we have only the temperature at each node. So yeah, that's the way it works. So this indeed means what kind of degrees of freedom we are working with. No, no, that's uh, no apologies. As I, as I said, no need to apologize. And at each node, we'll have those three degrees of freedom unknown. So we will have, if we have n points, we'll have n times 3 a vector of size n, which contains itself a vector for each point, a vector of three unknown. That's why we call that a VEC 3D. Okay. And what else? I still We still have a mass. As you can notice, it's a different mass. I will explain la uh, later on what it means. What you need to know is that it's, in fact, not anymore a diagonal mass but it's a sparse mass matrix. So this is not true anymore. We have a full sparse mat mass matrix here. And we still have a constant force field applied in which direction? In the x direction, x, y, z. Since we do not have, you know, we are not anymore with the rigid bodies, there is no angular velocities anymore. We are just talking about acceleration along x, or velocity along x, velocity uh, along y and z. And we are applying a force along x, y, or z. In that case, still only a force along x. OK? So we define the mass density. It's not any, we could have defined also total mass. It, can, it works as well for the mesh matrix, mass matrix. Total mass, total force, and there is one last guy that we did not talk about. It's this guy here. Do you have an idea what it is? Does, do, uh, does any one of you have an idea of what is this tetrahedron FM force field? It's, it's not uh, intuitive. Exactly, yeah. OK. I, 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 I see when you are actually typing. That's why sometimes I'm waiting, because I see you typing. And I, I guess they will be replied. And uh, so yeah, forgot to mention that earlier. So indeed, it's actually the full, ex the full explain explanation is that it's a, an elastic constitutive model, it means we are going to consider that the, the, the object that we are looking at will behave as an elastic model, as an elastic object. And how to compute this elasticity law, elasticity mechanical law? It will be used, it will be computed so over tetra, it means the, the support of integration will be tetraedra using the finite element method. That's what it means. So that's why it's another name in so far that I do not really like because it's not really clear. But this guy is actually defining the elasticity of our object 
computed over the tetrahedron using the finite element method. So what do we have with that? We can, we can actually have a look to the scene number five. I'm, I'm, I'm going to share my screen again. So that's, uh, can you see, yeah, perfect, you can see my screen. So, so that's the scene number five for elasticity. I'm going to load it here in Sofa as well, open five. Okay, that's what we, what we have now. And as you can notice, so in the view, we are active, we, we are asking for, sorry, in the view options, we are asking for viewing the force field. It means show me the support, the elements on which the physics is actually computed. It's not a, it's, it's a very basic visualization, but just made for understanding where is done the computation of the physics. As you can notice, the physics here is done over tetrahedra. We have a loader loading the, a mesh. This mesh is this guy, mesh lever.msh. All the topology information is saved and contained in the tetrahedron set topology container with the 181 points, but not only. Now we have also we are also loading the edges, the triangles, and the tetrahedra. Why? Because the tetrahedra will all be used to compute the mass and also the elasticity using the finite element method. So this is how it works. We have the loader, the container, topology container, the mechanical object for which means this guy will actually save you know for each node for each vertex it will compute the position it will save sorry it will save the position and the velocity so if we start to animate as you can notice the object still due to the constant force along the x axis will move and you see the velocities are changing the position are changing as well okay and now we achieved by doing that, as you can notice, just in less than yeah, basically 20 lines, we defined um, one object with its mechanical properties, with a mass, with an elasticity, even with, so elasticity can be considered as what we call internal forces. Co the constant force field can be considered as an external force. And all those forces will induce a motion, okay? Okay, is there a question so far? Indeed, but there is no orientation here because we are only talking about points. So now the mechanical object will only contain X, Y, Z information, each vertex, but it's only a vertex. It's not anymore a frame. It's, it's just a point in space that we are looking at. That's why we just have a X, Y, and Z information. I would say, you know, the all the... I would say the rotation, the inertia, and so on, that will be actually computed over the whole domain. And that's why each point moves following this elasticity model and also under the constant force and the mass. But we don't have any orientation because it's not a frame, it's not a rigid body anymore. So we just have the position x, y, z in space. All right. Okay, so now, finally, we come to your point, Shantanu. On your point of view, guys, what do you think is the unit of, for instance, just to, I take this one for instance, but I'm going to ask for other for the other data as well just after. What, is, what are the units of the mass density here? Okay, for Jacob, it's going to be SI units, so international international system units. Yeah, for the mass density, what do you think? What make you think, guys, that the mass density it will be? 
So mass density means it's a mass divided by a volume, right? So in the, the, the answer of Jacob, Jacob, your, your answer would mean that if we use the, the, uh, the system, uh, international system unit, it would be kilogram per cubic meters. But what makes you think, guys, that we are actually in meters? Or ma what makes you think that we are using kilograms? Or, yeah, very good, Majid. Yeah, nothing gives actually this information for the moment, right? So the good answer, which is a bit weird, is it depends. But why it depends? SOFA does not have any unit by default. Why? The reason is located here. Because SOFA has no way to know what will be the unit of your mesh, right? Maybe you're going to load you know, an object uh, like the one we have here in the, in the simulation number five. It's a lever, right? It's a lever geometry. But, you know, maybe it's going to be, you, it's going to be, the all values will be between zero and 100, uh, 150, which means for a lever, it would, it would mean that maybe we are in millimeters. Or maybe the values in the in the file here will go from zero to one uh, to zero dot one five, so it means we are in meters. So this depends on what you, as a user, give as input. Okay, if you give a mesh which is in meter in meters or in inches, or you are the only one to know, and that's always what I what I like to say. Pay attention, pay attention, guys, to what you give to the simulation. If your mesh, if your robotic arm, for instance, is in meter, then it means you can actually give all the, the other data, physical data in the simulation, like the Young modulus or the mass density and so on, accordingly. It has to be, the keyword is it has to be homogeneous. Okay? If you give a mesh which is in meters here, you have to use, so for Young modulus, you have to use Pascal. For the mass density, for the, for, you have to, to use something, maybe you, you want to use kilogram or whatever. Again, it's up to you, but it has to be per cubic meter because you are giving meters as input. Okay? So the, the good answer here is always it depends on what you give and once you have you are giving some inputs to the simulation with a specified unit, like you know your mesh is in meters, you have to remain in meters. Okay? In the same way, you are the one to choose if the time step will be seconds or milliseconds or whatever, but if you are using here milliseconds. Let's say that we're, we are considering that the time step here is 0 0.01 milliseconds. What do you think will change? Do you know other physical data or other physical parameters that depends on the time? Yeah, velocity. And what, what kind of velocity, or I would even go for, yeah, exactly. What kind of acceleration are we giving here? Here we are providing one acceleration to the simulation. Ah, la, la, very good. It goes very fast, it goes very fast. Uh, I see you guys all typing, so yeah, indeed. Here is the gravity acceleration we are giving. So if it's not seconds that we are giving here, and we are using milliseconds, make sure to use milliseconds here as well. Otherwise, it, it will not be homogeneous, and you might, I mean, it will just be a, a non-Korean simulation, and you, you're going you're gonna to end up with a false results. Okay? So, conclusion of that, always paying attention to units, and I would advise to stick to, indeed, international, international system units, because that's a good way to remain understood from others and also to avoid mistakes, okay? So I, I hope it clarifies the question that you had before, uh, Chantal.
Next step. So next step, guys. <laughs> You're welcome. So the we, we have now uh, we, we achieved. So I'm gonna again share, share the screen, but we, we achieved this simulation, right? W were you able to re to reproduce that as well on your on your machine? Here with this scene number five. If I reload it here, if I reload the scene and I animate it, we were able to have a lever that is a 3D geometry of lever, which is a deformable lever going into the X direction, right? I'm going to reload that again. I can actually prove you that it was def uh, that is completely deformable. If I take the mouse here, you can see that it's really deformable. Okay, it was just a, just to show that there is a real deformable model behind. All right, I'd like to I'd like to you know that that we that we achieve something more. Now we have uh, up to now what we have is actually one one representation. You remember what I said in the in the other slide before? I said in the it was in the part number one here. I'm going to try to find that again. Uh, da, 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 da. It was again a, a bit before. Yeah. In the mappings here, you remember? We are in SOFA. We can have, we can have different, dif different representation. A mesh for the collision, a mesh for the visualization, a mesh for the deformation. As much as, I mean, we can have really different meshes. And that's what we said. It was. We needed those mappings to keep the coherency. For the moment, what do we have in the simulation? We have only a deformable model, right? That's all that we have. And what I would like to add now is we would like to add a visual model. So let's have a look to this visual model. I saw that there was a, a no, it's not part four, part three. OK, let's go back to here. Let's add a visual model. Yeah, for the moment, I did not indeed define a visual model. Yeah, yet we could visualize something. It's actually, it's, it's, in so far, in so far we, do, we do not call that a visual model because it's a, it's a, it, it is actually just, a, I would say, some kind of scientific view to check on what, ca on, on what kind of topology we, and on what kind of model we are computing the physics. So we still can see something, but there is no way, for instance, on the on, on, on the you know on the tetrahedral blue mesh that we had before, on this mesh here, on the, on this mesh that I have on my left screen here, there is no way to add a texture or to to make some lighting and to make a nice visualization. Okay, it's it's a very basic visualization that we use, but only for here a, a physical model. That's not what I we, what we call a visual model because a visual model it's uh, a model that will really be used for visualization with colors that you can put on it, lights, textures, and so on. Okay. So let's add such uh, you know colored surface that we will use as a visual model. Is is that is is that clear uh, the the difference, uh, Chantanou? Because you're right. It's 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 a bit confusing to say yeah, but we are we are having a mechanical model in that case, but a physical model, but yet we can see something. But it's just some kind of scientific vis visualization that Sofa proposes. It's not really what we call a visual model in in, in which we can have a nice textures and a nice textures with uh, lights, lightnings, and that kind of properties. Okay, okay, is is that clear now? Let me know if it's not the case. OK, cool, cool, cool. So to add a visual model, how does it work? Actually, a visual model, it's something that has to be displayed to be visualized, right? The, the one we are mostly using in SOFA is the one which is called OGL model, which is based on OpenGL, but there is other ways of, of, uh, of displaying things. But let's use this OGL model, OK? So this guy, it's more or less the equivalent to the mechanical object, but for the visual model. So here we have the visual model, and here we have the physical model, right? So the, for the mechanical object is here, and 
this guy, this guy is for the visual model. How, the, how does this OGL model work? So this guy, you give to the visual model a topology, like triangles and so on, and it will display those triangles. You can even provide some textures and so on. But anyway, it's, it will display a, a, what, a, yeah, like a surface mesh, for instance. We usually display only surface meshes. As you can notice, just like for the physical object, so uh, just like this is the physical object and this is the visual representation. So physical representation and visual representation. Just like before, we are connecting this guy to the loader. OK? So it, it will recover point, edges, triangle information, and it will display them. In fact, you remember, I think it was Christian, uh, this guy, this time, it will display all the triangle, even the one inside, OK? It's a bit dumb, because actually, we won't see the triangle inside. But it, it will go through a, a whole loop of triangles, including the triangles inside the volume. Why? Because this guy here, it's a volumetric mesh. So it will display, display all the triangles contained in the mesh. We got it. Cool. Let's have a look to what it gives uh, in, term, in terms of simulation. So we'll open the scene number six here, visual model. And we will, you, can, you can all animate this scene here. Do you have an idea to explain what, what, what's happening? First, let me, let me know what's happening. And, and do you have an explanation? I'll get back to your point, Chantal, about, uh, about the ordering. So I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen so that you can see that as well. But what what we have here in the scene number uh, six, adding this visual model, as you can notice, we have now some kind of gray surface. This is what displays when you don't put a texture and so on. That was what displays the OGL model. You can actually even define a color and say, okay, I want to have uh, a, a white a white uh, a white rendering here and reload. And as you can notice, now we have a, a white instead of gray surface. There is some shadow issues here just due to the orientation of the of the triangles, but whatever. I'm going to animate. What do you see here? You see that, that as before, the physical representation here, the, the model of, of the lever moves, right? It moves due to the constant force in the x direction. But what do you see for the OGL model? The OGL model is not moving. Do you have any explanation for that? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, 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 perfect. So the way we like to do things, when, in so far, when we have like here, we have the mechanical model, when we create a visual representation, and it will be the same for the collision. If you want to use a different mesh for the collision, what we will create is that we will create here a sub node for the node lever that will contain the visual model. How does it look like? It looks like that here. We still have the same mesh, uh, the same file as before, the same physical properties. We are, defi we are defining the physical representation here with the solvers, with the topology container, and the physics. But below, what do we do? We create a new subnode. So it's a subnode inside the node lever. So root node. Then inside the root node, we have one subnode because we have one object, the lever. And inside this object, the, the lever, we, we say, oh, yeah, but we would like to create a sub-representation the visual model. Why do we say sub-representation? Because it's actually the physics, which is, as the arrow is actually showing, driving the visual representation. So by doing that, at each time step, the mapping, which is here, will update the information of the OGM model according to what happens in the physics. So when 
the, the lever here is deforming or moving, it will deform and move the surface mesh accordingly, or I mean the, the visualization mesh here accordingly. Okay? And how it is written? First, we have a subnode. We still have the same OGL name, visual model, and so on, with a link, with a link towards what towards, towards still the same loader. But as you can notice, we are level one, level two. So we are two we are two nodes below. So we need to do at dot 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 slash the name of the loader, which is here. This way, this guy is connected to the loader, so it has all the topology information. And the mapping, which is just below, will make sure the connection between the mechanical model and the visual model. We have some kind of a master and a slave that follows what does the master through the mapping. Okay? To, to answer the question of Shantanu that was saying, oh, you wrote somewhere that ordering was important, is it's actually because it's especially regarding this guy, especially regarding this guy here, the container, the topology container. And the solvers. Solvers, we usually put them really at the top of the subnode because so that it can it can really see everything which is below. And the same for the container, it comes often just after the solvers, so that it contains all the topology and makes it available for all the, the other components below. Okay? That's the reason why. Otherwise, then here, the, the ordering of the physics does not really matter. It's uh, just, uh, just that. All right. Now, so uh, if you uh, before going further here, just if we run, we have a scene corresponding to this test case here. It's the scene number seven, and it has a specific name. I need to remember myself. It's the scene number seven. Dot scn. Okay. You, you should be able to see a yellow lever because I changed the bit the property in the OGL model, saying that it's good in the scene seven here seven. You can see here, color is equal to yellow, so that's why we have a yellow color here. And we have this identity mapping connecting the mechanical model with the visual model. This slave visual model will follow, using the mapping, will follow the mechanics. And this time, if we animate, you can notice that the yellow visualization mesh follows according, uh, follows, the, follows exactly the, the mechanical mesh. This, we can actually stop the animation and we can check by changing you know the visual properties if we deactivate the visual model you can see that the mechanics is indeed just behind just below and it's driving the visualization okay but you remember the the idea of having this visual model is actually to have a mechanical model and to have a different mesh, not the same. Here, up to, up to now, we are actually using the same mesh. Let's use different meshes. Let's say that we, we, we keep the, the, same, the same mesh uh, lever.msh for the mechanics. That's the one I call loader course. And let's use this time a fine mesh, smooth mesh, but only a surface mesh for the visualization. That's the one we call mesh loader fine. So this time we have two loaders. One loads actually a MSH file, the other one loads a OBJ file, which is just a surface mesh. Surface mesh. And you can notice that the mechanics is using this one. And the other the other link here, the other connection is their sources at dot dot slash dot dot slash mesh loader file for the visual model. So now we have a course mechanical model and a fine visual model. We are, we are using actually the mapping which is the most commonly used mapping, the one which is called barycentric mapping. When you have two different meshes, that's the mapping that you have to use. Barycentric mapping computes actually barycentric coordinates at the beginning of, beginning of the simulation. And those barycentric coordinates will be actually saved into a Jacobian matrix that computes the transformation from one mesh, from one, from uh, from uh, one uh, one domain, which is the here the mechanical object, the mechanical uh, uh, model, 
to the visual model. And how to go from one to another, this transformation is done through the barycentric coordinates. So by doing that, we'll have, that's what we just saw in the, in the simulation, we will be able to, this time, not only have the visual model that will follow the, me the mechanics, but on top of that, we'll have two different meshes, and still the visual model will follow the mechanical model. Okay, so if we take a look at the scene number seven and uh, the name, it's seven uh, visual, uh, uh, fine visual. So it, you should see appearing now a red lever. You should be able to see that here. You should be able to, so by running this scene, the barycentric mapping will connect the two. As you can notice, the surface mesh here is a red surface mesh is way finer, you know, the, it's a refined mesh. You can actually see that by clicking on wireframe. And you can see that between the mechanics, which is in blue, and the visual model, which is in red, it's not at all the same mesh anymore. One is purely surface, uh, surface mesh, that's this guy here. The surface mesh, the red mesh, is just a surface triangular mesh. Fine, quite fine, finely meshed. Although the mechanics, it's the one we use for the mechanics, it's a 3D mesh with tetrahedron inside, but way coarser. And despite it's not the same mesh, the barycentric mapping will make the connection between the two. Okay? Any questions so far? Uh, I see the question of Shantanu. Uh, and if change of mapping, something else. Uh, I don't get the question. Uh, 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 the uh, if change uh, the if change the mapping do to to something else. Rigid mapping or haptic mapping a dimension. Okay, but sorry. Oh, I uh, okay. Okay. Um, so um, each mapping that you are mentioning corresponds to something actually corresponds to some specific case. The identity mapping corresponds to the case where you have exactly the same mesh for the for the physics and for the visualization, or for the physics and for the collision. It, visualization and collision will work the same. We will create one subnode, and we will connect that to, to connect uh, connect this subnode to the to the mechanics. When you have exactly the same mesh, the same kind of degrees of freedom, you use the identity mapping because the Jacobian matrix that that trans, that allows the transformation from one uh, one uh, configuration to the to the other is just a Jacobian matrix since since it's actually the same mesh. When it's not the same mesh and it's too deformable, we are talking about deformable bodies. It will be the barycentric mapping. And when you want to map a rigid body on a deformable one you're going to use a rigid mapping. And last but not least, it's when you want to connect, when you want to map two rigid, two rigid bodies, it's a rigid rigid mapping. That's, uh, that's more or less the four main mappings that do exist. Okay? Yeah, and that's, that's all the purpose. So Chantal is saying that, yeah, it's, uh, it, 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 has, it has been using the same mesh for a long time. Depending on what you want to do, but sometimes it's important to, to, to keep exactly the same mesh and to visualize exactly what you are simulating in the physics. But you know, you remember all of the examples that we gave earlier for uh, simulating a simulation for medical training. There, what you need is a realism in the physics, but you need also to have very good rendering so that the surgeons, when they are, tra they are, when they are making the training, they get very nice rendering and very nice visualization. In such cases, it's super important to have very fine visualization mesh. And that's why it's important to have the possibility to disconnect the physics from the rendering so that, you know, people can really use a mesh for the, the physics, a mesh for the rendering. OK, cool. So let's move again further. There is one last thing, you know, when we talk about physics, what usually you have to do is, is to define what is called boundary conditions. Usually you will have some points that will be attached. 
uh, or it will be there will be some constraints and so on. I'm, I'm going to show you one of the most usual constraints that we're actually using. Instead of letting, as we were doing up to now, uh, our lever, hopla, is that going to work? Yeah. Here, instead of letting our lever here slide in the x direction, we are, we're going to apply still a constant force. We we'll still have a constitutive law, an elastic constitutive law, a mass, but I'd like to attach some point, like just like if there, there was something attached here, okay? Here, I just did that with the mouse, but let's do that really in the scene, just like there was one of the points that was really fixed on the mesh. What is done in that case, so we can, we can have a look here to the scene number eight, what we are adding is just one line here saying, oh, we would like to attach some, some points, some points will be fixed. It will be the points number, the indices of the points will be the points number one, three, and 50. I took them randomly here, but you, you can can actually you can actually you know find the point indices by clicking on uh, is that here yeah perfect on the topology algorithms uh, geometry algorithm sorry if you double click on that visualization widget and there you'll be able to for instance draw the triangle indices or draw the edges indices and then update and you can notice. I'm going to hide, hide the, the visual model. But as you can notice, we are starting to have all the ideas, the indices of the triangles. Okay, it's the triangle number 790, number 115 here, and so on and so forth. You can actually do the same with the points. Instead of drawing the point in, uh, triangle indices, you can actually draw the point indices here. And I can already tell you that, you know, the point number we, here, we are asking to fix the point number 1, 3, and 50. It's written here. We can actually, we're going to fix, so the point zero, uh, 1, which is here, 3, which is here, and 50, which is here. So we are, we're going to attach fixed three points below the, below the lever. If I load the scene number 8, that's what I have here. As you can uh, as you can notice, I have some pinky here, pinky squares appear that appeared that explain that these are actually fixed points. Those fixed points you can apply. Uh, I mean, visualize them or deactivate them using the behavior models option to see the constraints, the fixed points that we just constrained. If we now run the animation. Uh, there is still the visual model, huh? guys. It's still here. Just I, I'm adding it here in the options, but it's still here and it's still here and mapped. You can see here that I have a, I have my mesh and it's still it's going it's undergoing the constant force in the x direction. But as you can notice, it's not deforming a lot, right? Why? Because the force that, that we are applying here is actually not very high. It's a force of one. And maybe I can try to increase it a bit. Ah, if, I, if I succeed to do it, yeah, here, 10, 100, 100, 100, 100, maybe I can increase it, decrease it, and so on and so forth. So you can see that now, in that case, I have one object, which is called the lever, this lever, it has solvers to compute at each time step how things are evolving, the topology containers containing all the topology, the mechanical object containing the degrees of freedom and how they evolve at each time step. We have all the physics behind an elastic model to explain how things are actually deforming using the finite element method. The same for the mass. The mass is using the finite element method as well here. A constant force, that's actually the green arrow that, that we are seeing here. It's a force along the x-axis applied on all the points of the models. And we are applying a fixed constraint on those points here, below the, below the lever, the points 1, 3, and 50. So now we start, uh, we start to have this quite complete deformable model for the physics 
of our object, and below we have connected through the mapping a visual representation which is used for the rendering. If I click on view again, I can see this smooth mesh moving accordingly. Okay? So here, I think with this, this, all these information, you can already achieve really a lot of things of what is available in SOFA, I think. And I'd like really to know if there is anything which is unclear here before we go further. It's good for everyone. Great. I'm going to move on. What do you what do you mean by f using frames? I'm not I'm not sure. Can we get fixed constraint using frame? Ah, you you mean using the the the, the rigid points, right? Using the rigid uh, rigid uh, orientation uh, position plus orientations that we had before. Is is, is that correct, uh, Shantanu? To answer, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yes, for the rigid rigidification, indeed, uh, which is one of the techniques, uh, it's uh, something a bit specific, especially about soft robotics. But yeah, you can use indeed, and that will also pass through the mappings and so on. But to use rigid particles, and those ones, if you'd like to keep them fixed, you can uh, indeed add a fixed constraint to them. Uh, have a, uh, and, and yeah, ri rigid rigid bodies can as well be fixed. To, you'll have just a single particle in space, fixed and and rigid. So it will they will uh, it will basically be just a, an object that will not move. Another solution for that is just you don't put any solver in the, the in the node of your rigid object, and it will never move since there is no solvers to compute anything, right? So it's another another solution of doing that. So I'm going to move a bit quickly so that we can move to the next parts of, 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 the, of the presentation. As you can notice, if you'd like, instead of uh, adding, uh, adding a constant force as we were up to now, instead of having a constant force field that I removed here, as you can, it's not here anymore, we can use a gravity. The gravity will, will be computed using, again, it will look for elements, 3D elements, and using the finite element method, it will compute the integration of Rho, uh, of rho times uh, g, the uh, uh, gravitational acceleration. Okay, and so I put minus one here just randomly, but it's the way it works. Okay, you can put the gravity. It will by default apply on all the object in the scene a gravity. So be careful because it applies really gravity on all the nodes when you do that, and on all the objects below in the simulation. You can also define the gravity here as a, as a force field, just in one subnode, if you'd like. It was just a detail. Um, I, I, um, I did not show that before. I did not show that neither, but I'm going to share my screen just to, to show that very shortly. It's, you know, in the mapping scene examples, there was one that was called mapping extract surface. It's something which, which can be interesting for you, so I'm, I'm going to just show, explain that in a, few sec, in a few seconds. We have exactly the same lever as before, but just for the visualization, let's say that you want to keep the same mesh, but extract the, the, the surface of the mesh. In so far, it's written this way. We use actually something which is called tetra to triangle topological mapping, which extracts the triangles at the surface of the, of the tetrahedral mesh. It saves Everything, so as you can see, it is a mapping. It remains a mapping, but it's a topology mapping, which connects the two topology. And here we extract the surface, and by doing that, we can then create another subnode saying, okay, my rendering node will actually use, will not use another mesh, but will, instead of that, extract the surface of this mesh to render it, and in that case, you will render only the triangles at the surface of the mesh. Okay, so it look it would look like like that this way. And you, if if we take a, again instead of having the very smooth surface, 
because here it was a smooth surface because we had a second mesh that we were loading for the rendering. But if we load the scene number seven extract surface, you can recognize in green here, you can recognize, because I put the color green here, but you can recognize the surface corresponding to the tetrahedra, right? We just extracted the surface of the tetrahedra. And inside, if, we, if I go inside here, you can see that it's just a surface mesh. OK? OK, it was just a sh short, uh, a very short uh, point that I wanted to make. OK. I'll let you post your, uh, yeah, the, what does the input at dot dot uh, and then something else, just like here, actually, when you, when you have like a at or a arrobas uh, in French, <laughs> but a, a at, it means that you connect data, especially when you have SRC here, which means source, it means you will connect all the data of this component to the corresponding data to this component. So it's actually this one here, right? So if this guy, I'm going to use the text uh, here. If this guy has some data, which is called, for instance, position and something, another, uh, and another data, which is called color, and this guy and the, and the OGL model has something which is called position and uh, I don't know, uh, texture, for instance. By doing that, by doing this SRC at, you, you will connect all the corresponding data. And here, the two corresponding ones are the two position, right? And it will automatically initialize and connect the two. It means this one will have always the same value than this one. So uh, the, the what, this one will always always have the same value of this one. OK? Uh, there, there were nothing else afterwards. Ah, ah I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Guys. I'm sorry, Ali. Sorry, sorry. I should have read uh, up, up to the end. Yeah, what it means, it's actually, it means that here, it, it, uh, this guy is looking for a container. So when you say at uh, uh, sorry, am I sharing my screen? No, oh, so I'm sorry. Uh, um, I'm going to share it again up here. OK. Indeed, here it was written in the identity mapping. I want to connect input at dot dot. It means one node above, find me the container. And this is this guy. It's actually implicit. So it's clearly unclear. It's really unclear. So you're perfectly right to ask. But the input here is looking for either, either it's looking for a mechanical object or a topology container. So now it, here is finding a topology container. And it's, link, it's linking here the OGL model and this container here. All right? And in the same way, actually, this guy, I could have removed that here. And it would have found here the topology and the mechanical, uh, the mechanical object just before. But always prefer, I always prefer to specify. So I should have written that really here. OK? It's cleaner and it's way more easy to understand at the first uh, at the first look. Sorry, sorry about that. I wasn't clear. Okay. So that's the la that's actually the last part of the tutorial. Then we'll we'll just have a look to how it is actually written in Python. But you'll see it's super easy to go through Python because here all the scene up to now were written in XML. But what's about the collision? What what I, I said some something before you say I said uh, I said we have now in in the simulation we have one node one sub node which is called the lever and we have one sub node for the visualization if we want to add a collision model all that we need is to create another sub node for my model for for for, for my for my object in my in in the sub node lever, it will. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna share my screen instead first. It will be. It will be easier to, to understand here. Up here, perfect. If we want now to add finally a collision model, how does it look? Ah, uh, yeah. So I'm sorry. I, I skipped a slide. 
I skip, skip the slide, sorry. Just the slide before, slide 20, uh, 27 here, there was here a, a very small difference between the slide 27 and 26. Can you, can you notice what it was? I mean, it's, it will be in bold, so it will be easy. It's this guy here, OK? It's, I just replaced tetrahedron FEM force field with, with something else, which is called mesh spring force field. Do you have an idea what, what will do this guy here? Can you, does any one of you have an, have, have an idea of what is going to create this kind of force field? Now, now Hadi, Hadi is in fire. Jake, yeah. Yeah, perfect. I saw that Jake started to, to write, but indeed Hadi is adding springs on the mesh lines. Exactly. So do you know how it is called, that, such a model? I don't know if you know, it's called a, a, you know, a mass spring model. It's a model which is actually simpler when you use springs, only springs, something which is quite simple because it does not really take into account the volume of our object. It's just adding springs on the edges. On the contrary, FEM, the finite element method, computes the integration in the volume on each element of the mesh. But I wanted to show you that here, in just one line of the script, you completely change the physics. We go from a FEM model, elastic FEM model. We were consider considering that our object was an elastic, uh, was following an elastic uh, constitutive law, computed, computed over tetrahedron using the finite element method. And we moved to just springs on the edges, and that's it, a mass spring model in one line. So that's, again, you know, I was saying uh, at the beginning, the philosophy of SOFA, it was to allow efficient prototyping of simulation. So it was to, in a very short amount of time, very short amount of lines, change things, add a new object, add a, a, a change the properties of the object or whatever. So that was an example here. In just one line, you can actually move, move from a FEM-based uh, simulation to uh, spring-based simulation. I'm gonna. So here we were we were actu we were actually uh, running the scene number uh, eight, for instance. You know, we 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 had this constraint added where our FEM model and the FEM model. You can see that here, right? The FEM model is here. It was actually deforming and so on. And in just one line, if I open the the the, the file, so number. Um, 10 other model. Now you can see that uh, everything that I can see here is actually, I'm, I'm going to put a, a white background here so that you can see that better. The white background, you can see, get that pressing the B key. And you see, now we do not, uh, we do not see any tetra anymore because there is no computation made on the tetra. It's only on the lines. There will be springs on the, on the edges of the mesh, but it will be the same. I mean, it's another kind of model. It does not behave the same way. But in just one line, we change the whole, I would say, theory which is used to compute uh, the deformation. Here, it's a spring-based uh, model, whereas in the other one, it's an elasticity uh, model uh, computed over the, the finite element of our mesh, so, so the tetra. OK? So really, really to see the, the, the the big difference is really uh, in just one line, as I'm showing here on the, on the right screen, one line, you're just completely changing the model that you are using in the simulation. OK? Great. So I wanted to go finally to the collision. Let's go to the, let's end here with the collision and, and this uh, user tutorial. What do we need to add if we want to add collision to our lever object here. Our lever object, it's this guy here, right? It was the, up to those, the, all those stuff here, it's exactly the same as before. Or I, I kept, actually, I kept the, the elastic model computed over the tetra. 
Um, I did not use I did not use the mesh spring model, but otherwise, I mean, it's re really the same as before, the same fixed constraint and so on, the same visual model. And what is added? Only one subnode called collision. I mean, you can call that the way you want, but we have a visual subnode, we have a collision subnode, and they work basically the same way. As you can notice from the barycentric mappings, both both have a barycentric mapping. Both barycentric mappings are actually connecting the mechanics, so the physics of the lever, to first here the visual model, that's for the visual node, and the same for the collision, we are connecting the mechanical model with the collision model, so that when the physics, when the lever deforms, the mesh that we use for the collision will deform as well, following that guy here. And there is one difference, as you can notice, we are, so we can, here we are using uh, a mesh topology, but uh, that's, that contains actually the, the topology that we, that we will use for the collision, so in, in that case, the triangle topology. And we, we have here, in addition, compared, compared to the visual mesh, we have a mechanical object. The reason why we need this mechanical object is actually, can be, it, it can easily be explained. Because at each time step, I, I told you, the animation loop will compute first collision, and then the physics that has to take into account the collision. So the first step will compute collision, and at the end of the collision, collision computation, the forces, if there was some collision that occurred, the forces due to the collision will be saved and stored here in the collision model, in this subnode here. And to compute the physics, when the physics will be computed, so in the second step, the barycentric mapping will actually send this force information back up to the physics, uh, back up to the physics here, so that the physics of our object will take into account the elasticity, the mass and the external forces, and also the forces coming due to the collision. Okay, that's why. So this collision here, this collision here, is also sometimes sending information back up to the mechanical representation. The you remember the visual node? It's completely passive. It's just following. It's a pure slave. Of the, of the mechanics, the collision model sometimes sends back, using this mapping, is sending back up here forces to the physics. Okay, so you see, it's not just in a few lines. We, we do not have, we have just first a physical representation, a rendering representation, and a collision representation. And as we said at the beginning, you can use one mesh which will be different for each of these representations. You can also use the same if you'd like, but you can use different representation. Okay? And you need something else, actually. But the, the some, something else that you need will be on the top of the simulation. Just after the animation loop, what you need is to define the collision pipeline. Do, do you all remember about the collision pipeline? The collision pipeline, we saw that in the, in, the um, in the first part of the presentation. It was, you know, the way SOFA computes collision, always in three phases. The broad phase, checking the bounding boxes here. If the bounding box of the, of the ball and the bounding box of the, of the dragoon are colliding or not. If yes, if they are colliding, we go to the next. If not, stop, and that's the end. And so on and so forth. We check closer if there is an uh, intersection between the, the, the two meshes, and we apply a response if needed. And that's why, in the simulation, what we have at the top of the, of the simulation, we just have those four additional lines describing here broad phase, narrow phase, and the response. Okay? And by doing that, 
it will compute the collision pipeline, and the collision pipeline will look inside each object, inside each node, like our liver node, and it will look for some, some someone like that, like that here, some collision model, model. As soon as a collision model is found, it will be used to check if there is collision between objects. Okay? Is that clear for everybody here, that part? Clear. Okay, great. If there is anything unclear, again, let me know. As you can notice, so you remember, we were using a coarse mesh for the, for the physics, a fine mesh for the visualization, and in this case, in this example, what, what are we using? Here I'm saying, okay, the collision mesh, the collision model, will use exactly the same mesh than the visual model. So it will be the very fine surface. Let's have a look to the, the simulation. So I'm going to again share my screen if you, if you, here. If you, uh, we'll, we'll make a break, a break just after that, okay? So, so that uh, we take a bit uh, of uh, coffee, fresh air, time for questions, and so on. Uh, let me share the, 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 right, uh, the right piece of code. So that's the scene number 11 collision model. Let me open that here, collision model. As you can notice, I have my lever. And you see on the, on the left hand side, in the left widget, as before, if I deactivate the collision model, I find the visual model. If I deactivate the visual model, I find the mechanical model, which is the master model, the model which is driving all the other ones. If I animate, you can notice that the mesh is moving, deforming. If I activate again the visual model, I can see that the visual model is following using the mapping, the barycentric mapping, even if the meshes are different. And I can even notice that the collision models, if I activate it, it's exactly the same mesh as the visual model. It's exactly the same mesh, but this time not used for rendering, but for collision. Uh, the lever is alone, so there they won't be collision for the moment, but it, it would be the mesh that will be used for the collision. If you, want, <clears throat> if you want to see, you know, the bounding boxes that are used for checking the broad phase, you can actually click here on bounding collision models, and you will see all the bounding boxes that are used to check the collision. Okay? With that here, you know, I think now almost everything needed for a simulation with SOFA. Okay. Then there is there is there is different methods available, different kind of collision model available, different kind of solvers available. But the the, the theory and the way of co building a scene will always be the same. Okay. Uh, I'm checking if there is anything to add here. Okay. Uh, Last, last thing I would like to do with this scene, with this uh, collision scene, <clears throat> I'm sorry. So last thing that I would like to do, I'd like to use, I'll keep, I'll keep the same mesh for the mechanics, this coarse volumetric me mesh made of tetra, We'll keep the same triangular mesh for the visualization, so this guy here. But instead of using instead of using the same mesh for the collision, we will use something else. Okay. And the second stuff that we'll, we would like to, to do in, the, in, the, in this simulation is also we would like to add another object so that the lever will finally enter in collision with another object. Okay, let's have a look to the scene number 12 objects. The scene is exactly the same as before, exactly the same. Okay, the only difference is what we added just at the bottom here. What we added is another subnode, a subnode called Sphere. It has its own solvers. 
its own container of degrees of freedom, its own mechanical object. As you can notice, this one is a rigid object. It has a mass, it has a constant force field. It's actually the same as, you know, the node particles that we had before. Just we are associating here in, in a quite compressed manner. The, the way we are writing things here, we are mixing everything because we just have one particle, so we put everything in one. Otherwise, we need to, to create some nodes, but here we have one particle and we will associate it to this particle, a sphere that will be used for the collision. So how does it look like if we load the scene number 12? It, will, it, it looks like that here. We still have exactly the same lever model, but now we have here a particle, a rigid particle. It will, it will fall actually on the lever along the minus y, as you can see here, minus y direction. We are applying a constant force on this rigid particle so that it will enter in collision with the lever. Okay, if I animate here, I can even click here on interactions here on the on the left hand side panel. I click step by step. The rigid particle is following falling under the lever up to the point where what will happen? Here, a, a green line appears. It means Detection, collision, collision is not yet detected, but there is a warning. There is a, a, a method that allows to send in SOFA some alarms saying, oh, the two objects are getting closer and closer. They are not in contact yet, but they are getting closer and uh, closer and co closer. And we go closer and closer and then up to the point that there will be the lines is actually changing from colors because we gave here some information about the collision detection. And we are considering that we are in contact as soon as the two objects are closer than 0 .0 0 0.25. As soon as we are below this distance, there will be a force applied both on the rigid particle and on the lever. Look at the surface here. The surface is deforming and it will apply a force both on the particle and on the lever. Okay? Sorry. Any questions so far? And we are almost done for the user tutorial. Okay, cool. No, no more guys. We are almost there. Then we take a break. We look at the math, and yeah, for every mechanical object, we have to define a solver. So, not necessarily to be computed, to be solved, an object, a mechanical object, has to be below in the graph below a solver. Okay, but if there is no solvers above the mechanical object. It will just be like, you know, you remember what happened when we had the single particle alone with the mass and the, and the constant force? It was not moving. So if you just want to create an object which is not moving, you can remove the solvers. And to, I would say, to move or to evolve, to compute something, uh, to compute the dynamics of something, the mechanical object must be below solvers, okay? So the answer is usually yes. Usually we have uh, we have one solver for a mechanical object. What it means to actually have one solver for two objects, it's possible. Uh, I'm, I'm going to stop sharing. What does it mean to do that? Uh, so I'm going to write here in the slide, but uh, um, can I? Yeah, I'm going to use this slide, uh, this slide for, for drawing. What does it mean if you have one solver for two mechanical objects? It means we will solve a system where actually we ha will have the object one that will be here in, in the matrix and the object two that will be here. Okay. 
if you have two mechanical objects below one single solver, the solver will accumulate the two objects. But in this way, they, they can, but they the two objects will not be coupled, but they will be solved in the same time. Okay? It's possible to do that as well, to have one solver for two different mechanical objects. I hope it, uh, it, answers, uh, it answers your point. All right. Um, I'll let you type uh, Chantal while I, I, I finished. I, I'd like to, to finish just the user tutorial. Let's have a look to the last, last, last point. Oh, I mean, ah, just before going to Python, but all right. I want here we have the case where we had this uh, rigid particle falling on the lever. Let's let's change, you know, the collision model that we are using for the collision the collision model that we are using for the lever. For instance, I don't know, uh, Christian. For instance, let's say that it's your eye, and that maybe you don't care about, you know, the a uh, uh, very nice surface here of the eye and so on, or the liver, whatever. Let's say that you want to just a coarse collision detection, right? And that will, for instance, be made instead of using triangles. We're going to use, we're going to put some spheres, right, on the on the surface of the mesh. So let's forget about this collision mesh here. And that's our phys the, the mesh where the physics is computed, the tetrahedral mesh. And what we're going to say is that, oh, I don't care about you know getting super fine and so on and, and getting so many triangles. I'd just like to put some spheres on the vertices of my mesh here to compute the collision. So I'm going to comment that, just like remove that, uncomment that here, and Oh, this I'm going to keep that here and comment that here. So what I'm doing? Can you recognize what we're doing here? That's what we saw in, in one of the previous scenes. It was a way of extracting the surface, right? Mm -hmm. So here, what we have in this node, a triangular surface, we are recovering. Uh, am I am I well sharing my screen? Can you see my screens? I, I can see it. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Uh, that's what what we see here is. What we are doing here, we are extracting from the blue mesh here, from the the mesh used for the physics here. Mm -hmm. We are extracting the triangles on the surface. And what are we doing here? We are adding a sphere, a small sphere, and we can actually adjust the radius of, of the sphere I'll, I'll show you. Okay. We are adding a, a sphere on each vertex of this surface. How does it look like if I save the file and reload here on the left hand side? Oh wow! It looks like that, and it becomes there. I mean, collision made with spheres. It's super easy, right? It's super straightforward. It's simple. You test. You, it's just a test of distance. If my point one and my point two here is my rigid point one and my point at, at the at the surface uh, of of my lever, are they below or above? the collision distance, and that's it. As simple as that. So it's, it goes super fast, and it's maybe less accurate, you'll see. I mean, poof, collision is detected, it will deform still a bit. Collision is, will not be perfect. You know, if, if I reload and I just draw here, I'm just going to look at the visual models. It looks like that here. So there is no visual model for the particles, but you see, looks like that. We have a particle bouncing a bit far from, from the lever or whatever, because that's the way the collision has been computed. But it's super efficient. So it's a way saying, OK, I don't want to get a super, super fine collision, but I want, uh, I want it to be efficient. So I want to get this efficient uh, collision. But maybe I want to keep a very fine or a very coarse, depending on what you need, simulation of the physics. So each each model, its representation is completely, uh, I would say, disconnected. Co coherency is kept because there is the, the mappings, but it allows really you to choose where to put accuracy, where to where to ensure computational efficiency, and so on and so forth. Okay. Okay. And would let's. You say, could, I, could I ask you go actually? Yeah. yeah. Would you say for the spheres is is an accuracy more due to? the fact that we're using spheres instead of triangles or more because of the radius that we had set the spheres to? Uh, uh, what I mean, is is that less... The, how, the inaccuracy of the model? Ah, uh, yeah. Due to... so, 
Yeah, no. Here, in that case, it's it, it's it's more it's more due to the fact that here I, you will notice I just decreased here. I mean, because the default value is one, but radius I, I decreased that to zero point one. I will I will reload. You see the spheres, they are smaller, right? Mm -hmm. So we will detect uh, uh, the the the, uh, the particle will will come closer to the surface. But again, it just depends on the parameters we are setting, right? It's just that if we put large radius, co the detection, co uh, the collision detection will be done way before the collision actually really happens, right? Since we have big radius, the two objects, like if I show you here, you see, we are we are still far. There is we are still pretty far from the from the surface, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just depending on the kind of collision model that you are using, you're not going to have the same uh, the same collision response, obviously, because the collision response will be using the collision models that you used. So the finer the collision model you use, the finer the response will be. Uh, the more spheres we are putting on the, on the, on the surface, the, the more accurate will be, or the more triangles we put as a collision model, the more accurate will be the, the but spheres in in general, spheres are not more accurate than uh, uh, than triangles. Okay, just right. to make things clear, it just depends on what you again in your scene, how how many triangles you are setting. What are again when when we are looking at here up in the scene, what are the parameters that you are setting? If I decrease that, it means I will detect collision later when it comes really really closer if i decrease that and i put that here and if i increase on the contrary i will detect the the collision way before it happens okay mm -hmm. got it thank you so it, it's all a question of numerical settings and and what what you what you define right perfect thanks but uh, I, I really wanted to, to show a bit of the, the flexibility of the kind of things you could do, you know, putting spheres, keeping triangles, a lot of them or a few of them or different meshes or whatever. You, you are really free to do whatever you want. Um, so, yeah, in fact, if you know, for instance, if you have a very detailed, so I, I'm going to answer Shantanu's question first, uh, if you have a lot of elements in, you know, a lot of triangles, a lot of... Uh, 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 a very, very, very fine mesh used for collision. And you have two objects with very, very fine collision meshes. It means at the phase, at the collision step, when you want, you know, when at the, at the first step of the animation loop, you say, oh, compute the collision. It means you will need to browse and to go through all the triangles of, uh, of object one and object two to check if there is collision or not. So the more elements you have, the finer it is, the slower it will be because it will it, it must be checked everywhere. So in a, in the few in the coming weeks uh, months in the coming months, uh, I'd say by by January or February, everything here will be multi-threaded or at at least there will be a possibility to multi-thread all that because you can actually parallelize uh, when there is a lot of objects in contacts one with uh, object one and two object two and three and so you can parallelize the detection but still. Still, it will depend on the on the model that you are using. So yes, if you are using finer models, it will be slower. Let me know if if it does not if it's not your point again. Never hesitate to 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 specify the, the point. What does the topology modifier do? Do I miss uh, about some something here? Uh, where ah, I'm sorry, it goes uh, it goes noisy. Maybe it's yeah. And sometimes it's uh, ah. Is that better now, Jake? Because Jake, you were saying it was a bit loud or a bit uh, uh, cloudy. So let me know if it's better. I'm I'm really sorry about that. Um, for the others, the the sound was okay. Or let me know if I'm speaking too loud or anything. When I, I'm I'm getting passionate, uh, so <laughs> no, the the sound is fine. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. And, and, and Jake, let me know if, it, if it's fine. Um, so I'll answer the point also of, of Jake. Uh, but there is some, something that, that is sometimes needed uh, in, in, the, in the topology part of SOFA, uh, which is called the topology modifiers. Those guys, this guy is actually used when the topology will be 
either when the topology needs to be regenerated, for instance, when the mesh which is given as input is incomplete, or you know you have only exa endpoints, SOFA will miss edges and quads, and SOFA will recompute them. But to, to recompute them, there is the modifier that needs to be that needs to be here. In the same, that's one reason or one case. And there is another case where the topology modifier is a component that will appear in the scene on top of the topology container that we saw before. The topology modifier will also be needed when there will be topological change, when there will be a point removed, uh, a triangle removed, or whatever. Okay, That's the two reasons where a modifier, topology modifiers, ap appears in the scene. I hope. Uh, sorry, I, I hope it clarifies things. Let me let me show you an example of uh, of a topology modif modification. I'm gonna try to be quick to find that master about examples. Uh, uh, component demo. Back here. If I take that here. And, I'm, and then I'm going to use, it's a specific scene that is actually making you know, topological changes here. To do so, you'll need to have a modifier in your scene because we are actually modifying the topology. In the same way, if we, really, if we delete some components here, we'll need a modifier in the same, uh, in the same, uh, in the same way. And uh, can make it... Uh, Can make it move here. I just reverse some elements, so it's going to become more and more unstable. But anyway, okay. Uh, all right. I hope you didn't. Oh, I, I should have moved close so far. Um, okay. Let's go to the very last part. It's actually very simple. Uh, we can maybe stick to the slides for, for for that. It's how to translate a scene. Or now, up to now, we looked at you know writing a, a scene in XML. What, it, what should, would it look like if it was written using Python? Let's take this scene here. You know the particle under gravity? I took it because it's short and therefore it fit uh, the, the size of the slide, but it would work the same way for, uh, it, would be, it, it would work the same way for, uh, for a, a larger scene. So it would look like that here. Import so far because uh, you know in, in uh, Python you need always to import the libra libraries and so on. Uh, so that's actually true for here. It's a, a scene file for Sofa Python two. There would be some very minor keywords change for Sofa Python three, but it would be the same kind of writing, exactly the same kind of writing where you know you define you have a function Python function that defines what what you are supposed to do at the creation of the scene, and you can dynamically add things like create a new child node called particle. In those nodes, then you will have the possibility to create as many objects as you want, and so on and so forth. The big difference with Python is that any time during the simulation, you will also be able to recover key events and add, you know, change things depending on those events, or stop the simulation, or basically interact with the simulation using the Python script, okay? So this scene, the translation in Python of the scene of uh, the particle under gravity, is the scene, I think, number 13, if I'm correct. Uh, let me check that. 13, yeah, 13 particle. I'm going to, uh, uh, can you open that also on your, on your side? You should see, without, without running it, you should see, again, the, a single particle in the middle of, no, uh, of nowhere, right? And if you click, I mean, if you if you open the particle node, you'll find exactly as before, the same node, just it has been made using a Python script that looks like what we see here. Just as before, we are defining, the, you know, the total force along the x-axis, the mass, the solvers, so it will move. If you click on animate, it will move in the x direction, okay? Let's see a bit the advantage of the, the, the Python script now. I'm going to, again, open 
the scene number now 12 interactive. We, we have, so I'm animating the scene, but as you can notice, the particle is not moving just because I'm setting here at the initialization of the graph, I'm just setting the total force to zero. So no force, no motion. But I added that here, there is a new function called on key press that will allow you to make things, change things, add, add or remove things on, for instance, keyboard events here. And using the plus and minus plus uh, plus and minus keys, and you'll have to use them using the control plus and control minus. What what can I do here? I will control plus, control minus, control plus, minus. I'm actually changing the force applied to my particle. And therefore it's acceleration, right? So I'm changing dynamically the value, which is here inside the component. I'm with Python using keyboard events, directly changing the total force applied. Here, I set it back to zero here. If I continue to animate, I will plus, 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 and stop the animation. I go and see what is the value of the, of the force now. As you can notice, it has been increased up to 0 0.02. So using Python, you can, like that, change the property, like in this case, the force applied dynamically. I could even change maybe the IDs, you know, the, the points where if I, if I have a lot of points, I could change what are the points on which I am, I, am, I, I am currently applying a force or the intensity of the force as we are doing here. So if I run that again, and so I animate, I still have my particle here. If I click on plus, it accelerates. If I click on minus, it decelerates. And as you can notice, there is also a A key event. If I press control A key, it will create more and 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 more, and more particles. I'm creating on the fly, each time that I'm pressing control A key, a new particle that will be shifted along the Z axis and that will be computed and that I just reloaded the scene and that will be simulated. Those particles, they were not defined at the beginning, right? In the simulation, they were not here in the simulation at the beginning. But in the script, in the, in the Python script, I prepared that so that I could, if something happens, in, in fact, a keyboard event, I was changing things in the simulation. So it brings a lot of interactivity here. An example again of Python, Python writing and Python scripting. Uh, in the Python 3 plugins, as we were saying before, you'll have a lot of examples coming in and we're going to really help you go moving, moving from Python 2 to Python 3 and so on. So no worries about uh, the use of Python. You can definitely already start having a look at that because it's a super powerful tool. But as I said, the uh, official stable release will be uh, made in December uh, uh, later later this year. Okay, that's the end of the user tutorial. Is there any question so far? No questions. I want to ask a question about the. Yeah. In cases that we have uh, several parts, several bodies, and we want to uh, stick them together. Is it possible to uh, stick, for example, two parts together? Yeah. So, for, for instance, you can indeed, uh, you know, you, you have several choice of sim simulation always. You, you can simulate that as just one object, but then it will be considered as one common object. If you, if you are ready to have two objects just there would be some kind of two parts of an object, but separated, and you want to connect them. There is ways to 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 connect uh, to connect objects like that. But you can use there is different solutions. You could choose to to put springs, so they will be connected, but there will be elasticity in between. Or if you want to, to to if you if you want those two parts to really stick to another, so there is no elastic parts. Just if one move, if one point moves, the other the other part moves as well. There is other other way, and for that it would be more, um, uh, I would say, approaches that are that would be more suitable, like the 
what is called bilateral interaction constraint. So because you have a bilateral constraint, you want on both sides to enforce the fact that points are connected to another. Okay. And there are lots of uh, comments uh, using Py uh, SOFA or Python. Is there any library or website we can search for them and uh, find them for like help? For, for like what? For like? For like help, well, um, like other software, they have a part um, we can find comments for SOFA. Have we such a thing? I don't know, in internet or in software. You mean to, 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 to know what kind of other softwares are actually uh, no, uh, available? To get familiar with um, more commands in uh, writing uh, XML or Python. Script. Okay. So the, 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 for, for XML, if you want to if, if see a lot of examples of XML, uh, XML scenes, for instance, you can, you can have a look at the, in, in, in SOFA, you can have a look to the following folder, you know, the, the one I mentioned earlier, SOFA examples components. There you'll have a lot of XML files, which are examples of, on how to use any kind of components in SOFA, like loaders, animation loops, whatever. Okay. For, for Python, uh, it would be rather to have a look, uh, to, to have a look, so for SOFA Python, Two, so the old version of so of Sofa Python, you can. I'm, I'm trying to do that in the meantime, but uh, I'm 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 a bit uh, I'm not fast enough. Uh, it's you can go directly in the Sofa Python plugin, which is here, and in the in the Sofa Python plugin you will find a set of examples. You'll have an example folder in this Sofa Python plugin. In the same way, for Sofa Python three, so Python three. In the same way here, Sofi Python 3, you'll find examples that are actually available in the Sofi Python 3 plugin and that will describe how it's supposed to be written. For, insta for instance, you have a, an example of a controller. How should be implemented a controller? And all, what, are all the, what are all the functions, Python functions, that are available to you uh, if you want to write a script? Uh, OK. Can you direct me to how could I simulate friction parameters? That's uh, and Shantanu has the same uh, the same point. So uh, it, it, I, I'm gonna I, usually I'm not doing doing that in the in the in the training training session at least not in the one day training session because it's a, a topic which is a bit complicated. But uh, looking at your application, guys, I think you're gonna. You're gonna you're, you're gonna get I think interest in, the, in that. You remember I mentioned that there is several kind of animation loops, and there is one that is used, uh, nam namely I, I named it already. It's the free motion animation loop, which is a, a um, an animation loop that allows to compute constraints constraints and collision. When, it's, when the response will be computed from a, a method which is called the Lagrange multipliers. It will allow to actually find a pretty accurate solution to the constraint problem. Actually, it's a nonlinear constraint problem when we are talking about friction. And to solve such a fric friction problem, friction problems are actually pretty advanced complex modeling problems, right? It's uh, just so that you know, there is researchers spending their whole currently career working on that topic. Um, to solve such a, a scenario involving friction, you will have to use this free, the, this free motion animation loop. This free motion animation loop, I'll explain how it works. It, it does not work really like as before, you know, uh, as the default animation loop. There is a, a, a small difference. It will check the collision, just like in the default animation loop. But then there will be two steps instead of one for the physics resolution. We will first consider, and that's the idea of, of, uh, of Lagrange multipliers, we will first consider that there will be 
no collision, no constraints. That's what we call the free motion. So the objects will, we will find a first solution that will be the free motion, the, the solution resulting from the free motion of every object in the scene. And then there will be a, a third and last step that will take into account the constraints and the collision. And if you want, again, I'm talking about that because if you want to include friction and to, to simulate friction in SOFA, you will need to use this method. Uh, let's, let's, uh, and you will find an example of how to write a scene involving friction. Uh, you will find that in SOFA. I'm going to try to find the proper, uh, the proper scene file. Just a second. Uh, so far. Okay. okay, you can open. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna open that for 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 you so that and, and share, share my screen, but I'll, I'll let you know where, where it is located so, so that you can get inspired from that. That's here and here. Okay, you should you should be able to see my screen again. And I'm going to open this. So it's in SOFA, examples, components, constraints, and there you have friction contact. If on the right hand side, you have, you have the, the same scene, but the, the X7 version of the scene. As you can notice, we are using the free motion animation loop. But for that, as you, as you know, we are, it's now three steps. That collision detection, so that's what we see here. As we saw in the example of the tutorial, there will be a free motion that will be computed, just like there was no collision, like there was no constraints really to compute the free motion, second step. And the last step, it will use an additional solver, which is a constraint solver to solve the nonlinear constraint problem, NLCP, because it's nonlinear as soon as you have a friction. And as you can notice here, it's the friction parameter mu that you will define for the, uh, for, for the, for the object. I ha we had the question of the forum, I guess it's from one of you. Uh, maybe not, let me know if it's not the case, but uh, to have heterogeneous friction parameters for the moment, it's something which is not implemented in SOFA. We can only define one friction parameter for the object. For the whole object. But this way, you will be able to simulate friction between an object and another using a friction parameter called mu. And that's what you see here. You'll have a friction that will be computed between the two objects that leads actually here the two objects to slide and slowly stop due to friction. Okay? You'll notice that for the, with the free motion animation loop, since we are doing things in you know two steps for the physics, free motion plus the correction taking into account the constraints with the solvers, you will see will you will see appearing in the scene what is called the constraint corrections. That's something that needs that is, with a, a component that is that is needed for applying the constraint correction, which comes from a correction over the free motion. So there is the free motion and the last step is actually a, fa a phase of correction that we, will, that we will apply. All the documentation about that, that's in the link that I gave you here in the, in the chat. The Lagrange, multi, uh, the Lagrange constraint um, approach is, the page on that is explaining the whole process of constraints, uh, constraints resolution and that's the case involving friction. So I'm sorry, it's, it's a bit of a long answer for your point, uh, Jacob and, and Chantanu, but it's actually a very complex problem to solve. So there is unfortunately not easy, no, no easy answer and especially no easy, no easy scene for just like solving, uh, solving a constraint, uh, 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 friction problem like that. You're welcome, uh, Chantanu. You're, I see that you're, you're fluent in French, it's great. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're very, you're very welcome. And again, never hesitate to if you're confused about other stuff, uh, use the forum really a lot. And if you accumulated too many questions, really too many questions, 
in the future, write me an email again and, and we could chat, uh, you know, organize a 30 minute chat later on. Any one of you, right? Uh, just let me know if we could, uh, uh, we are always, uh, always available to, I mean, depending on the, on the, on the amount of, uh, of work in the week, but anytime, just uh, let, uh, let us know if you have further questions, because our purpose is that you really understand the, the theory, which, the theory which is behind how to use SOFA, but also how to understand SOFA and potentially develop, like maybe de develop uh, heterogeneous friction constraints, if you'd like. It's it's really advanced, but it's all the purpose. So, I mean, for, for us to have a community that, you know, improve every day uh, uh, the understanding of SOFA, implementing advanced and more and more uh, advanced models, that's uh, all the purpose. Okay. Do you want to take a uh, check the time? Do you want to take a, a, a five minutes break so that uh, yeah, until forty five basically to 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 take. I mean, if you want to 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 go uh, to go to the toilet, to take a coffee, to I, I'll stay here. If you have other questions, obviously. Uh, otherwise, uh, a, a short break, and we start again in five minutes. And uh, especially for this math to the code, okay. Okay, thank you. Cool. In the meantime, I'm going to prepare a, a, a short uh, poll for you guys. Okay. Uh, polling. Can I create a new poll? Start poll. Ah, okay, I don't know. I'm, I have to publish results. And it was the previous poll, so I'll do, a, I'll do another one.
Okay, guys. Uh, I did not see I did not see the time flowing by. Uh, 46, it is already. Uh, let me know. So uh, I sent a small poll. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, I got all the, the answers. <laughs> okay, it's a 50 50. I mean, we have, I, I have three and four. So, okay. Uh, just try to see who is, who is interested in what so that I can recall that. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so yeah, Chen, Christian, and Chantel who are more for metric resolution and FEM. Uh, whether uh, uh, although Hadi, Jacob, Jake, and Majid more for C plus plus plugin structures and, and compilation. Although so, so I'll try to make the two <laughs> the two of them. Uh, it's it's gonna be it's, it might be uh, I, yeah published that year. Uh, it was yeah almost you see fifty fifty. Um, uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try to to make it fit uh, as much as possible uh, for in the in the time that we have uh, today. We have basically almost two hours. I mean, it's okay for me to to get again two hours if you if, if it's fine for you. Uh, so I, we'll, we'll try to to make one hour of one. And again, a lot of things are actually in the slides, so. Uh, you'll be able to, to get back to the slides later on, even if we did not cover everything about, you know, FEM and so on. And still, I'd like to show you how it works with, um, uh, you know, how a plugin is structured so, so that you can also see how to organize your own work and, and how it's usually structured uh, in, in the different plugins of the, of the community. Okay. So I, I hope I'll, I'll make the, the, the best of the, of the two and, uh, and I'll, I'll try not to disappoint on the, on, on both topics. All right, let me know again. If you need anything, let me know. I won't, uh, I won't lay too much and let's go directly to the first, so to this part, the fourth part, the, this idea, the idea of, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, understand the simulation from the math to the code is actually to get, look back to what we just saw using this user tutorial and make the a relationship between what it means on a mathematical standpoint and how it works, how it is solved. And because there is a whole theory which is behind, as I said already, numerical analysis, there is FEM method, which, which is also there. And for, uh, so I, I, I closed it, I closed the polls, uh, but yeah, for, for the ones that were interested in FEM and so on, it will be fast because even one day, even one, even two days, three days of finite element method is super is super quick. The same for numeric, numerical analysis. There is courses at the university about that that lays a year, two years. So it's it's not in one day that we're going to capture everything. But what I would like to to give is really the sense of the method, why we are using this method, and how it works. So I hope I, I hope I'm going to give you that and. And most importantly, don't get afraid if you don't get all all the all the theory which is behind. That's the point I want to make because it's a complex theory where behind there is also complex mathematical ma mathematical uh, 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 hypothesis sometimes or or definition sometimes. So uh, don't don't be afraid of that and don't and don't expect you know to master everything in the in all the details about the theory which is behind this idea here is to give a sense of all those topics so that you have already an idea when you see an, er an error or instabilities in your simulation to say oh i think it could come from there or it could come it, it could come from there and again the community and myself obviously will always be there for for supporting you in the in the next steps so understanding the math and looking uh, from the math to the simulation scene that we saw up to the code as well directly in the code what what is written in so far okay globally we always have to you know ask ourselves what kind of what kind of uh physics we are looking at you know like what are uh what are the the degrees of freedom that we are working on are we talking about temperatures are we are we talking about position orientation position only you remember this will define what in SOFA? It will define the template, especially the template of the mechanical object. It will define what kind of degrees of freedom we are working with. 
Then, what kind of model do we want to use? Do we want to use a spring model, uh, an elasticity model, computing using the FEM model, or so on and so forth? Then, how it builds this matrix system, and how this matrix system will be solved using numerical tools. So that's what we're going to see. We're going to see in this part mostly those those two parts here. See, so, okay. What is the a bit the numerical analysis and the theory the theory which is behind here? In mechanics, globally, there is what we call you know uh, usually it's animation here. It should be videos, but uh, in the PDF it does not uh, does not work. I won't lose time to find the the video here. It can be there. There can be se several types of mechanics. There is fluid mm -hmm. mechanics. There is here solid mechanics. You can have. In SOFA, even not only mechanics, but mechanics coupled with other phenomenon, like here, it's a diffusion effect that we have here along the cloth that is even cut and so on. Okay. So again, that's the same the same slide as before. You know, always make sure that you know what kind of degrees of freedom you are working with, so that you can define the template of the mechanical object, what is the model that you want to use. The, the physical model that you want to use, and that, then what kind of hypothesis and numerical tools you're going to use, like what kind of solvers you're going to use, and so on and so forth. That's why that's why I was mentioning also this uh, you know free free motion animation look before because you need to know that when you are talking about friction, it creates nonlinear uh, uh, non nonlinear uh, constraint problem to be to be solved. And this can only be solved using specific tools, specific numerical tools, like the Lagrange multipliers, uh, using specific solvers, like uh, Gauss-Seidel uh, Gauss solvers, and so on. All right, but what we saw before. So you remember, we talked about this particle moving along the x-axis and so on. So we were actually talking about solid mechanics, right? Just so that you know, the field of mechanics regroups both solid and fluid mechanics. But in SOFA, we are mostly addressing the solid mechanics. Solid mechanics, it relies on conservation laws and for the solid mechanics, especially what is called the momentum con con conservation law. This momentum con con uh, conservation law will lead to this law here, which is pre pretty well known. It's the second Newton's law which says, and that's the one we looked at since the beginning, you know, using our particle, saying when a, a body has a mass and undergoes some forces, the relationship with the acceleration will be the following. The mass times the acceleration is equal to the sum of all the forces, external forces and internal forces. These forces, so they can be external, external like, like the constant force field or like the wind. Uh, you, you know, if, if you simulate some forces on the surface due to the wind or whatever, that's what we call an external force. But you have also internal forces. These internal forces, they depend on the kind of model, the kind of mechanical constitutive law we are using. We talked a lot about elasticity. That's one of the most well-known uh, mechanical law. But when we talk about a rigid body, what does it mean? It means that there is no internal force. So there will be only uh, there will be only external forces here in the sum of the forces is equal to the mass times the acceleration. Okay? So that's for the I would say the basic very basic theory and we will go a bit further uh, for the solid mechanics. So to compute all that in SOFA, now we saw that it was actually the second principle, main principle that we saw together. It was this animation loop. You know that now this animation loop is always defined just after the root node, and it's using something which is called the visitors, but it's actually what we called what, what, what we defined as you know the orders. It's giving order to the simulation, like compute the collision compute the physics, those are called the visitors, and it's it's browsing the graph. This order is given to all the different collision pipeline, if there is a collision pipeline, and then to all the solvers, if there is some solvers. Okay? 
You remember that with the default animation loop, the first animation, uh, animation loop that we saw, you have first the collision, which is computed, and then the physics, which is solved. And then there is a small update phase, but basically that's it. It's collision plus physics. You remember that animation loop, it does nothing, it just gives order. That's it. And the different animation loops, I told you there is two main animation loops, the default one, collision plus physics resolution, and the free motion animation loop, computing the free motion of the physics, the collision, and then solving the whole constraints. Okay? Basically, with that, th this is really just a, a, a variation of this one. So the default, uh, the multi-step animation loop is not very interesting. Yeah, that's really the two kind of animation loop that does exist in SOFA. Now that we know that, let's have a look at the system that we built, the matrix system that we built when we had a rigid body, you know, the rigid frame. And up to a point, we had even rigid frames. So the, the Newton's law, the new, second Newton's law tells us that here. And if we have a rigid body, what we have is the, the mass times the acceleration is equal to the sum of the forces, but there is no internal forces, only external force. It means I have my, my object, my rigid object. If I apply a force, it induces immediately a motion because force is directly related to the acceleration. Since there, is, since there is no more internal forces, there cannot be any kind of energy absorbed by a deformable material. Now here we talk about something rigid, so a force equals a motion. And no deformation, obviously. So that, that usually when we talk about a rigid object, we usually put the frame, you know, the rigid frame at the center of mass. And then if we looked at what we had before, you know, we had uniform mass and constant force, constant force field. It was giving us this kind of matrix system where the uniform mass was giving this kind of matrix and the constant force was giving this kind of vector here. And you remember, we, we, we set actually a force that, that was zero, zero, one. And we were setting a, uh, and we were setting a mass for the, when we had only one particle with a, that's position, the position of the particle X, Y, Z. There was also the, the orientation, but I did not put that, put that here. And we had a mass of one. Since it's one particle here, it's one everywhere. Huh? Because it's the motion in X, the motion in Y, and the motion in Z of, of, the, of the same particle. Which means that we had actually M times the acceleration is equal to the force, 1 times X is equal to 1. So we had the acceleration along X that was equal to 1. And that's why the velocity was equal to the time if we make the, the integration of X uh, of the acceleration. Okay, so that's what we had. Again, that's why that, that's the case. We use the uniform mass. Okay, any qu any questions so far up to this slide? Question mark. I just made a shot. Oh, no, that was my question. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, any yeah, any question? I saw someone typing. I mean, uh, that was gonna type, but uh, I did not see the the question. So, no questions so far. Do not hesitate to unmute yourself and so on. Uh, I'd like to, to hear your voices uh, to, <laughs> to make it more interactive. But uh, more seriously, if you if you have any any point which is unclear so far, let me know. Sounds good. Thank you. Cool. Cold, the cold coffee. Mm. All right. In this, up to up to there, it's actually quite simple. We have one particle, so there is no there is only a time integration there, right? We'll we'll see right after. But we have no space integration. We are talking about just one particle located in one, really in one point in space with an orientation. So there is no question of integration or whatever. We just have like that here a diagonal mass matrix and one zero 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 like that here on the force so it's a pretty simple case 
but still, it's it's good to keep in mind what kind of you know linear system it's actually building. You remember that there is different mass. We we tried we we used actually in the scene two of them, this one and this one. And you you can see there that it does not correspond at all at the same mass matrix. What does it mean? The first one, the, tot the uniform mass, when you give again a total mass of 5m, it spreads over the diagonal for each point, point 0.1, point 0.2, and like here we have five points, and it's, the mesh is here. For each point of the mesh, the five, the five points of the mesh, it says the total mass divided by the number of points. So 5m divided by 5. Five, it's M, 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 M. What else? Nothing. nothing. All the diagonal is zero. Uh, all the out, uh, extra diagonal term, sorry, is zero. There and there. Okay, so it's a, a very simple mass matrix. But it, it works only, it works well only for particles. Because, because otherwise, you'll see that it does not take really, it, it, wouldn't, it would not fit actually a mesh which is a volumetric mesh. Let's see why. Let's now say that we do not have only particles, but we have a mesh like it is here, made of three triangles, T1, T2, and T3. What we want when we look at the mass is that we want the mass to be spread and to be computed over this old geometry. In that case, we need to take into account the mass and the effect of each triangle. And if we want to take that really into account, we need to make an integration in space. We will see how it works and where, where does this, uh, this matrix come from. But this will come from the integration of the mass density times what? The integration of rho, the mass density, over the volume or the surface in that case because it's triangles. Uh, so I could, I, should, I could write that instead, ds, and that's it. It will, this matrix will result from the integration of that. And how to compute this? This is where, and that's what we will see, the finite element method comes in place. We will need to take into account the mass effect of each triangle. And this effect of triangle one will affect point one, three, and two. That's why here you see T1, 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 and the same here, 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 here. So you see that the first part of the matrix, this three by three block, is affected by the, by the triangle T1 because, edgy, uh, because uh, points, the, vert the vertices of the triangle T1 are the point one, two, three. The point two, three, four, in the same way, will be affected by the triangle T2. That's why here we, we will see uh, we will see here this block will be affected by triangle T2. Finally, this block will be affected by triangle T3. And we add the contribution of all those triangles and it will build our mass matrix. This is actually the, how works, uh, how does the, the finite element method? We will divide the space and then we add the contributions. What are the values of alpha, beta, and so on? It comes from the finite element method and the integrations, the, the integration step that comes uh, comes from that. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see that in a, in a second. And that's the two main masses in so far. And you have a third mass, which is actually a simplification of the mesh matrix mass. Who knows mass lumping? Okay, no one then. So it's actually the method that explains the simplification from that from there to there. So it's actually a numerical method that say, okay, I have a matrix. This matrix is sparse, like this one, my mass matrix. Ah, it's a bit complicated. It's it will be complicated to compute, especially complicated to invert. As you might know, you know, inverting a sparse matrix 
will create uh, a full matrix that is uh, that is I mean that it will, that will take time to, to 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 compute and to inverse. Sometimes to make simplifications. So which who who says simplifications also means there will be some modeling errors, but you can make a simplification that will don't make too much errors. It's to say, okay, I'm gonna create a diagonal matrix, as you can notice, where each diagonal term will be the sum of all the extra diagonal term. So here, gamma, gamma, gamma T1 is actually the sum of alpha T1, beta T1, beta T1. So alpha T1 plus two beta T1. And this allows to build a diagonal mass matrix. So it's conven convenient because you can easily inverse it. So that's how does a diagonal mass matrix works in so far. These are really the three, only three mass available in so far. And there is actually not really a lot of other mass that could be computed. Okay. Right. I see a question of Adi going on. Okay, can we have a reference to justify their, uh, um, I mean, it will always be depend dependent on the, uh, uh, you, you have, uh, I don't have, I think, I think I made some in my own PhD, but it was applied on cardiac electrophysiology and it can be interesting anyway to evaluate and to assess a bit the error which is made by comparing the two cases, okay? comparing results of the two cases. In general, if you want to justify some, you know, um, some element size, because the more, the bigger elements you are using, the more you're going to make error of simulation, simulation error, modeling errors. Why? Because the bigger the elements are, the worst, you, you will capture, you know, local phenomenon and you won't be able to, to capture maybe the proper physics of your, of your objects. The same way for the time step, if you take too big, too big, uh, bigger time step, too big time step, then you, you will make more and more errors up to the point that sometimes you might even not be able to find a solution. Okay. How to explain in general that kind of things and how to make sure that you find the, the, the right settings, it's actually quite inconvenient, and that's not due to sofa, it's quite general. Usually what people do, you have to use a very, very fine mesh, a very, very small time step, a very complex mass, a full mesh mass matrix, and then little by little degrade, I mean, add more and more si simplification and compare always the simplification compared to the most refined, refined case that you have. And by doing that, you will be able to always compare to the you know the most accurate case where you are actually taking care like here the full mass matrix with very small elements with very small time steps and there you, you'll have actually the kind of some kind of reference simulation and then from this reference simulation you can start the simplification and compare to this uh, to this uh, reference uh, reference simulation but each simulation if we are talking about soft robotics electro electrical simulation will be different from another. And therefore, for some phenomenon, you'll be able to use large time step. And for other phenomenon, you'll have to use very small time step. For instance, if you have a very stiff object, it means that you know if you apply a force on it and you release the force, you might have very fast oscillation. You know, for instance, if you take steel and you apply a force and you and you release the force. It, it's possible that the, 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 the steel will then oscillate like that. If you want to be able to capture this oscillation, when there is a high stiffness, this oscillation goes very fast. So you need to take very small time steps. So we, we usually we say that the time, time step, dt, is related to the square root. It's a... It's a just an idea. Just it's just an idea. Don't take it as a as a rule, but keep that in mind that it's related to the stiffness divided by its um, stiffness divided by the mass. So it means the stiffer your object is, the more the the lower the you'll have to take a, a very very low uh, time step. 
and the and the, the the lighter is my object, it will be the same. The smaller will have uh, the, the time step has to be. But the then you when you come to something something which is super smooth, uh, very deformable, or very massive, then you can take larger time steps. But again, it's always relative. There is no general rule, not with Sophie, not with any other software. Okay, it's a pure numerical analysis uh, theory where. There is no theory for, I mean, there is no uh, default values for anything. You always need to make sure that you're converging properly. Uh, you're, 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 yeah, you're getting a, a, a time step, which is small enough, a, a, a space discretization. So uh, element size, which is fine enough and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah, exactly. As you, as you're writing, Adi, the time step is related to the frequency for in mechanics. In mechanics especially, the higher the frequency is, the smaller the, the time step has to be because you need to be able to, to be able to cap sorry to be able to capture a phenomenon that goes very, very fast. Yeah, yeah, do not hesitate to ask other data, details later on and so on. That's that's a very I mean I, I really like this topic and it's, a, it's a, it can be it can be complicated as well. Okay, so I go forward, carry on. Uh, yeah, I'll try to capture when we when it, when we when it starts to be four four third. So so in fifteen thirty minutes, do not hesitate to send me a warning so that we could start slowly to move to the to the last part. So now we know, you know how to uh, you know you remember still our rigid particle, uniform mass and constant force field. We know that was what was in M. It was actually just uh, the uniform mass. And you know what was in F? It was just a constant force field here. But there was the question of, uh, not sure anymore, Christian or Shantanu Majid Amahan. I'm not sure. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, who asked? Yeah, but I don't know what, uh, who said, I, I don't know what is a, an integration scheme. The fact is that we know, we know it's, uh, we know that the theory says, okay, mass times the acceleration is equal to the force. Okay. But, how is supposed to be computed F using the values of our degrees of freedom, so of our position of our rigid particle right now at the next time step, or and the same the mass, uh, the sorry the yeah and and what is X here? Is that X right now or X at the next time step or a mix of the two? And actually, there is a lot of different uh, what is called integration schemes. And some of and they will be super useful for different purposes. Some of them will be useful because they will smooth things in time. So you know when you have uh, when you have a phenomenon that are very sudden, then it can be very useful to to, to use that kind of integration scheme. Some are actually actually pretty simple. We'll, we'll see that. All those integration schemes they will explain how to compute the new values, so the one at the next time step, t plus dt, from the values at the previous time step. I will give you the, I will we'll take the example of, uh, uh, so it, you're, because you remember that with this case, it was not moving because there was no clue to go from one time step to the next one. There was no solvers. So we need to have time integration. That's again, what we call the integration scheme. There is two families in the th in this uh, in the theory: explicit and implicit schemes. It's actually quite quite simple. I would say rather simple. If I, I, here it's applied on the on the mechanics uh, on the mechanics equation, but you could apply that to other other physics. You see that it's just a question of saying how are my forces computed. I can have forces that depend on x, right? Could. In our case, it was just constant force, but it could depend on x. Like elasticity is actually an internal force that depends on x. But should I use x at the current time step? Or should I use x at the next time step? I mean, nothing tells me in the equation how it should work. That's the two different, I would say, that's the two different policy. One is saying, okay, uh, I'm fully explicit. I 
want you to use to compute the forces based on what I know right now at the current time step. And I'm going to use this f from x at t right now to compute the new values of the acceleration or the velocity. OK? And the other one, the implicit family. The implicit family tells exactly the contrary. It says, OK, on my point of view, I should compute the values of f using the values at the next time step. Problem. This one, we actually currently do not know the value of x time uh, x the, from t plus dt, right? It's the one at the next time step. It's not yet computed. So it will be this approach, implicit, has two properties. I'm going to write them here. It will be first more complicated to compute because since it will depend on things that we do not know yet, this term here will be actually co quite complex to compute. While, or, or the, uh, or, or however, even it's, uh, it's complicated, as I said, but it will allow you to have a very stable simulation. What does it mean? What does it mean? Sorry, to to have a stable simulation. It means that you're gonna, you're gonna have the possibility to use larger time steps. And the explicit family, it has exactly the opposite properties. Namely, it's very easy to compute. Uh, the system which is, uh, the, which is created is easy to solve. However, it is way, way less stable. And you will have to use, with that kind of, with that kind of integration scheme, you will have to use values of the time step that are very, very, very small. OK? That's for the two families. And if we look at what it means in SOFA, so we have this law here. If we take the example of an explicit solver, when the force is, depends on x from t currently, it means explicit. What we have is just this. We can compute it Im immediately because we know x, so we can compute f from x at t. And as, as I told you, we are usually in SOFA not using the acceleration, but the velocity, the delta of velocity. So delta v over dt. So dt goes on the other side. That's it. OK? And what do you find here? This and this can be written as a times x, or delta v, the unknown is equal to a vector b. That's our linear system, right? And this will be given to the second solvers saying, oh, I need to find a solution x, and we'll see how it works. And the second family, I told you the, uh, the right-hand side uh, term is a bit more complicated to compute because we don't know x from t plus dt for implicit cases. So it's more complicated, but it's more stable. Indeed, it's more complicated because it will be divided using a Taylor expansion as follows. A part will be explicit, as before, and a part will be implicit. And when we talk about, for instance, the elasticity forces due to the elastic model, it will create elastic forces here, explicit, and it will create a stiffness matrix, which is the, the, the derivative of the force according to the degrees of freedom. It's co it corresponds to the stiffness matrix. OK? So you can see that the system is more complicated. Again, if you, if you, if you instead of writing delta x, you want something in delta v, it adds another term. You have, you have two terms instead of one. And it can be written basically this way. You'll have a part of the forces that comes on the, on the left-hand side part, which is normal. Why? Because we were depending on something that we did not know. So a part will be unknown, and a part will be known using this Taylor expansion. And this is what makes the, the simulation more complicated to compute. But just like before, what do, you, what do you recognize here? OK, it looks a bit more complicated. 
I let, I, I'm letting Hadi to write. Exactly, exactly. It's still a linear system. We are still having a AX equal B system. So perfect. It will still build a linear system that will be solved and sent to the linear solver. Okay. So that was actually what, what was done using the Adi, adding those two lines in the in the file uh, in the in the scene file was actually allowing to first defining what goes where, what goes in A, what goes in B, depending if we are explicit or implicit. And then we had after the integration scheme, we were using the linear solver to solve the system. And there again, there is two families, and uh, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna almost stop stop there for for the for the theory. There is the direct approach and the iterative approaches. So two different kind of families again in the linear solvers. In our case, when we use the C G for conjugate gradient, which is an iterative solver, and that's why you know I mentioned that before that we were actually testing values of x and iterating, 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 iterating to find an approximated solution in a n number of iteration, it was 200, I think, in the, in the simulation scenario, right? The other family is called the direct solvers, and it's supposed to do to compute what here? Compute the inverse of the system matrix. Computing the inverse can be super cost, effect, uh, cost, uh, cost, uh, costly, costly, and, and computational, 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 computationally demanding, sorry guys, uh, but it will find an exact solution to the problem, to the linear system, okay? All that is done at each time step, and even for just one particle, okay? Great. Simulation steps. Just to recap, it, it, this, this, uh, this uh, slide is actually just a recap to remember what does the animation loop. And then it go, it, it's, some, it's some kind of a fountain, you know, we go from one and to one and we, we go up to the component level that will compute things into the vector and into the matrix. And that finally will be solved by the linear solver. Okay. So there will be a function which is called step, called at each time step in the animation loop itself calling the collision pipeline. The collision pipeline will itself call the three steps, if necessary, the three steps of collision. Then comes back to the animation loop saying, OK, it's time of to, to do then the resolution of the physics. It will talk to the ODE solver, describing who goes in A, who goes in B. The whole system will be given to the linear system that will finally find a solution x to our problem, either iteratively or directly. And this is done at each time step, OK? So if you look into the code of the demo, default animation loop, you will find this step function saying that, oh, I want to call the animate visitor. This animate visitor is actually these two steps, saying, OK, first collision and then solving the physics. That is for the default animation loop. What else? When, when it says solve the physics, it's actually, you, you remember that the animation loop is calling to, is talking to a solver, namely the integration scheme. And this guy is saying, okay, what goes in my matrix A? Since it's an implicit case, you see that there, there will be stiffness that will play a role, the mass will play a role, and even the damping could play a role. So all those guys here are playing a role if you are implicit uh, for the implicit solver, and it's it's explaining who goes in A, who goes in B. And still in the LA implicit, th there is this line that you will see, which actually calls who? The last fighter, which is the conjugate gradient linear solver that will find an amazing solution X to our problem, okay, at each time step. So it's a bit dense here, but that's the way it works for all the simulation. It's always like that, step by step. Sometimes, as you know, depending on the animation loop, the steps are not always the same, but the, assemb the, the way the, the system is sold will always be the same. Okay. I hope it's not too, too hard and, I mean, uh, or too 
long, sleepy, or whatever, because remotely it's super hard. Usually we are doing that on site, and uh, I can uh, I can at least offer you a coffee for for you know making things uh, smoother and and, uh, and and more convenient. But that's actually the way the way it works. Is there any problems or any big worry about that about, about that point? I, I was not talking because I saw Adi uh, asking the question. So yeah, on, on this, on this, um, on these inform, uh, on these, I would say, uh, topics, there is. Uh, I, I try to make as much as possible of documentation online. So that's uh, that's really uh, on the on the sofa online documentation. I, I try to explain really how how does the you know. Earlier implicit work or earlier implicit, uh, explicit implicit um, all the different kind of uh, yeah and definitely and if you want to get a, a very global point of view definitely it's as I said it's it's a full course of numerical analysis so what you will find in SOFA is you know some pages about some specific methods but just to have a broad view uh, a, a, a book about numerical analysis would uh, definitely do the, do the job definitely. And uh, you're welcome. And to 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 see, you know, we saw what what were the functions called by the animation loop, by the integration integration scheme, the linear solver, and there is two components that we did not we did not talk about. You know, it's you know we we know that now there will be things that will come in A, come in B, or come in A and B here. But who is doing that? Who is computing that? The uniform mass. And the force field, right? You remember it was there was only two components for the physics. So you will find the function, for instance, in the mass. Since we are using here a, a scheme where you know the conjugate gradient makes this multiplication a times x the value which is tested, and that's an iterative process. We are computing m times the dx corresponds to this uh, to to, the, to actually a delta of velocity. In this case, and you can notice that for the uniform mass, since the mass matrix is m m m over overall on the diagonal and zero outside, the multiplication of the mass matrix times delta v is just delta v times a constant. It's always the same. So that's what you can see in the code in the C plus plus code of the uniform mass. You will see. Actually, my my resulting effect of the of the mass is equal to the delta v, this guy, multiplied by my constant on the diagonal, and that's it. That's a uniform mass. LHS corresponds to a left hand side, for the left hand side of the equation. And for the constant force field, it was a force applied and going into the f vector. If you look into the constant force field C++ class, there is a dedicating function that actually fills the right hand side vector, which is called the add force function. And as you can notice, it was filling for all the points, the same constant value, uh, single force going into F. Okay. So this is what goes in F or B depends on because you can also write AX equal B. And what goes in B, that's given by the at force here. Okay. So, just it's a those last slides are actually just a very short recap of the functions. It's it's good to know you know when when you take a look at the code itself, to have a look at oh at MDX okay I remember it's the the mass times uh, the the value which is tested by the by the iterative uh, solver. Ah, at force I know it's the I'm adding the explicit part of the force. So on the right hand side, I'm, I'm adding things in the B vector or here in F. Okay. That's for explicit scheme. And for implicit scheme, it's a, uh, it's a, oh, sorry, uh, it's, it's a bit more complex because you remember that in implicit, there is a bit more terms. There is 
Here, Steve Nesterm. Steve Nesterm, as you can remember, they are the same, just not multiplied by, by the same vector, but otherwise it's the same. It's the same stiffness matrix K, stiffness matrix K, and explicit forces, and if you, yeah, explicit forces here. And it will call different functions. As you can notice, since it's the same K, the same function is, is called add D force, because it's the derivative of the forces and add force, which is the explicit version of the forces. And still, as you can notice, the same as before, mass times the delta B. On, the, on this slide, just so that you know, we were, we were working with a, an iterative process. So that's why I was talking about that. If we look at a direct solvers, a direct linear solver, looking for a solution by inversing the A matrix, we need to build A, and for that, here on the right hand side, we will call different functions called add M to uh, add M to matrix and add K to matrix, which are equivalent to those ones. Just we store the matrix; it's the only difference. Okay, I'll stop. I'll stop there. Here is really a cheat sheet that can be useful if you wanna if you wanna you know check again the API and go back to the code and so on. But it's a very broad recap. It's, a, it's, a, it's already a lot, it can already, uh, maybe it's perfectly fine for you. Let me know if, it's, if it was easy, let me know if it was a bit too dense. The next step is actually when we went from a, a single particle to a, a, a volumetric mesh with, uh, with the finite element method, because when you have a volumetric mesh, you need then to make a spatial discretization and for each element to compute the integration of the mass, the integration of the elastic forces, and their, de and their derivative here. Okay. Is there any questions so far? I mean, it's already pretty dense. Uh, was that too dense? What was, was that okay or easy? Could you put, put me, oh, let, let's wait. I, I, I'm gonna make a, a short poll, okay? Uh, Okay, let's make that easy, okay, or hard to make it very simple. Let's go, let's go and vote in. Okay. Oh, I'm so I'm sorry, I so okay, yeah, and it's really the way you have to, th to see things, right, Shantanu? It's uh, a lot of content, indeed, uh, Christian and Shantanu. Yeah, review again the recording, read read uh, books and, and, and things about, about, about that kind of topics. But already here, I think you, you'll start to be able to make the connection between what was in the simulation scene that we saw in the user tuto, what it means in terms of equation, just right now on the slide, and about the families generally of, you know, families of numerical tools, like in, what is an integration scheme, what is a, a linear solver, that by reading, by hearing again the, the tutorial and maybe reading again some, some other documentation online and books, it will definitely help on that, okay? And from, from what I see from, 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 from the poll, from the poll here, it's, it's basically uh, that's that's uh, that's the, the the answer of the poll. You see, it's rather okay, a bit hard for some, and it's first it depends on on actually on the background, obviously. Uh, when you already saw a bit of mechanics and some things can can get uh, can get easier, but still to be very confident, never hesitate to read again and so on. About the finite element method, so it was you know going from this case where we had only one particle to a volumetric mesh. The same functions will be called, you know, what what we saw just here, it will be the same at MDX, at, at D force, at force, the same as before. The question is just, it's not going to be just on one point. We need to take really into account the volume, so the computation and the matrix will be a bit more sparse. Actually, will be sparse and therefore a bit more complicated to compute and so on. And this is really defined by the finite element method. I won't spend time here. I'm just browsing a bit the slide. 
that's you know the again the same mechanical equation you have the mass here times the acceleration the derivative of the velocity these are elasticity forces and these are ex external forces actually density of forces and here it's the it's uh, the the uh, I'm sorry, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a, bit, uh, a bit tired. It's, um, I can't find my word. I have, La I have Laplace Laplacian, but uh, we, we have the, um, uh, we have actually here the, der the derivative, some kind of derivative in space of our sigma, which is actually the stress. It's a density of internal forces. And this term here, corresponds to our elastic forces. What does it mean? It means that when you apply a force, um, a constitutive mechanical law, what it's, look, what it's looking for a mechanical law, it's looking for some kind of diffusing the density of force. That's what does a mechanical model. And we'll need to integrate in the volume the mass. And you remember, and you remember that the 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 the, the mass matrix matrices. You remember if we integrate properly using the finite element method, we're going to have very sparse mass matrix, right? I don't remember at which slide I, I, I was. I'm sorry. I was there. Okay. So I, we'll have to make this integration and over the whole domain over the entire domain, which means over the whole lever. But we have no way to find an exact solution for the whole domain. And all the idea, and, and I will really stop here, of the finite element method, it's instead of saying, OK, we have no clue to find a solution on the entire domain. We are some kind of screwed up, right? That's That would be the case we, with a weak solution. So that's. Uh, we say, okay, we cannot find, we can, cannot ensure to find a solution on the entire domain. Okay, okay, we'll make some assumptions using test functions. That's a mathematical uh, tool that will ensure us that we will find uh, some solutions that will respect some very specific mathematical behavior, that, like uh, 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 against uh, uh, unitary, uh, uh, yeah, uh, along very uh, a very specific. Uh, what's the word in English? Um, within within a very a, a very well defined reference uh, reference space, that is our ref test functions here. But even here, we we are looking for the integration of this mechanical uh, uh, equilibrium here over the whole domain. But it's still not the finite element method because here it's we are looking at the whole domain. What is actually the property of the finite element method is to say, instead of solving over the whole domain, I'm going to cut not only in space, uh, not only in time, sorry, but also in space. And instead of making the integration over the whole domain, which is some kind of random, so I could not find a solution, I'm going to make the integration over very simple geometries. In that case, the very simple geometry is actually a tetrahedron. And by doing that, we are always going to be able to take a tetrahedron, bring, it, bring back this tetrahedron into this kind of rest configuration. And by doing that, it's super easy to compute, uh, to compute any kind of integration in the volume of such an orthogonal rect regular element. And by doing that, by doing that kind of simplification, saying we cut the whole domain into small pieces and those small pieces we can always find a transformation back to this very nice oct orthogonal tetrahedron and by doing that we will be able to find an estimation of the integration actually an, an exact integration of any function in this in this geometry here in this tetrahedron okay so there is still a, other slides, but yeah. Uh, was my word divergence? Yeah, correct. Yeah, correct. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was looking for which word I was actually looking for. But yes, the divergence of the stress indeed. Uh, so that was on the slide, I guess, 40 or uh, 41 here, no, 42, three here. Indeed, the divergence of, of, the, of the stress. 
stress is a density of force, this guy here, the sigma. So this equation is actually uh, true for linear elasticity. I, I took the case here of linear elasticity, but when you talk about linear elasticity, the elastic forces are equal to the, to, the, uh, to the divergence of the density of force. And again, this idea of having the, the divergence of the density of force, it means an elastic materials aims at diffusing the internal energy in its own volume. When it's getting hurt or deformed locally by something, what does actually through this divergence term here, an elastic model, it tries to diffuse the internal force inside the volume of, of, the, of the domain. Okay, that's what, so that's, that's then what actually makes the whole object will then deform due to those equilibrium between the internal forces and also the external forces. So that's, that was, uh, that was my point. Thank you very much for getting back the divergence, divergence, uh, uh, divergence word back to, uh, back to my mind. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to get back to how, how does actually a plugin look like? And when we will be done with the plugin, if you, if you want to get back to this FEM stuff, let me know. We could take again a bit more time, uh, extra time about that. Okay. Is that fine for everybody or is there really people that are, I want to see the FEM stuff right now before going further? Hadi, Hadi, yeah, what do you think? Jake, the same, you can, you can move. Okay, fine for Hadi. Jade, uh, uh, Jake, uh, Majid, uh, Jacob, do not hesitate to, 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 let, to let me know, right? Multiple users are actually currently typing. Okay, okay. Okay, cool. So we'll, we'll get back to that, but the, the idea of this, uh, of this uh, FEM, FEM part, just so to, to, to give a, a summary of what it, what it means, it's that here. How the, the FEM will explain how from one tetra we will compute using the volume of this tetra, huh, VE, we will be able to compute the mass in, for each here, for instance, for the mass, for the rho, the integration of rho inside the volume of each tetra E, how we end up with a four by four matrix because we have four vertices at each uh, tetra, how we end up with such a matrix here, okay? That's actually how does a, a, a matrix, a mass matrix for a tetrahedron looks like, for one tetrahedron, where VE is the volume of the tetra and rho is the mass density. Okay, let's move. I'm a bit frustrated to leave already the, the FE here uh, before, before going further, but again, I think it's good to also to, to look at how does, how does the, uh, how does the, all the, the, the system of plugin in SOFA work so that you can also get your own scenes uh, implemented, your own code, C++ code, if you'd like, uh, and, and so on and so forth, okay? So for that, to, 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 take, a, to take an example, usually what we, what we do like to, 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 to look here is take, we, we made a specific example plugin called the My Awesome Components plugin. You can also find another very good, I think the, the, the best, uh, or the second best, I would say, uh, uh, examples uh, for, for a plugin. Is, there is one which is located in SOFA in application. Okay, that's two, I think, good examples of how does a plugin look like and should be set up. For today, we're gonna uh, we're gonna look at the my awesome component. All right. If you have other questions about you know the one or the other later on, do not uh, hesitate to let me know. So that's the two examples of um, of, of plugins, and let's start with the my awesome components. Uh, need to find again. I copy paste the link. It'll be faster. And uh, and and and. I'm going to share with you again my, my screen so that uh, so that you follow can all the screen. 
All right. So you should be able to see the screen now. So I just like you, like you did, I actually downloaded uh, the V2006. It was not the 01, but whatever. It's the V2006 binary, uh, binary version of SOFA. So if I double click on the run SOFA here, I get SOFA running here. That's actually the version of SOFA I used up to, up to now for running the tutorial. But let's say that um, I'm actually Christian, uh, and I'd like to, to, to make my own plugin, right? And maybe for a first step to make my all scenes into a plugin, and then later on even to create my, my, my own components, my own C++ components. On the left-hand side here, in my left window, can, uh, let me know if you, if you cannot really uh, see properly the, the, the screen. It's too small or whatever, because I, I think you should be able to zoom in a bit in, 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 my, in the big blue meeting uh, interface using the, the, the wheel on the, of the mouse. Uh, if you want to create your own plugin, basically, we will often ask or expect a plugin to look like that. It will, they will, they, there is usually, or maybe a repository, additional repository, including the documentation, but otherwise some example of scenario, like scene example, SCN or .py if it's using Python. And there is another folder containing all the code, the source code, the C++ code. So that's how it is organized. But as you can notice, there is a few additional, uh, a few additional uh, um, uh, files. First, a license. If you never, never forget that when you put something open, you can always, I mean, you're, you're, you will be free to set the license you'd like, okay? So you are, you're, you're already free to do that. Here we set a, a license.txt at the, at the root, but there is two files additional to that, and you'll see it's quite simple. I'm going to open this one and open this one. First one, the one which is called, sim, uh, actually the two are related to what is called CMake. Who never heard about the, the CMake system? Can you can you maybe write in the chat in the chat? Never used CMake before. Okay. Apparently, up to now, no everybody knows CMake, or not before. Okay. So at least one per uh, Majid. Yeah. Okay. Shantan was okay. So. When you download, so you remember, I, I told you, you have two ways of getting SOFA. The binaries, you, you download them, you run, it works, or the sources. It's always convenient to have the sources because you can compile them and you can have access to the source, look at the, inside the code and so on. But you need to compile them, the sources. And the compilation is done in two steps. First, there is a phase of configuration, and that is what is for the CMake. CMake is actually a configurator somehow. It's just before the compilation. It will organize files so that a compiler, something that will compile the code to make an executable, to generate an executable, so that the compiler knows what is to compile, how, and so on, and how the project is organized. It's some kind of a a tree or an, it's the organization basically of the project. CMake, that's what it is. It is the organization of the project. That's why when, okay, okay. Just so your, your, your note, Christian. Uh, <clears throat> this is why when you, have, when you are starting to write a, a plugin, since you are, you're gonna have some codes and, and so on, and that you want to compile this code, you'll need to explain to the compiler what is inside and how it has to be compiled, okay? And this is why there is this cmakelist.txt. This cmakelist is actually a file listing the file that has to be, that have to be compiled, explaining they need, they have a dependency on this work or on this other library and so on and so forth. It explains what is inside and what it is linked to or what, it deep, uh, what are the dependencies of this code. If we look at the cmakelist.txt of the plugin, as you can notice, it's 50 lines of codes. It's 
can, it can appear as a first look a bit, um, I would say a bit, uh, a, a lot, a lot of code, but in fact, it's, uh, it's quite simple. First, the first line is just bullshit saying, okay, the minimum version of the CMAG that you need to use is uh, 312, whatever. The second one is important. It will be actually this name here, it's the project name, it will be the name of the compiled of, of your compiled plugin. It will generate on Windows, for, for instance, it will generate here a my awesome component dot DLL. On Linux, it will create a my, my awesome component components dot SO and dot DYLib under macOS. You can this way also define some versions of the library and so on and so forth, but it's just a detail. What else? The second thing which, which comes here is the, this two lines here. It will define what? It will define what are the, de the dependencies of the code which is inside the, the plugin. Usu usually, wh when you're going to write some code, maybe you're, you want to write, uh, for instance, a new, a new force field, like a bit the, the same constant force field as before. But to do so, you need your code and your plugin actually needs to know how does SOFA work, you know, what are the functions to be implemented. And to know that, you need to, what is called, give, explain what is the dependency to SOFA. That's what is doing this fine package. This fine package will explain, okay, we have a dependency on, on the library called SOFA Framework and SOFA General, which are two different libraries in SOFA. And then, all those lines from the line 8 to the line 22, that's a list of all the all the code the codes which are inside the plugin. And that's it. Okay. What comes after is actually, I would say, only some install information when you want to install your, your plugin. It's for deployment when you want to do your plugin to to ship your plugin to someone else on Windows and someone else on. So that's a bit more technical stuff, but the, I would say the only lines which are uh, important are again those two here. I mean, the, 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 the two here, I library. It will just say, okay, my library, and as you can notice, it's, it's, it's using everything that we said before. That's what these dollar signs are explaining. It says, I want now to create a library that will take the name my awesome component, including all those files. And that's actually what we gave just above here. And then second step, it explains what? The dependencies, okay? It will, it will explain which library inside this package is actually the dependency because we will need Sofa core and all those kind of stuff, Sofa default type and so on, because we want to use some Sofa information into our new force field class here. As you can notice, there is some force field implemented in the plugin. All right. What is inside the other one? Actually, it's pretty simple. It's just, again, re-explaining, and that's, again, useful when, when you deploy your plugin in some other, uh, in some other, um, uh, some other environments. But these are actually CMake variables and especially the dependencies again. We are re-expliciting the dependencies of the plugin. You can notice the SOFA, fine, the, the, sorry, the fine packages on SOFA framework and SOFA general. That's it. So that's for those two files. Examples, it's, it's just as we already saw, just you put you put here anything you like. Yeah, you can put uh, uh, scenes scenes uh, in in uh, XML, scenes in Python. But if you have a scene in Python, it means you'll have a dependency on the Sofa Python plugin. But but it's completely feasible, completely feasible. And the same here in the source repository. Usually we we say we organize always that this way. You have your plugin name as a SRC repository, and then again, the plugin name, it's a, a, actually a quite convenient way to create, a, uh, it's a clean way of organizing stuff for, for uh, due to CMake, but oh, it's just uh, just why we are actually organizing that uh, this way. And what is inside? All the C++ code, as you can notice, opla, as you can notice here, we have five C++ components, 
and two configuration files. It's other. It's also C++ code, but it's uh, C++ code that will be used by Sofa when to to understand that it is actually a plugin and that there is plugin codes inside. I'm going to open those two. It's the, really the two last codes that we're going to look at. After, it's just usual C++ classes. The config.h is just for Windows to export properly some symbols. This symbol, actually, the my awesome components underscore API. And the init my awesome component .cpp, it's actually something here that specify a lot of things about the plugin, like you know what is the version of the plugin again, or what is the license that we want to use and so on in a C way. And why doing that? I'm gonna start so far and edit plugin manager. And can you see here those information? So if you load a new plugin, you'll have again those information appearing. But those information come from where? They come. Uh, they come from this init dot uh, init my plugin name dot cpp file. All the plugins in Sofa do have this component, and it, it allows to have here in the, in the in the graphical user interface an idea of what is the license that that is applied. What is the version? As you can notice, the Sofa Python 2.7 has no version. It's, it's not super clean. And a look, the location of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the, the library, some description and component lists. OK? So once you have, you have actually, once you have actually defi de defined your, you know, your semic list, the two semic list files, and the two plugin files here, and it, it will be very similar from a plugin to another. You can actually see exactly exactly the same files in the plugin example. Uh, I'm going to try to find it again. Here. You can find again the same cmake.in and the cmakelist.txt. That were actually the two files. And the same in the src, the config.h, and the init plugin example. Exactly the same. And what else? Just C++ code. OK, so far? I mean, if you never saw uh, CMake before, clearly, this will be a first, the first time you'll see that. But you'll see it's always the same from one plugin to another. So you won't get lost. It's, you will always see the same plugin and the same organization. Again, if you need help on building your own plugin, let me know. I would be super happy to, to, to help you and assist you in those, uh, in those steps, OK? So this is for what could be unexpected or weird or, you know, if you never saw how does the plugin look like, that would be the only, I would say, the only uh, four files to know. And uh, as you can notice, the organization of the of the plugin is not very complicated. Yeah, Cheng? I have a question. Yeah, uh, yeah, if, I make, if I make a new plugin, uh, where is the place to decide which plugin by startup is loaded, which one is not? So uh, here, what, what I want uh, 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 for for and uh, again for the for the next steps and even up to now, what I would like to show you here is the the case of a plugin, which is completely separated from Sofa. Okay, I mean it, it has a dependency on Sofa, but the code is not inside Sofa. You have Sofa Sofa somewhere like like the binary version of Sofa that you downloaded from the website, the Sofa v twenty zero six, and Let's say that you want to develop your own plugin aside Sofa. So you can, you can actually have a plugin as we have like with this, uh, with this uh, plugin, my awesome component. And now we will see first how to compile it and how it will be loaded by Sofa. OK? I think it will, it will, answer, it will answer your question. Yes, exactly. Okay. Thank you. So, is there any other question about uh, about CMake that we saw before? 
Uh, Majid, Shantanu, Christian, no worries about Simek. I was, um, I mean, before starting so far, I almost, I mean, I, I had maybe one semester of C++ and never touched any kind of CMake, whatever. You get to learn, to learn that, so no worries. And again, we will be there to help, okay? So that's, uh, if it's something which is unclear to you, let me know again and uh, I'll, be, I'll be happy to help. But get inspired to what is, especially to the two links that I gave you, the MyOSM components and the plugin example. That's two very good examples and simple examples. So that's, uh, yeah, thanks, Gary. Thanks, uh, Christine and Jordan. So now what I would like to so show you is actually what it takes to compile such a plugin. Uh, I discussed about that per email with, uh, I don't remember, uh, I have a very bad memory of, of the, uh, with Majid, I think. Uh, for, yeah, you know, to compile codes, you'll need to have some uh, libraries and some tools installed in your environment. All those tools, they are explained and they are detailed on the, you know, uh, get started build page on the documentation of SOFA. That's what I was actually adding in my email saying, yeah, you're going to need Qt, you're going to need uh, maybe Ninja or GCC or what, whatever compiler you use. So that's what I was me meaning by, by that. But again, I'm going to show you how it works. Then the installation of such libraries, it's just a few lines of, of codes you do, or, or a yeah, few things to download, and that's it. Uh, then then you, you have your, your compilation environment set up. All the, I'm going to give you the link in the, in the, of, the, of the doc uh, anyway. Getting started. I'm giving you the link for Linux, but you, it's actually you have all the other one for for, it's, it's for compiling so far, but for compiling a plugin, you need basically the same kind of environment to compile a plugin outside from SOFA. A question of vocabulary as well. When we say compile a plugin uh, outside from SOFA, or yeah, apart, outside, apart from SOFA, we, we, it, we, we call that out of tree. It's an out of tree compilation. When we say out of tree, it's outside the tree, actually the CMake tree of the core of SOFA. So there is SOFA somewhere that, that is compiled somewhere else, and you have your plugin in some other place, and both are actually compiled separately. That's what we call an out of tree, out of tree compilation. And that's what we will do here, because I downloaded the binary version of SOFA, which is somewhere. And I, I will show you that. Uh, I just downloaded the, the My Awesome Component plugin and I will compile it on my machine separately. Okay? Are you re ready for this last step? Ah, come on, let's go. Uh, I'm going to share, if you have any other questions, post, post, uh, post it in the chat. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, I'm going I'm to make the, the demo of compilation. Okay, hang out uh, tight. Okay, I'm going to close the sofa here, open that. So, so that you know, as, you, as, as I already told you, I downloaded the binary version of sofa v2006. That's what I, I, I have here. I can run here different scenes here, play with sofa and so on and so forth. Okay. But I'd like to create a new plugin. So I will download actually exactly the, the my awesome component plugin. I will download all those files. Uh, where it is, I remember I downloaded it here. I downloaded it actually yesterday evening. Yesterday evening, I came to the office. I said, "Okay, I'm going to prepare uh, the I'm going to prepare the, the the training course." And what you can find here, it's exactly the same sources that I don't downloaded. Right? You can find the example folder, example folder source source and inside source you have my awesome component just like it's said here cmake list license and cmake uh, uh, cmake.in file in the source i have all the c++ codes and so on but here i have nothing compiled i have just what is called the source code so what i will do 
and I, I'm going to do that in uh, uh, a terminal here. The compilation, you, uh, we have to do that in the terminal. Let, um, I'm going to zoom in a bit. Let me know if it's, if it's big enough. Zoom in, zoom in. Okay. Okay. Let me know if it's uh, if it's uh, if it's not good uh, for 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 if you don't visualize that visualize that properly. So I'm gonna go here. I just what I did yesterday evening. Is, therefore, as I said, it's just I'm I'm I downloaded it. I downloaded sorry the plugin my awesome components. That's all what I did. And I downloaded it in, in, inside this SRC repository. So I'm gonna go there. Here, here I am. So I have my SRC, and if I look in, inside my SRC, I can find again all the files contained into the my awesome component plugin. So far, so good. Now, what I want to do is to compile this plugin outside from Sofa, completely separated from Sofa. But as you know, it has a dependency on Sofa because it's some kind of we are, we are defining new C++ classes, classes, implementing new things based. On sofa so we have a dependency on sofa what i need to do first is to create uh, a repository where i will compile sofa i created here a build repository that's what i did i will go inside this build repository what is inside nothing just an empty repository for the moment then what I will do is that, you remember, compilation is two steps. First one is configuration using CMake, and that's why those CMake lists will be super useful to explain the organization of the plugin and its dependencies. And the second step will be the compilation. We will compile the code, and it will result into a library. It will generate a library from our source code. First step, CMake. So we are using this tool CMA, which will help us to organize the code. Here, I'm giving here, where is my sources? It's actually where is my plugin? And the path of where I want to build and to compile the code. For instance, nothing has been done. As you remember, the build repository was empty. So I need to configure it a first time. The first step is to say, okay, what kind of compilers? So that will depend on your that will depend on your machine. In my case, I'm using C Lang, but most of people are using GCC or yeah, depends on what you'd like. You can actually usually you can keep the default native compilers, but it would work for me. For me, it would work both C, GCC or C Lang would, would work. So I do that, confirm, and as you can notice, there is an error. Do you have an idea why there is such an error? I don't know if I can zoom in here. Sorry. Yeah, I can zoom in. Do you have an idea why there is an error here? I'm gonna get back on the. I lost. I lost you all. I I killed you all with the with, with the plugin. I'm I'm sorry. It's uh, it's maybe a bit too long. Uh, so in, you can also say, I have just no idea, uh, file path problem. It's actually close to that because it's actually saying, yeah, that it cannot find something. I'm going to show you again the, 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 the window. It's written here. Sorry. All right. I'm going to get back to your, okay. Exactly, exactly, Jacob. We specified before, we said, yeah, this plugin is a, is a Sofa plugin. We're going to implement new codes based on what is, the, what is already existing in Sofa. And when we are compiling the plugin, the plugin has no idea where is located Sofa, where has been installed Sofa, where has been downloaded Sofa. Where, what is asking here, CMake, it's asking here, hey guys, I need the Sofa framework because what? If I if I look in the CMX TXT here, this line is actually complaining. This line is saying, ah, God damn it, I need Sofa Framework. I can't find Sofa Framework. It is required. So I complain. So it complains. So what I will do 
to make everybody happy, I'm going to define something which is called CMEC prefix path. path sorry. So make, I'm pronouncing that the French way, CMEC, CMEC prefix path. And I'm going to give what? I'm going to give the path to SOFA. To the, I'm going to give the path to the binary version of SOFA, lib CMake. And by, doing, by giving that here, I'm creating a new CMake variable explaining, hey, don't, don't be worried, my plugin. You will find all the dependencies of SOFA that you are looking for here. And by doing that, I'm going to configure again. And the configuration is done. As you can notice, why it's looking for base, common, general simulation? Because we were actually asking those two guys here, SOFA framework. SOFA framework, it's, it's actually SOFA base, SOFA common, and SOFA uh, simulation. And we were asking for SOFA general, and SOFA general is here. So it found everything it needed from SOFA. Now, after making the configuration step, I can click on generate. So just a warning, nothing, nothing bad, nothing bad here. I, now generating is done. I can close the step, the, the step of preparation is done. As you can notice now, there have been several files appearing in the build repository. The compilation is not done yet, but it is ready to be done because CMake prepared every information needed for the compilation. Last step. So in my case, I'm using Ninja, but if you are using usual uh, co co compilers, you would maybe use Make. And I run Ninja. Here, it's compiling the code. It goes very fast because, as you as you as you can notice, it's already over. Huh? Because as you can notice in the in the in the my oh, sorry in the my awesome component plugin, what do we have? We have on, on, only five C classes here. So it goes fast to compute. So this is done. And if I look what is inside the build, what just appeared, guys? My goddamn mouse subcomponents.so. So the library that has been generated from the compilation. And this library contains the compiled codes corresponding to the C classes that are inside. OK? So, is there any questions so far? Because then we're gonna have, we're gonna have a look on how to use now a code. First, we're gonna have a very short look at what was actually the code that we compiled, and the last step is how to use this new code into a scene. No questions so far. Okay, I hope no heart attack, uh, no, no, no death by SOFA uh, <laughs> after after so long uh, after su such a training day. But yeah, and it will be the and it will be the end. Okay, is that fine for you? If we if we give a let's yeah let's give us again fifteen minutes if it's fine and 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 then we could uh, we stop there. And for the and for for the one that loves uh, yeah let's push forward. Perfect. So. Let's have a look to what was actually in the plugin to understand what we what we actually compiled. So there was, as we said before, there was five C++ classes. We will take actually a look at the at this class here, the fan force field. What we are defining here is a new class, force field, so a new force field that will actually it will be very close to the constant force field that we saw up to now. And this, the idea of this fan force field will be to apply random forces on my model. Okay, that's what we want from from the fan force field, fan force field dot uh, dot inl, inl and, and cpp and h. Why why is there three files? We'll take again each of them separately and and see what is what is inside. Always on the top, you have some license header saying who did that and when and, and so on. And you see, there is just a few things here. Especially what is there? There is here includes in C++, that's what, what, what the, you are actually including codes. And those codes, they are coming from 
SOFA. And that's why we need the dependency to SOFA because we are using codes from SOFA. And by doing that, we will be able to define a new class, which is defined here. We are adding a, the class fan force field, saying to this fan force field class, okay, this fan force field class will work on templates. You remember templates? It's the kind of degrees of freedom we are going to work on. So it means here we are saying we add only one. We are, we are going to be able to work only with the one kind of degree of freedom, which, which is the VEC 3D degrees of freedom. If you want to be able to, to be compatible with more, you need to add more lines and to make sure that your code is actually compatible with it. So here we are saying we are adding a new code, a new class called fan force field, compatible with VEC 3D. That's what we, what we do also here. We are adding this template class to the plugin. And that's it. The, as you can notice, the .h is just making some includes and decla declaring the new class inside the, what is called register class. It's actually uh, the, the factory. There is a, fact a factory in SOFA knowing all the components of SOFA. Here we are saying add that to the, to the factory. What else? There is a dot, a dot h file. It's the, what is called the header file corresponding to the class. Again, we have some includes that will be useful. First, a very important one, the one corresponding to, corresponding to the force field. Why? Because what you can notice here is that our new C++ class will, what is called, inherit from the C++, C++, C++ force field class. We are saying, we are creating a new component that belongs to the family of the force field class. So it will in inherit from many functions that here the developer can implement. We can implement, for instance, you remember, that's the explicit part of the force, the add force function. And we are describing in this dot header file, dot h file, we are describing all the main force field functions. That's the API of force field. You can, you can have a look to the force field dot, uh, dot h uh, class. You'll find exactly the same functions that we will implement. What else? We are defining internal parameters and also what is called data. And those data will be the data that we will use in the simulation script in the XML or in the Python script. So that's the data that we want to let the user, that we want to let access, accessible for the user. OK? So I'm making it a bit fast, but it's really to understand how it works. And finally, the implementation of those functions, like the add force functions, how to add an explicit force in the system, this will be done in the inline.inl file, inline file. If I look, so that's for the constructor. When the class is created, that's the constructor is called. That's where you have you will, you will have the, for instance, here, this information will be used to describe in the graphical user interface the data force and what is the description of the data can even sometimes here define a default value for the for the for this data and you find here the add force function that will be called and that will add a force in the uh, mx or add uh, m times the acceleration is equal to the forces it will apply here a force in the explicit part so in the right hand side of the equation it will add a contribution to the force. As you can see, it's a plus equal. It takes the vector and adds inside this vector some additional forces. Just so that you know, the force which is added is some kind of random force. Okay, there is a random coefficient here which is applied. That's the same as the constant force, just we are applying a random coefficient here. That's all that we did here in this code. All right, so that's what we compiled. And last, thing that I'd like to show you is that, OK, now I have my here lib, my awesome component that we just compiled. How can I use that in SOFA? For instance, how can I use that in my v2006 
binary version of sofa. I can have a look here, open, and you remember, I set some sin files. I have some sin files in, in the in the plugin here. In source example, I have a sin file called triangle surface cutting fan force field. I'm going to open that here with Sublime. It looks like that, and as you can notice, there is. Um, I'm, I'm going to sorry sorry here, do that here. I'm going to we're going to use the fan force field that we just compiled in our plugin. This class is actually the class of the C++ class which is in our plugin. So I will load this scene here. This scene is in the source example and that here. Okay, I need to maybe to reload. Uh, okay, okay. What can you see here? There have been a problem here. We are running the release of Sofa. And we are saying, OK, use this code that has been compiled. I mean, run this scene file and try to create in the simulation graph here, in the, in the square gravity graph, add a force field, which is called fan force field. But here, Sofa, since Sofa and the plugin are separated, Sofa has no clue about what is this new force field. You say, oh, OK, I don't know this guy. The component has not been created. You can double click here and there is a message. The object type fan force field was not created because the object is unknown in the factory. This is due to the fact that we have a plugin somewhere, compiled somewhere outside from Sofa and Sofa in another location. So what do we need to do that to, to actually use the code of a plugin inside Sofa when they are both compiled separately? We need to use what is called a required plugin. By doing that, we are saying to Sofa, OK, you're going to use, there is some code below in the scene that is not by default in Sofa that you need to look for inside a plugin. And we need to add this other line saying, OK, okay this plugin is located there. And by doing that, we will be able to, so I need to remember where it is located here. I think it will be that here. So we'll say, OK, the plugin has been compiled here. You'll find the library of this plugin here. You will need this plugin. This plugin is required, and it is called My Awesome Components. And by doing that, it will be able to find and to load and to put the fan force field component in the simulation. I'm going to reload now. You see, that, you see that I have two new lines, the add plugin and the required plugin. And I have my fan, fan force field. I have all the data, and with the description that appears, applied force to all points. And if you look into the, into the here, into the INL, applied force in to all points. That's what that's what comes here in the graphical user interface. Come from this line here. And by doing that, I will have some random forces applied here, some kind of wind due to the this fan force field that will be applied on this cloth. And without this, the, without this class here, if I command this class here and that I reload the scene, nothing happens. There is only, only gravity. So you can really see that by doing that, yeah, by doing that here, we are really able to load a component that has been compiled into a separate plugin, plugin completely outside from Sofa. OK? So I think that was for your question, Cheng Li, how to use, really, in a Sofa simulation, a code that has been compiled somewhere else outside from Tree, outside from Exactly, Sofa. exactly. Correct. Very elegant. Cool. So that's more or less the, yeah, that's the, the end of this tutorial, as you can notice, it goes, it's a pretty broad introduction to Sofa because it goes from a bit of FEM, a bit of numerical simulation, a bit of compilation, a bit of using Sofa, understanding how things are connected and so on. But it gives, I think, already uh, some kind of a really broad overview that I must say only a few people, I think, have in the community. Because it's always hard to find, to, 
so far, unfortunately, especially due to that was your point, Chang Li, I think, the number of lines in the code is just huge and it's complex to get, you know, a, an understanding of the whole project and how everything works together. Also to know where to ask a question, uh, what people are working on with SOFA. So the idea is not to remain only technical, not to make only gen generic information, but to give as many information as possible in a pretty short amount of time, even if we are together then now uh, we, yeah, for more than, than seven hours. But that's the idea of this training, okay? That's the, the idea of this training is to give you the broader possible uh, knowledge of SOFA, understanding of SOFA, and then in the future, stay in touch because now you should be able to, by reviewing, rereading, and so on, getting a better and better understanding. Okay, so I have a question related, unrelated to the last one hour discussion. So uh, if there is other questions related to the compilation and so on, do not hesitate. If you have further questions, do not hesitate. We can make a sm small further questions for the next 15 minutes if you'd like. Uh, I mean, we, we already exceeded the, the, the time of training, but yeah, I welcome any question uh, that you could have. And again, tomorrow you'll have a, a huge tour of what is done in SOFA and more importantly, that's what we are we are repeating since the beginning. We will keep in touch in the next uh, in the next months uh, on the forum, uh, up per email anytime. So let, let us know when when you when you have uh, any problem. It's very complex for us to to make you know replies within a day or two. But arranging new uh, I mean uh, arranging uh, additional discussions and so on is always possible. So that's not uh, one training and that's uh, that's the end. Uh, so I'm going to read the question of uh, the, the, your, your, your question here. It was uh, ah no, it was yeah, it, it was it was not Hattie, It was uh, Chantal with the question. Sorry. Uh, yeah, cool. I'm I'm, I'm glad. Uh, first, I'm, I was super glad to to have you during this uh, training day. Glad to read that it was uh, helpful, and I'd like to to keep it even more and more helpful first reviewing maybe the video so i'm going to send that it takes at least 24 hours i think the video to to generate the new video so don't be astonished that uh, you don't receive the the video by the end of the by the week but by friday i'm going to make sure that uh, or at, at the latest next monday i'm going to give you the the video and the slides of the lecture of the of the of the training and uh and i'm going to answer all your questions thank you very much for First, supporting SOFA because uh, uh, also paying for the, the, the training help us also to show to Inoya the interest of for the interest for SOFA. It helps for paying internships because again we are non-profit, so the money that you are that you are giving for trainings do not get in do not go in my pocket at all. Do not go in the pocket of any engineer. It just goes for open source. So that's pure support to the open source, and, and I'm really uh, uh, grateful for that. And yeah, let's take some discussion time for those who want to spend some time. And thank you again for all the others for spending the time for, for this training. Hugo, thank you so much. This is really helpful. Thank you, Christian. Thank you very much. So I'm going to answer first. Yeah, yeah. Th thank you, Chang. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to say thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, please give me the, um, the link or the address about uh, uh, plugging for ergonomic um, things. Do you remember? Uh, what, what do you mean, the ergonomic? Uh, uh, yeah. uh, I have, you have right down on I think, uh, whether there's application about uh, the human ergonomic. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, things. okay. I see the point, yeah. Thank uh, you. I, I wrote the running person, but I would, uh, I'm going to make a, 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 draw, a drawing so that I, I better remind myself. Okay. okay. Thanks. Have a nice day. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Bye bye. Uh, so, Shantanu. Uh, I think so. Yeah, I think you could use. I mean, you will need anyway. You'll 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 need a volumetric mesh for computing the mechanics because the mechanics will require really to take into account. The volume, not you know, not the empty volume, but the silicon volume of your robot, and to take into account the mechanical properties of the silicon. But otherwise, 
for the pressure, maybe it would be possible, but yeah. Uh, can I use the uh, instead of a volumetric mesh to define? Yeah, so to define the pressure, yes, but up to a point, you will need to get a mapping from this surface mesh back to the volumetric mesh so, so that the, the whole physical model, which is computed, if I remember properly, in this automatic case, is computed, computing using a 3D volumetric uh, mesh for the silicon part of the robot. So, yeah. You're welcome, Hi. Hi, Hadi. Thank you. Thank you for joining again. Bye-bye, Hugo. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye, Kristen. Uh, Majin, Majid, yeah. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, you too. And Shantanu, I hope it, uh, it answered your, your question. And, yeah. Uh, I think we, we had already a chat per email, right? You can, I don't know if you can activate your, your mic so that it, can, it get a... Yeah, cool. That's uh, that's the two of us uh, now, Chantalu. Uh, yeah, and you try to turn on, but yeah, indeed, it's it's on actually currently. I can't hear you. Uh, maybe it's uh, you need to choose the proper. You know, you have maybe several mics, or or maybe there is some firewall pre preventing from using the um, prevent preventing from using the mic. Okay, okay, okay. If you if you prefer to ask the question on, on by typing, do not hesitate. I'm gonna again thank you everybody for yeah. There's the two the 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 two of us right now. I'm gonna I think stop the recording right now, and we we're gonna carry on the questions together. But uh, and 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 end the session. Thank you.